weekend that would help for me. Have you done this, Dave? Okay. We. Yeah. And now we're live. All right, we should be good. Maybe ask Mallory if she can hear us. She's on there. Mallory on Zoom, can you hear us? I can hear you. Excellent. Thank you, Mallory. I'm getting feedback in here too. Okay, are we good to open? Okay. All right. It is uh, four minutes after two. I will open this Grand County Commission workshop regarding special event intent to apply. Present are commissioners uh, Evan Clapper, Trish Hedeen, Mike McCurdy, Mary McGann, and myself, Shock Hadler. Uh, on Zoom, we have Commission Administrator Mallory Nassau. We have uh, in person uh, uh, Commission Associate uh, Quinn Hall. We have County Attorney Stephen Stocks and County Clerk Gabe Wojtek, as well as our special events coordinators, uh, Angie Book, and I'm going to. <laughs> no, all right, it's Mackenzie Daniels. Mackenzie Daniels. I'm sorry, Mackenzie. Uh, all right, so I will uh, turn it over to Mackenzie and Angela. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you. So I uh, will like to officially announce and welcome Mackenzie to the this new position of the special event coordinator for Grant County. Right. Uh, she's been doing wonderful and has um, taken off. Um, so we'll start and we'll just go through each event like we did last time and then you guys can let us know if you have any questions. All right. Um, so first on the agenda is Pioneer Day celebration. Uh, and then just let me, okay. uh, it's a community, cultural, religious, education, and entertainment. Uh, the location is at Redshift's Lodge. The total daily attendance is 315, and it is on July 24th. Um, it will be a movie um, about John Ford. Any questions on that one? I have no questions yet. She's trying to, he's helping you. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's my son. I know exactly which one it is. <laughs> And then um, going into August, we have the Moab Music Festival, which just is music cost, uh, concert festival entertainment educational. It's August 25th through September 11th. Total daily attendance is between 75 and 500. The location is uh, multiple locations, private property, BLM land, Canyonlands National Park, Coral River, Red Cliffs Lodge, Star Hall, Old City Park, Goose Island, uh, this goes over three weekends, various music, uh, it has a long standing history. Very, very familiar and two thumbs up for that one. <laughs> yep. um, the next one is the Ute 100, it's athletic competitive <coughs> running, August 26th through the 27th. Total daily attendance is 200. It will be on the LaSalle Loop Road beginning and ending at the parking lot at Miners Basin. This has been held since 2018. Okay. Uh, um, I just I want to bring up that uh, Commissioner um, Walker isn't here, but he did write a email with input. I don't know. Do you guys is it appropriate to read his email, seeing as he's not here? Do you think I'm looking for input from everybody? Shop, so to me, that's, that's appropriate. Okay. Okay. I might it, it, Angie, if you don't mind, I might just read Commissioner Walker's. Email real quick since he isn't here and he wanted yeah. input. Is and it then, on the U100? It, it's not, but that was one of the um, events that I think he did mention in his email. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll just read that real quick because it can inform our decision making and then uh, then we can get back up to it. I'm sorry, I should have done that right at the beginning. Uh, okay, so he says, uh, Dear County Commission, I'm unable to make the workshop. Um, Let's see, the Grant County Special Events Ordinance, which he references, uh, lays out considerations for approval in sections 8.16.010 and 8.16.100.b.ii. In particular, there's 
8.16.010.B, um, offer diversity of special events and opportunities for residents and visitors alike, he highlights. Uh, we also have an informal unwritten policy of continuing to approve established events which have not caused problems in the past. Finally, as we saw at the last uh, intent to approve approval round, our list of established events is dominated by foot races, bicycle events, and ORV events. Uh, it follows that if we want to increase the diversity of types of events that we host, the large majority of new, not yet established events will need to be things other than foot races, bicycle events, and ORV events. Or turning it around, we should only approve new capitals, foot race, bicycle, and ORV events if the proposed new event offers something really exceptional. Typical events of these types don't make the cut. A large faction of the ITAs in this round are newer, newish foot race, bike, or ORV events. And he goes on to list number three, the U-100 foot race. Um, number six is the Blazer Bash, new and not locally sponsored. Number seven, Ladies Network Expo, new to Moab, uh, ORV Expo and Trail Rides. Uh, number eight, COTAH, uh, newish, but relatively small and mostly in the hinterlands. Number 10, Moab Century Tour, new. Um, but locally sponsored and proceeds go to charity. And then number 11, high school bike race, new-ish. Uh, he puts in parentheses second year, but it's actually at least uh, probably seven or eight, uh, very large. Uh, then he goes on to none of these events is, in my opinion, super objectionable, but if we keep adding ever more of these types of events in our calendar, then we will never achieve the event diversity we desire. A special event permit is a privilege, not a right, instead of, quote, approve all new event ITAs unless there's a strong reason not to, unquote. I think our stance should be, quote, approve new event ITAs only if they offer something very positive to our community. And that's the entirety of his statements. I just thought that'd be a helpful thing to read. Are we, uh, would it be most useful to back and forth as they come up or read through all of them and then? Let's take a read through all okay. of them and ask her if we have particulars. Great. Like questions, we got that okay? Like for, okay, that, yeah, I think that's great as well. Okay, so, sorry for interrupting, Angie, and you, and you, no, fine. you can uh, return to the U100. So the U100 is an athletic competitive running event uh, with a total daily attendance of 200 people, and they've held this event since 2018. Do you guys have any questions on that one? Um, now we're into September. Um, apply that right They're applying for fall the same way that they applied for spring. So it would be first season starting September 1st through October 31st. Um, fall season, weekends only. Total daily attendance is 500 to 750 max, which that's a high number that they're estimating. Uh, private property, live concerts um, staged on the lawn. That's the Red Cliff Lodge. How many people? They're um, estimating 500 to 750. Right. That's, I think he showed me that was high estimate. Yeah. This for the first year. Um, the next one is the Red Rock Four Wheelers Labor Day Camp Out. This would be over um, Labor Day weekend. Total daily attendance is capped at 250 people, which is 150 vehicles. Um, this is Jeep Safari Trails. Um, over a 30 year history for this event. And um, again, it's limited at 150 vehicles. Next one is Blazer Bash, motorized um, club event. September 8th through the 10th, total daily attendance is 112 people, which would be 45 vehicles. Uh, event location is uh, Shaper, Switchback, Backwards, Bill, Pickle, Corral, Hash, Chicken Corners, Flat Iron, Mesa, Pritchard Canyon, Fins and Things, Hell's Revenge, Mob Ren, Poison Spider, Steel Bender, Crack in the Back, Cane Creek, Cliffhanger. A quick question on that one. Um, what's their history? Have we had it at all? I, I feel like I remember this coming through, but mm -hmm. this is brand new. Um, like, what do you mean their history? How long? Like, like how, many? how long? Yeah. Um, it's not, it, the event's been going on for a while. They just became permitted for the first time last year. So, so it's one of they've the, just been doing right. without permits. Yeah. Okay. But so they've done it one year with a permit. Yes. Okay. How long have they been doing it? 
Yep. Just a guess. So you said a long time. <laughs> and and right, right. Yeah. And positive, positive experience when they did it permitted, or did you have any? We did not get any negative feedback okay. from the community. The community. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next, work, next one is the Ladies Network Commission. This one will be mostly centralized at OSTA. Uh, this event holder wants to focus on events for the lady outdoors person. Uh, the dates will be September 8th through the 19th. Total daily attendance will be 250 people um, with 150 vehicles max. Uh, this is her seventh annual convention, but it'll be the first time that she's wanting to hold it in Moab. Um, and this is something that she would like to make a reoccurring event. Uh, she'll be holding seminars, motivational speakers, interactive education, certificate programs for wilderness first aid and tread lightly. Community benefits events include a community give back project. Organizations previously worked with some of the things that she's previously worked with is a um, victims advocate group for domestic violence. So I don't know if that's the group that she's looking at working with this year, but that's what she's done before in the past. Um, and then there will be an adventure day led by local outfitters on trails for a limited number of pre-registered participants. Um, okay, so it's, it's not much trail action. It's mostly inside no, and like, no. yeah, okay. It's more um, clinic based for teaching women how to check their own oil, check yeah. their own tires, um, how to four-wheel drive, how to properly maneuver the trails, how to be independent. Cool. Is she, is she local? She has her address is a local address. Um, she She's here, but she's also in Arizona. Okay. Yeah. Cool. It has a, yeah, that offers some diversity. Yeah. 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 And um, she has great um, connections, too, with um, outdoor, outdoor networks and they're expanding. They're expanding. She just gave us more information stating that okay. they're expanding to more outdoor activities like fishing, hunting, oh, yeah. more outdoorsman type stuff. And it's all based for the woman. Right. Okay, but, okay. Um, and, and, and this is the question, but I noted that the Blazer Bash and this one are overlapping. Is that correct? There's the a possibility. Blazer. Some of the September ones are. Yeah, I think, I mean, they're, yeah. can you just... And so is the yeah, blazer, few days. right? Is the blazer bash going to use those stuff? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions on that one? So she hadn't uh, done her her event here in Moab, but she has a history of doing her event in other places. But she's looking to make Moab the permanent home of the event, more or yes. less. Okay. Um. How, just I'm sorry. So the, how many are in the ladies? Uh, it would be a total daily attendance of 250. Are they camping out at Osta? Yes. Okay, so it won't be. Uh, okay, thank you. That answers. Yeah, it'll be centralized at Osta with the clinics and um, everything there. Um, and she's looking at utilizing the whole facility Great. during this time period. I think it sounds, yeah. Sounds like a cool event. Um, Number eight is the Kotal Rally, motorized um, tournament competition. Dates are the 12th through the 13th. Total daily attendance is 70 with 56 uh, motorcycles. BLM Trails, so this is the third year. Um, the motorcycles follow a route from San Juan through Grand County and camp at Dune Bridge Campground. There's not much going on here. Um, in That's the way yeah. they did yeah. that last year. Yeah, yeah. they did. Yeah. Um, and then just to speak on behalf of this um, event holder, he was really excited about his event and wanted to do a demonstration um, for the commission on his bikes. We're more than happy to set something up out at OSTA um, so you could see what his event's about and what his bikes are about. Um, uh, it's really it's, passionate yeah. about yeah. what he's got going on. Yeah, it's really it's super passionate. They, they were I the, am working with them to get whoever I can to a presentation, hopefully in February. If I, if I remember right, they also, it was two, two of the yeah. um, organizers showed up here yeah, at the meeting and yeah. we, we spoke yeah. last yeah, year. They were right. really, yeah. really very polite. Yeah, yeah. 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 they're very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. They're very... They've got a lot of knowledge to spread out. And, and they, they wanted to demonstrate how they like pack their bikes and how they like, how they, yeah. Yeah, and how their bikes work. I think uh, 
um, like the EPA standard they're meeting and how they meet that. Was it the one that had it where they, they monitored how fast they were driving? By GPS, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it is they a were... competition, but it's all monitored by GPS. Right. And they can't right. go over certain rounds. Mm -hmm. Or they lose points. Yeah, I remember that. It was really hard. Right? Okay. Yeah. I think they had to be off trail at a certain time in the evening to yeah, it's like that. I, I think each right. segment stopped. Very safe. Um, the next one is Mother of All Boogies. It's an athletic recreational skydiving event. This will be held out at the Canyon Lands Airport. Uh, dates are September 14th. Uh, daily total attendance is 200. Um, other locations would be camping at Sitla, land off the of Blue Hills Road and landing at Mineral Bottom Airstrip in Mineral Bottom Canyon. Uh, they do have a 16 year tradition uh, that not be permitted, uh, but they do have a 16 year tradition. Um, 2023 event will need to meet additional conditions outlined by the Kenya Lands Regional Airport. Uh, so I've been in contact with the director out there and she will have conditions uh, if this event's approved for it. This is maybe an odd question and you might not be able to answer it, but do we have any kind of numbers from like search and rescue or sheriff's department as to the impact of this? Like you said, it's not been permitted. Yeah. Any kind of idea what they've done in the past? Because my little, this is maybe hearsay, so please acknowledge it as such, but I think they do a little bit more than just jumping out of planes. Like there's been some pretty major parties, mm -hmm. of course, you know, connected with it. So, yeah, and yeah, that would be hence why the airport director has conditions okay. on this event. She okay. wants extra security. She wants EMS out there. She wants a security deposit. Okay. Um, she had a list of things that she wanted to put on this uh, permit if it happens. Right. I just think it's something to think about, like the resources on our sheriff's department specifically, if they're having rangers out on. So uh, I, this is just me. This is my just hypothesizing. So keep that in mind. I checked with the sheriff and he didn't have any issue whatsoever with this or any of the events that are on our list today. You did? I did. Well, I guess it's going to be part of the permit process. I guess I'm talking more like past, you yeah. know what I mean? Like if they've had interactions in the past. Yeah. I haven't heard anything. So, yeah. and I think Angie just spoke with the airport director last week. And that was the information she got from her. Mm -hmm. Is that we just needed extra condition? Yeah. Of the rooms. Yeah, she said she didn't have a problem with the event or putting the event on. It. She just wanted those additional conditions. But as far as the extra social mm -hmm. um, activities that come into town with that, I don't know. I can do some research, pull that in for yeah, sure. That, and then I always, yeah. you know, we do send this out to referral agencies, and you know, they can say that in the application process. Right. Um, yeah, I think I'm. Not so much concerned about the actual skydiving. Yeah. I'm more concerned about the other events that are surrounding it. And Mallory can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that the commission has the authority to call this one back to okay. the final review. Okay. Want the packet. Am okay. I right on that, Mallory? Yes, that is correct. Well, I, th I worked with, uh, I think, the extra things that the airport's putting on is going to really help like, keep yeah. it a little yeah, safer. security measures. Yeah, and like keep it a little safer. There were people going where they weren't supposed to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some real health and uh, safety issues before. So we'll, we'll watch it, you know, even if it's like just make sure we find out, have Tammy do a report on how it goes. And I think this year, just us having the items that we have in play, we'll have more, what about it? better records to report back to you next year. Better documentation. Documentation. Better tracking. Yeah, surveys. Uh, for better the follow Yeah. Okay. Good help. Any other questions on that one? Okay. Um, the next one is Mob Century Tour. It's an athletic cycling tour. Dates are the 15th through the 17th of September. Daily total attendance is 300. Um, event location is the Archway Inn, um, paved roads through Dead Horse State Park, Moab Bag Path, Highway 313 through Moab to Mill Creek, down the Spanish Valley Drive, over to LaSalle Loop Road, and along Highway 128. 
Uh, this event raises money for cancer survivors and the Infusion Center at Blah Regional Hospital. Yeah, and I just want to, I think Kevin wrote that this had only been going on for two years, but I think it's been 22 years. I know it's been going on for quite a while. I, I actually participated in this event at least like probably 10 or 15 years ago. Um, number 11 is Moab Race, the UHSCL, this athletic running competitive. Dates are September 22nd through 24th. Total daily attendance is 1,500 out at the Bar M Trails. It's a high school competition. Um, and event helps facilitate the education and development of interscholastic cycling teams, coaches, and volunteers. Sorry, I had a typo in there. I, said, I called it a running. Okay, race. good. Yeah, I was just going <laughs> to clarify yeah. that. Thank uh, did I read well. that too? Like that? <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. That's all right. Said, right? Really? <laughs> no, yeah, you, that confused me for a second too. But yeah, that, that, this is the it's the high school mountain yeah. biking league. Yeah. That's good. yeah. Robot. Oh, and I believe this one also has a, a close to a 10 year history anyway. Probably Evan, your, your older son competed in this yeah. a long time ago. Or yeah, and I think what's nice about this one is it's uh, the teams from Southeastern Utah, they, they often travel to St. George and, yeah. you know, Eagle Mountain north of Salt Lake and stuff. And so to have not just a home race for our kids, but, you know, kids from Monticello and Green River. It's just nice to uh, kind of be on their own turf. So. Yeah. I'm going to defend it if it comes to it. No, I've just <laughs> been trying to get the cross country to team to run to do their stuff out there too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, I don't know the current status, but the Mud Springs trail mm -hmm. system in San Juan County is being developed with this event in mind yes so that it would be a more appropriate space than out at the brands so this may be the last year that the race actually happens at the brands yeah that's in the process of they're they're scouting it right now and it is it's and that's great because it's going to be a joint home field for san juan county and grant county since it's down there and there san juan county is also putting up for to participate in developing yeah. the trail system the the crux of something like that though is that would be the event would be happening in San Juan County, right? But it's safe to assume that those fifteen hundred participants are all going to be staying there. in Grand County, right. and then it's not going to go through this process. So the plot thickens. Uh, number twelve is the Moab Overland Expo. This is a motorized van rally expo, educational outdoor camping, September twenty sixth through twenty seventh. This will be at OSTA. Daily attendance is estimated at 400. The expo includes educational classes, training, inspirational programs, and speakers. Uh, for 2002, the commission voted uh, this event to be on a probationary period, pending how the 2022 year um, went. So I can report back as far as the OSTA standpoint. I thought it was a great event, um, bigger than what we thought. I've never seen so many van lifers before mm -hmm. in one area. Um, and every single one of them came with a dog, which I thought was <laughs> awesome. So many dogs. Um, and everyone picked up after their dogs. So I thought that was great, too. Um, I think that sp speaks huge for the type of people that brought it. Um, but overall, no issues. Um, there was a thing with Blue Ribbon Coalition coming in, but even that was not a thing. Um, and as far as the community, I didn't get anything back from the community either. I didn't as far as it. anything, I attended negative. this event. I thought it went off well. Yeah. Very much. And that was the wasn't that the first weekend in November last year? Um, it was the last weekend of October. Okay. Yeah. Great. It was there. It was a huge, busy time in town. I remember there's a bunch of stuff going on that weekend. Anyway. It was very. Yeah, busy. they had a they had a good turnout. Mm -hmm. And then wasn't it? I, their previous application kind of ambiguous about uh, trail use. Like it was kind of like encouraging their folks to plan their own trail rides in the area. Yeah, they didn't do any scheduled tours. They actually set up an obstacle course at the back of the arena using the old BMX track. Uh -huh. um, and they did clinics out there, teaching them how to articulate their van. Um, and that, that worked good. Okay. Um, I don't know what the 
congestion was on the trails. Most of these people don't really take these vans on heavy off-roading. Yeah, they're not. No, they're, yeah, the, the um, nicest of vans aren't mm -hmm. awesome <laughs> off-road. <laughs> I don't think there was heavy usage on the trails. Like, okay. maybe Shaver. Like, Great. Uh, but they mostly just stuck around the arena and did clinics. Um, and they had some bonfires. Overall, it was pretty... It's pretty chill. Um, the last one is Outer Bike Cycling Festival Expo, September 28th through October 1st. Total daily attendance is 650. They'll be using the bar and parking lot and trails. Um, host events throughout the year in other states is Vermont, Minnesota, Colorado, and Arkansas. The organization has been holding an annual event for 12 years. It's, I know, the people that run now. Yeah. Yes, really yeah. People. Mark and Ashley, yeah. So I don't, I didn't see any, for me, none of them raised a red flag. Um, no, I was slightly concerned, I think, about the overlap of the Blazer Bash and the Bauer Motorsports ladies. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was just... And also interested just to see if you had feedback on the Blazer Bash, if there was any negative feedback whatsoever. Uh, I remember we kind of got that yeah. shoved down our throat last year. Not to be rude, but yeah. I remember it was like they were on their way. Yeah. Right? So, um, I, so I was like, I didn't really feel like we, we had to vet that appropriately. but I do have one um, negative thing about okay. one of them, and I don't know if it's appropriate yeah. to speak it here. Yes. Um, but the Blazer Bash did have a requirement put on them from one of the referral agencies. Um, and they did not follow through on that. Okay. Oh, my God. Uh, okay. You know, that helps. I did speak out to them, and it, it may have been a little bit of a miscommunication with the referral agency. It could have possibly been a little okay. bit of a miscommunication, so I would hate to, like, yeah. hold their permit over their head for that, but they right. did not follow through. Um, and it was a contract with a, one of our local... Um, businesses that they lost money out of for a weekend. The business lost money? Yeah. Not good. So can we reiterate, Mallory said we can call them back with maybe a little additional information? Yeah, you can so, call the event back. Like okay. we, could, we could gather the information in okay. the event packet and before it's finalized. Okay. How much? And that's, that's why we brought it here today. Yeah, that's great. For the ordinance, it would have qualified as a low-impact event. Okay. But we knew there might be some discussion around this event. Okay. And we might want to go through the application process to just make sure they meet those conditional um, approvals. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm a little concerned about this one. Yeah. Um, and then the only other one that, again, maybe is just the mother of all boogies. And like I said, I don't think I'm that concerned about what's going to take place at the airport yeah. because I know Tammy will regulate that. I'm more concerned, like, if they have additional events coupled with, you know, the jumping, right? Yeah. So um, I don't know if, you, if we can look into yeah. that. Like, if they flat out are saying, yeah, we're going to have a dance party on Saturday night, which is all fine, but I just want to make sure that our sheriff, you know, you know, the sheriff's department has the capability to deal yeah. with the extra events that surround it. And we can check with them. You, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah. And that will all come in with the application packet. So okay, we'll great. get full schedules of all of right. that stuff. So if they okay, say cool. Friday night's going to be a dance party. Okay, okay. So what are you doing? Is alcohol going to be served in? Certainly. Who's going to be a security on site? Right. What type of agent is down? That will be Perfect. part of the okay. application process. So for me, those are the only two that I was just a little put some notes on. I don't know, so my mouth shut. if the blazer bash was at a different time, would that make it? Like if they did a different weekend instead? Well, I guess as long as it's not overlapping with you, with those guys. Um, it just it seems, seems like they're going to be like opposite. Ends okay. Of town, okay, great. Like. Um, that doesn't really bother me. I guess more so knowing, like, you know, it'd be good just to clarify. Um, I, it's a bummer to hear if they, if they shafted some business in town, right? Yeah. So it'd be good just to know the specifics, and if it was a minor issue, that then we can just look it at that. It was um, 
satellite phones. They were supposed to have satellite phones. That's right. I know this. I know this story. Mm -hmm. I think you were there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Trish uh, and Angie, just to speak to, to that, I looked at the ordinance and definitely if they don't comply with any condition given by um, by any of the referral agencies with the permit being issued, then it would be grounds um, for denial. And when I reached out to the referral agency to let him know of the issue and to, to let him know just to ask for action, um, that's where the miscommunication may have come in. And then just to let you know, I think the, the event holder for the ladies off-road is actually on the Zoom meeting right now if you can send questions for her too. She's very passionate about the event, very eager to to get it off the ground. I think it sounds like a cool event. <laughs> so I think it's, yeah, yeah. It, it checks that box of diversity. Too. Yeah, yeah, I think it's neat. And, and, yeah, because yeah. that's what they wanted to do. So many of the events yep. seem to be kind of, especially the motorized events. Some of the little... clinics that she does will be like for the youth, like as far as uh, getting a bicycle and teaching young girls how to assemble the bike themselves. Yeah, well, great. I could go to that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also, I'd, I'd also like to say that weekend that there are a couple things piling up. That That is a pretty slow weekend. It's the weekend after Labor Day, and it's generally the weekend before the season really kicks in. So that I, don't, I think that uh, in my experience running a business here that's that's totally tourism related, that's that's a pretty slow time for us. Um, so that'd be good for the business. For right. The town to have. Right. Questions? Blaze through this one. No, so you did great. Good. This was an easy one compared to the last. So I, I was just going to say on the blazer bash, and again, I, I wasn't, I didn't see any red flags there myself. But if they they were, did we? They were. Did you mention they were under on probation from last year? Or? No, that was in Overland. Oh, that was the Overland. Okay, the Overland. gotcha. Yeah, right. they had a condition on their permit for last year to uh, to see how year. it went this year. Yeah. Okay, that's 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 great. It went okay. well. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think we can take them off probation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm fine with all of these myself. Yeah, I think it'll be so great in the future, like you guys said, to have surveys so we know, you know, coming out. Um, it, it, I think just a more holistic view of every event, right? Yeah, and I think just the communication that we're having already. Good. I've Excited. seen, oh yeah, just in like the two days <laughs> that I've had some information. That's great. I also want to mention while we're here, for the record, too, that this is a light quarter because we have there's very few events in uh, July and August. Um, so for the new commission, uh, commissioners, especially Q's one and three are a lot later than Q's two and four. So so next time we'll probably be looking at a lot more conflicts and more maybe controversial. And then, Andy, events. do we have most stuff on the calendar here so we can kind of get a visual? Yeah, we can get this one updated. Okay. Uh, McKinley made new PDF. Okay. Um, calendars i'm not sure if you guys got those in the packet if okay. not we could get them to you yeah so I'll we have a kind of that that oh, visual yeah. and okay. i'll include it in the packet okay cool thank you that helps just that <laughs> just visualize visual, it, it yeah kind of i would uh just say that i can appreciate some of uh kevin's comments and the idea of you know not just approving every new one mm -hmm. that applies but now that we've gone through them it seems like the only truly new one in this bunch is the ladies network expo and like mary was saying that um kind of checks the boxes of, of adding some diversity to to some of that so um and with the the fact that it's mostly at osta and that any trail rides will use local outfitters that's um i feel okay with it during this slow july august time so um, we also had a meeting this morning with Tread Lightly, um, and that event holder works really closely with Tread Lightly, so there'll also be Tread Lightly information and clinics uh, there. Do, do you know if uh, Tread Lightly offers any kind of like accreditation 
or like seal like certificates? The it's or like a like I, I think I actually think they do. I think they're they're kind of the motorized equivalent of leave no trace, but I, I, yeah. I believe they do offer. It well, I wonder. I, I think they might for like training for individuals, but I wonder if like for an event organization or events, say, or right? This is uh, oh, that's a good um, yeah. We would be very interested if they offered something like that. Can I offer an answer? Yeah. Oh, yes, please. Hi, this is Charlene Bauer, and I am also on the board of directors for Tread Lightly uh, as long and running this event, Ladies Offer Network. Um, so we will have certification training, and it's a Tread Lightly Tread Trainer class, which does help the user group, as you were just talking about. Then there's a master tread trainer that comes next, um, which is like myself where it's training. Now I can certify other people. And then there is not yet, but there was talk also about what you guys are talking about and helping event managers have a tread trainer certification as well. Great. Great. Yeah, thank you. I've worked on a couple of projects with tread lightly. They've gone well and they're very, very concerned and take very good care of the back country with what they're doing. So I like working with them as an organization for sure. And another note to um, Kevin's email here, I mean, the last thing he does say is something very positive to our community and considering that this is kind of the off season, I would say that most of these do qualify as some bringing something positive into our community at a time when business is down a little bit for some of the people around here and yet they have to keep their employees because correct yeah out, so agreed totally it's, it's a little harder i think it comes down to uh well finances every event on this list uh is bringing finances uh in some way or form uh to the grand county area and uh to speak to kevin's point if if they're not bringing something to the area i'd have concerns about them but they are. Uh, they're they're bringing that income in a time where we need it. And it sounds like a lot are making a move to have more than just like generating income for the community. It's like having community impacts, such as raising mm -hmm. money for the innovation center or working with the local program or food for the food bank, that kind of thing. So it sounds like a lot are really trying to branch out into community. Is there uh, something from the Blazer Bash that you would highlight in that category? I don't have a lot of information yet. I can get back to you during the application process. Yeah, maybe you could plant that seed with them. Yes. Like. Mm -hmm. Not that it's a condition by any means, but... It's a helpful checkbox. Yeah. It would strengthen their application. How about that? All right, any other any other questions or discussion on this? So we'll have the we'll be able to approve these during our regular meeting at that particular action item. And I would propose we still have 20 minutes, so I'd propose taking a quick recess and then I think getting the next one started at like quarter till or maybe 10 till would be great. Uh just so we have the extra time and then we could definitely take a recess before we get into our regular commission meeting. Yeah, that's nice to start early. Do you, or how does anyone need just like is five minutes good or yeah. ten or okay. Let's reconvene at uh at uh just say two two fifty. That's fine. Two are any of you guys notaries? Alicia. Alicia.
Mallory, can you hear us on Zoom? I can hear you. Awesome, thank you. All right, good to go. All right, I will reconvene this uh, workshop of the Grand County Commission. All present are the same as previously, and we are now working on intent to apply for the alternative dwelling overlay. Uh, and I will reach, I will turn uh, it over to Elisa Martin, our planning and zoning director. Thank you, Thanks. Nice to see you all in 2023. I feel like it's been a while since. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't want to spend too much of our workshop time discussing the background of the alternative dwelling overlay, but I do just want to summarize um, a little bit of what we'll be discussing today. The background is provided in the staff report, so if anybody is wondering where this all came from. Um, so far, we've had a total of eight alternative dwelling overlay intent to apply submissions, which all together propose 143 residential units. Those applicants that are selected to move forward in this process would need to submit a full application for a rezone, um, which uh, would be to the ADO district. And that's a legislative decision process. So it requires two public hearings, one at planning commission and one at county commission. Um, once the rezone is approved, um, the applicant would only need to process a site plan review with planning and zoning, which is an administrative decision. So we do that in um, in house and planning and zoning. Um, but that, that and that doesn't require a public meeting. The site plan review is processed through the county engineer, building department, road supervisor, health department. With the so all the normal reviewing entities must sign off before the development can proceed. This is where a drainage plan may be triggered or other site improvements, depending on the requirements of um, each of those entities. Today, we are looking at whether or not each development proposal is, proposal is compatible with the applicability criteria of the ADO district. So it's really about weighing um, the various factors related to the use of being a long-term camp park in that particular location where it's being proposed. So, for example, the ordinance states that the commission shall consider and make findings related to one, the relative availability of workforce housing as compared to the fall of 2022 and current conditions, but also the impacts that the development will have on adjacent land uses. So, in thinking about each project, it's important to keep in mind and weigh the need for workforce housing against the impacts the development may have on neighborhood character and levels of service, such as traffic and water water usage. The staff report lists each project submission with a vicinity map, which shows zoning, existing structures, density, along with a summary of each proposal. The applicability criteria from the newly adopted section 4.9 of land use code is also provided in the staff report. And I also just want to reiterate, because I know it's an ongoing concern, that all ADO developments are required to report a deed restriction for the property which strictly prohibits their use as overnight rentals and states that the units shall be rented for terms of at least 60 consecutive days by tenants or their employers. And with that, I can take any questions or um, clarifying. Okay, I, I just wanted to clarify that this this is an intent to apply. So if we if we approve these, that means that they still have many hoops to jump through, including two public hearings where where folks at large can weigh in on yes. the application. And it, it's it's we're not rubber stamping these we're at all these. right we're just kind of green lighting them to, to go forward to go forward yeah. right right but that being said sorry Mary you yeah. go ahead yeah go ahead when I went I rode drove all over town or all over the valley looking at the properties to just to see and it almost looked like there was a couple that were already in the process there, I, I did the same thing and, and noted, me. I mean, noted that as well. It like it was more than just leveling the land. It looked like they, you know. We know of one that was in stated in the staff report that was in violation of land use code. And we've addressed the property owner with a violation letter for the illegal grading and uh -huh. installation of infrastructure yeah. without going through any kind of yeah, approvals. I don't know of the other... The, uh, there, that there was a, it, it was the land it looked like they were preparing the land there yeah. was nothing that looked like there was any infrastructure like the one on Robert yeah. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. see that. 
yeah, I mean, if there are anything, you know, any concerns with properties that are doing that, just let us know and we can send Josh out to check it out. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. Uh, Trish? I guess the comment that I want to make, I mean, I have quite a few comments regarding this, but just to start, I mean, I do think it would behoove us, though, at this time to be really um, calculated about our decisions because we don't want to make these people go through this entire process and then have it turned back down later. And the reality is, I think there is going to be a lot of kickback on some of these from surrounding communities. So I think we can flesh that out now and not torture um, developers. Right. That's point. my opinion. Yeah. Doing them a favor. Yeah. The, the application fee for a rezone is $750. So it's kind of a, you know, it's a financial commitment. Right. Yeah. So do we want to jump right in or how do yeah, we? Yeah, do I, I, I think, uh, I think just like we did last time, Kevin wanted to weigh in on this. I, I, he has a quick email. I, I, want to read just to give his input and then we can jump in if that's if that everyone's okay with that okay I'll, i'm going to read kevin's input since he's traveling uh he says as we were drafting the new ado policy we, we received quite a bit of public input asking us to not allow ado developments in the middle of existing lower density residential housing many people asked specifically that the rural residential zone be taken off the table we did not take our rural residential off the table, but we did assure the public that we would use our discretion to not approve ADO applications in the middle of low density residential areas. We now have the opportunity to follow through on that promise. Uh, ITAs numbers two, three, five, and seven are relatively small rural residential parcels in the middle of existing low density neighborhoods. For the reasons given above, I am not in favor of approving these four ITAs. If the remaining four larger ADO ITAs were approved, this would still amount to 110 uh, approvals of the 142 total on the table today, which would be 77% uh, of the proposed ADO sites. And that's so all his statement was. Two, three, five, and seven, correct. Yes, Trish. Um, just to and, and kind of back up, and I know you don't want to dive too far back into this, but I do want to kind of refresh people's um, memories. This this was a tough battle. You know, it kept going back and forth to the commission and back to the planning commission. We did have a ton of feedback from the community, both for and against. And so please keep that in mind. And I will state that a lot of the individuals that were for it, and not to pick on you, Brian, but a lot of the that came from that community, NAVTEC, it, you know, supporting that. So if, if I were to break down and pull out, well, who supported it? aside from math tech, it wasn't huge. And there was a lot of pushback. If my memory, it was kind of like 35 to 35. I can't remember the amount of comments, but it was kind of even-ish. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of pushback from the rural residential community. And specifically from, you know, I represent that community and I had very, uh, quite a few meetings. I mean, we're talking, you know, 10 people surrounding me really pushing back at this. So, you know, for me, and I wasn't there during the final vote, I wasn't going to win anyway, so that was fine. Um, but I, you know, I was trying to adhere to what my constituents were asking. And so I'm going to push on that today again. Thanks, Trish. Uh, on that note, and just in interest of time, uh, piggybacking off Kevin's comments, is that safe that everyone would I don't know what verb we're using for a favorable recommendation or invite the applicants to apply for one, four, six, and eight. The I mean, Murphy Lane, the Highway 191, the 400 West, and the other Highway 191. Does anybody have issues with those? No, like for me, that's exactly what I highlighted. And if I were to talk about Murphy Lane, I would just state that there is historic use. I did talk to Brian this morning, and I have a question. For, oh, Stephen's gone now. Okay, well, I have a question. Stephen, and Stephen said he wouldn't be back until okay. at least quarter to You know, four. so to me, that's a historic use um, of that property. Sorry, the, there's there's two Murphy Lane ones. Oh, one. I'm sorry. You're um, talking about item one five seven four. Yeah, 1574, it's a trailer park, yeah. and um, 
the two on 191, they're both commercially zoned, so it seems perfect to me. And the 400 West, 1089 North, again, to me, that's historic use of that property. But I did talk to Brian about this, and I want to point this out, and maybe Stephen can help us later on. You know, if you pull the FEMA floodplain zone, that that is in a floodplain. And so... I don't know if Brian, is it okay if we ask Brian to come up for just a uh, minute? It's a workshop. I think that's is that okay? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, Brian, yeah. come on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would also say that that's part of the permit process is, it is. And building. And, and, build and, yeah. yeah. About that. Okay, great. I think you have even been in touch with Bill Hulse a little about great. Yeah. potential okay. building in the floodplain and how to get around that and make sure that they do it right. Okay, great. And there's all kinds of ways they can do that. Right. He yeah. he mentioned a couple of things to me today, too. I just don't right. want to allow building and then the county be liable. When it's well, that, and that's not this body's okay. job. Right. You know, it's right. if... If they can Definitely. engineer it in a way yeah. that that it gets approved by Great. the right people, yeah. But I'm not an engineer. I'm not going to say <laughs> you should have built there. Like, so, right. I just. Um, yeah. So are you, are you hooked up to sewer there then? Or you will be, Brian? Okay, cool. You don't have too far to go for sewer. Right there. <laughs> you do have to pump it up hill. Not, Sorry. not much, yeah. Right, okay. But I, I just thought that information was just to share with sure. folks. Was just out of curiosity, Brian, when, when was the last time that property did see flooding or so actually water there? 2011. I remember that summer very well, yeah. Right. Big, uh, I, I live down the street from there, and that was a big mosquito summer. <laughs> 45,000 Yes, I remember it well. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and the, the two statutes, you know, that or the two pieces that I pulled out of this ordinance specifically was just compatibility with the existing community character and the existing density and the historic use of the property. And when you look at those other properties, they just don't meet those standards. The properties, which the ones that the, Kevin had... Uh, the two, three... Yeah. Five and seven. seven. Yeah. And it really um, concerns me the one on Red Cliff that I mean that just is an indication that they're not going, you know, if they're pushing the rules, pushing the envelope already. Do, do we want to uh i think evan brought up maybe just going forward in a in a and in a, in a looking at approving those four yeah i would say are those four any invited to apply so and those four are the uh the one of the old the, the in our packet pack, number yeah the packery nine, camp ground of murphy four. six and eight right yeah. okay yes i don't have a problem with those i would ask brian you look you approve for you look for 28 sites and I, I live down the street and i walk past there all the time at least once a week so i've seen i've seen the number of people and stuff camping is that is that generally indicative of how many people you guys have down there in the middle of the season like with your employees and whatnot sites are actually reported there yeah. right yeah i like walked around there spots mm -hmm. much yeah 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 i asked him that question yeah, yeah. To okay his amount and of employees you know, right you know, we have 50 employees mm -hmm. at the high season yeah um, so you know 28 sites is not it's not worth your state. Yes. And those sites are all for your employees. Yeah, just for us. Yeah. We're, not, we're not planning on making that commercial yeah. picture of this. this is yeah, yeah. Just for employees. Yeah. No, I, I think these are great and we should mm -hmm. move on yeah. to some of the tough ones. Okay. Any does anyone have anyone else have an issue with one of the four that were mentioned by Evan as far as a, a, approving? I do just have, and maybe Elisa, I don't know if this is a question for you or if maybe it's a, more of a question for Debbie. But what I had talked to Debbie Swayze about this idea of taxation, or maybe Gabe, you can help. So how do I just how do I describe this? And I'm gonna sound like I don't know what I'm talking about because I don't know what I'm talking about. But if it's taxed, if they're a, a full-time resident, you get taxed one rate. So, and I'm talking, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about those two commercial properties. Like, would Dan, for example, be able to pull those units out of a commercial taxation? 
So the way that Debbie explained it okay. to me is that if they can prove that, if, if Dan can prove that the people who are living there live there, reside there six months out of the year consecutively, I believe, okay. that that would qualify the, those particular areas could go in, could be taxed residential. Okay, but it's just going to be particular portions. I mean, so we need to know this because we're feasibly going to be losing tax right. revenue. Right. So I, I guess I want, I just want some. Well, yeah, I think I, the one thing too, just to really maybe make the distinction between what Dan was hoping for too, is that there is a difference between the, he's paying TRT right now right. because of this OAO zoning okay. versus um, he's thinking about being, being able to not do that and just maybe just pay commercial um, okay. and, and maybe residential if, if he could get that. But I think the main thing was just to get rid of his his uh, paying the TRT for, so he's not doing nightly rentals. So okay, I okay. I just, I just wanted to, again, like bring that up mm -hmm. as, Kind of a, alternatively and i'd ask brian this would 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 the tax on your property increase because right now it's basically a vacant lot right it's, it's a vacant lot right now. It's so with, with the zoning it would it would change the taxation there yeah okay it's just under reaccession, i would assume yeah okay okay so we can so no further discussion on the on the four properties okay then I would open discussion on the uh, other four properties, numbers, what, two, three, five, and seven. And um, I would, yeah, any discussion questions for Elisa or, yeah, go ahead, Bill. I, I would wonder why we didn't pull the rural residential out of this code if, as Trish says, so many of her residents don't want it because we've got the HDHO, which started out and it's still a moving target with continual amount of problems in that. I mean, I face them. I was the first developer to sign up for the HDHO, and it just seems like that we give a green light, but yet we want to put a red light or a yellow light in here. And I just think the more clarification and the easier it is for a developer to come in and help this situation, the better that it is. And I'm not, I'm not here to argue why it's in or it isn't. I'm just saying that just causes problems down the road because it, to some degree, it, in my mind, it creates a legality that we almost have to allow them to be able to build there if, if there aren't enough red flags to come up against it. And the other thing back to my um, understand Mary saying that there's some development going on somewhere. A lot of these properties have had all kinds of things going on it. And if as Brian's place has already got the spaces there, I don't I don't think we want to hold somebody that was trying to do something when they're now trying to get into compliance. I don't think we want to look negatively at that. We want to try and move forward and get some people some places to park their vans and to live in is the goal. But being involved in the HDHO from day one, I can just say that it, it needs to be a smoother and a clearer for the developers. It makes it very hard. Well, that so. that was a large point of contention. And, and our county attorney did recommend at that time that we did provide a map, but we didn't. So it's here yeah. we sit. And I, the only thing I would say to that on the other side of trying to explain yeah. where the logic came from was that rural residential is most of us Spanish Valley. And there are a lot of areas that are zoned rural residential that don't reflect rural residential density at all. They're already kind of veering towards densities that are, you know, more multifamily, sure. you know, and density. density. And so the future land use plan will be addressing all of that eventually. I'm hoping to get that going again for the spring, but in the meantime, we're just we're seeing that the zoning doesn't necessarily match up with what's on the ground for a lot of the areas. Right. Some of the areas, definitely, it's it's a match. 
So, sure. and, and I bring up that the the pro this the thing that kind of kicked it off was Brian's property. And Brian's property actually is zoned rural residential. Right. So, so if we'd have done that, then it would have precluded exactly. his his property. No, I think yeah. that was a big part of why. No, yeah. I think right. that was one. And I'm I'm not trying to talk us out of any of these. I'm just trying right. to sure that it makes I it a little bit of a moving target for it different is, individuals. So, yeah. And and but the beauty of this process is this is just like we said the intent to apply. Yeah. So right. hopefully developers haven't had to invest too much money or time to get to this place yeah. there's no right. it's pretty minimal the the application that's here before us today and it's just a chance for us to say oh not a chance hit the road or oh interesting tell us more and so and, uh, and as far as previously improving i also visited all eight of the sites yesterday and uh just just checked them out um like like uh, the swamp site where Brian is, the I mean, you could say if it's improvement, but there's basically people just camping in the mud down there. <laughs> um, and no infrastructure has been improved. Whereas the site that Mary was talking about, it's literally been graded out. There's already pat not quite pads, but it's been yeah. graded out. There's there's actually hookups already installed. It's 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 different. It's it's almost ready to go. It looks like I would say. Yeah. It's we're also about halfway through our time. Right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the, this number two, that's the one that we're talking about actually. Right. Is, um, 3380 Redcliffe Road. Um, and so that is the one where they've, um, by now they've received their uh, code enforcement letter for those violations. And um, the option to come into, to enter into a, a compliance agreement with us, and that would include if they were going to go forward with the ADO, then that would kind of dictate the path for them coming into compliance. They would have to dig up all their infrastructure, according to Bill, uh, Bill, Bill Holson, Wissa, Dana, they would have to dig all that up and actually get it inspected, and they maybe even have to um, improve or upgrade some of the infrastructure based on the inspection. So they've been um, informed of that. If they don't go forward in the ADO process, then there'll just be a different um, compliance path for them. I don't actually know exactly what that is, but we're working on it. Okay, thanks, Elisa. I, I think the thing for me is that it's uh, a few lots removed from the more dense zones. Um, I think some of the other proposals are kind of more in that buffer zone that we don't have. Like we have highway commercial that butts up directly to rural residential. And here, this is completely surrounded by rural residential by a few, you know, few lots. Um, and so regardless of what kind of action has been taken to this place, just the, the location of it, I'm kind of more sensitive to some of Trisha's and Kevin's um, concerns. So I know quite a few people that live in this area and yeah. I won't fight against it, but I'm not going to be the one to go to bat for this one. Mm -hmm. That was the area that had a great big, when they were doing the HDHO, that, that residents in that area did not want. They were real concerned. We got lots of uh, so you did, and I think we took it out. <laughs> we took it out. It's not in the HDHO because there was enough people concerned. And this is yeah. yeah, and this is an area, I mean, this is kind of an aside, but Jacques has had to deal with a, a little, you know, that community specifically when you turn on to, again, Angel you know, Rock. when you have to go Angel Rock. Yeah. Out of Hidden Valley, you know, they're they've been taking a, a big hit anyways. The the escalated amount of visitation to Hidden Valley, people illegally camping at Hidden Valley. Trish is talking about the trailhead people. Yeah, the trailhead. Going through, sorry. Going and so there's, there. you know, we get a lot of um letters from right. individuals in that couple, area already. You know, they're they're taking they're that. taking some heat just from that that trailhead. Yeah. Which I use all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I don't, I, this one, I, I did do a site visit there, noted the construction. This one did, it was a little, it they didn't have, it didn't look like the neighborhood was, it looked like the neighbors weren't 
super close there and it, it's close to butting up against public land. It looks like there is a lot there, but on the ground, it kind of looked like it was right on the edge of the, of the non, you know, not the neighborhood. So it, it did appear like it was a little bit more isolated maybe than some of the other yeah, ones. So yeah, it's on a dead end road. Right. It's on a dead end road. Um, so yeah, I'm, my mind's not made up on, on, on that one. I think Evan said it well. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I'd invite someone else to make comment. Mike, do you have any uh, comment on any of those? I have no comment on this lot uh, specifically. Uh, again, I'm not an engineer. Yeah. If if they were willing to process through mm -hmm. uh, digging up, up their infrastructure and getting it checked, and I mean, I'm not going to go to bat for it, but I'm not going to fight against it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm for the more housing, but I don't want it to affect the lots next to it. Yeah. Trying to move on. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Bill? Or no. Okay, okay. thank you. Do you want to move on to the next one, the, the number three, the um, thirty-two eleven Roberts Road? I don't know if we want to look at these all in. I mean, I think we'll should go through them individually. But if we look at, I don't know if we want to. You know, I think we should look at them each and then and then make a decision maybe as to whether to approve or not. So this and this one was um, this one was almost right around the corner from the yeah, previous very, one. They're very very close on Roberts Road there. Yeah, the the thing about this one is it butts up to that. It's a storage unit. Is that what the commercial is? On um, right on the uh, on the east side. Yeah, and so this has more of that uh, that buffer kind of area, which mm -hmm. um, you know in our future land use maps, you know, we're trying to create more of that. Um, it's got the exist. So, I mean, if uh, with the plan that was shown with having them in the back, they're kind of away from those current residents, closer to the power lines, closer to the commercial. I think having the current um, residents on site will kind of not only screen some of that visually, but hopefully monitor some of that um, noise kind of impacts from that might affect current neighbors. Um, Actually, uh, Brian. So Brian spoke to his uh, Matt Neeson. This is your property. Do you want to? Do you want to vacate, uh, Brian? And have Matt? Do you want to come forward and speak to this? Maybe Matt. Or... Thanks, Matt. Um, I guess I'd ask if you, have you, if you'd spoken to your neighbors yet, I, I, I went to the site visit and saw, um, you know, you have, it looks like you have two residences on either side of that. Yeah. Main residence and then there's the, uh, ADU. Right. Yep. I saw. So yeah. The, 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 the ADU will be taken out and a smaller ADU will be put in there and be approved. Mm -hmm. um, so do you, the ADU would just be swapped over basically, or it would be a, uh, you, you take out the one that's currently there, like a like a single wide. You, right, exactly. Yeah. 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 Right now, it's seventy six feet long. Mm -hmm. We would need to put something in it at most sixty feet long. Yeah. As the site plan is right now. Yeah. To, okay. to be able to get those five spaces on the northwest side. Right. So. Okay. No, I have not spoken to my neighbors. Um, that is something that will have to be done. Right. And uh, I guess my question to you all is, uh, how much pushback is too much? The, uh, <laughs> that's a that's a great question, Matt. Um, <laughs> there step, is, uh, you know, settled outside of this room with neighbors. You know, if they're screening, they right. want to see. Uh, it's the same thing when I develop a solar farm or a battery storage site. Mm -hmm. you talk to neighbors and see, you know, what they want to see as far as screening, what their concerns are, see if we can mitigate those. And the ones that we can't mitigate, we end up back in here. And yeah. I think it's it's more than just the the screening. It's the impact to that neighborhood as far as traffic. And here's it. I'm going to tell you, I, I'm gonna, I know one of your neighbors. It's almost directly across or maybe kind of kitty corner from there. She's going to push back on this. And because we we used to live together on Easy Street when we had a density, a rezone. And I will tell you that rezone, it's, it wasn't so much, right, the 
what they did. It was, it's the amount of traffic that it adds to that community, right? Or to that area. So you need to look beyond just the, the structures and what, what's the impact to that entire area regarding traffic and noise and light. And so I, um, you're, you are going to get some kickback yeah, on so, this. I'll so, tell you that. So my, yeah, then my question would be, and this is a subjective answer, I know, but how many is too much? Here? Right now I have 10. I'm applying for is four is six the magic number what is yeah the magic mean, number for that area I, I mean I won't vote for it at all because yeah. that's not what my constituents have asked me to do yeah. you know what I'm saying it's not a person you have thing I know you personally it's let me uh, let me let me give Mike the floor he's got his hand up for a second thank you yeah um I actually have uh a previous uh I have I think nine units uh two houses away from me um they are campers uh airstreams give or take um i can speak uh, i will go to bat for this one i can speak for that there is no traffic there is no light there is no sound there is no but that all comes back to what it was written into it and the upkeep of the area uh if the upkeep is there if the upkeep is written into it that it must be done by someone, be it Matt, be it the, another property owner. Uh, that is how I see that the difference is in my literal neighborhood right now. Um, the upkeep is impeccable. Uh, I cannot speak highly enough of it. And it houses nine. Uh, there's a few singles and there's a lot of couples in there and they it is workforce housing. I mean, there, there's nowhere you're gonna get this many houses that low of an impact, as long as upkeep and stipulations are put down in the in, initially, uh, you're not going to get that many houses per area. And that, that, I mean, it's a whole workforce that literally lives two houses away from me. And I don't hear a, I don't hear, see, I don't even know if they have cars, to be honest. Yeah. I've never seen a car on the street. I, I, I can't speak highly enough about the one out in the valley. I live at the top end of Arnold. Oh, okay. Well, out in the valley, you have to have a car to get to work. Well, so yeah, I will yeah. tell you streets out there are well, different. Well, I, I do That's live in the county place. and I live at the top end of Arnold Lane. You do have to have a car to get down here, but they, I mean, yeah, it Mary. is all about upkeep yeah. in my eyes. On right. That, right. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Mary? I, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, to answer your question, Matt, I, I, I mean, I don't know. And I think, it, you know, if we do allow this to go forward, then I think a lot of that would probably come out in the public comment period. I think then that, well, that's I, when people will I, be. I also think that's the beauty of part of this process with the intent to apply that there's not a large investment in an application where, right. you know, he submits for 10 and we're like, gosh, I really wish it was six. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, I guess the feedback is it looks like the commission's kind of split on this one. There's some. Warm support, some avid support, some it's never going to make it get my vote sort of thing, you know, so I don't know if there's creativity about, you know, moving them away from the edge of the property and centering them in the property and maybe going with less or. Um, uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I think that we're not at the phase to kind of like have that answer of like, well, 10's not going to get it, but eight will. I mean. Right. At least right. today on, a, on this one. That, that's but, a hard. That is definitely. Hard but I do see this one as more in the in the the kind of buffer zone, and so I think this is more of like the to the point of why is rural residential in there is because not every rural residential property meets the exact same characteristics, and I think being butt up the highway commercial and the storage unit, and you know only neighbors on two sides close to you know access to 191 i think some of those uh neighborhood impacts aren't as much as we could anticipate in some of these other applications so yeah man 40 does when i looked at the place 40 seemed like a lot to get in that oh oh no matt's was uh 10, 10. Oh, yeah, this is the, it it's, it's right Roberts on. Road. Yeah, this is, uh, okay. or it was 10 right now. Yeah, 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 it's 10. Oh, okay. That makes so here's the site then. Yeah, great. Yeah, so, so you can. would be my mark now. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> this, is, this is my own spreadsheet I made, and I must have copied it wrong. Right. Yeah. I made a spreadsheet to 
write down comments on and such. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what were the units you were imagining there? Uh, RVs. Yeah. So yeah. I'm imagining full hookups. Uh, some vans, right now I have two employees that live in the vans. So two of those spots would have this be van. Uh, my plan is to send 50 amp full sewer to every site um, just to have it. To build those if you're doing one, you might as well just keep going with it. Okay. And so, are you imagining this to be for your employees or would it just going to be open to the general public? I'd say 60% my employees and 40% uh, for general. At this time right now, we've got six open for each of us up right there. Yeah. Does anyone have any other questions for for Matt or um, any other comments on this particular one? I would say with time constraints that we should uh, move through the next couple one and it looks like the next one would be the uh, uh, 2890 Spanish Valley Drive uh, property. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. And I, I don't know the owner of this one. I'm not sure if this person is in the room. He's still here today. Okay. He might talk later for the agenda item. Um, but yeah, this is right off of Spanish, uh, right down the road from Spanish Trail Road. And I just wanted to make a note on this because we, this location has been um, identified uh, even back in 20, the 2012 future land use map, it was identified um, as a rural center. Um, and then in our future land use planning, so far, public input and the analysis done by SCJ Alliance when they did their future land use analysis identified the intersection between Spanish Trail Road and Spanish Valley as a future commercial node, mixed use neighborhood commercial. So it's kind of within that vicinity, something to make note of. Um, but I do understand also that it is surrounded by kind of less dense rural residential. And it looked like the in this particular one, it looks like the part that they wanted to develop was on the on, on that triangle. It's the the upper part of that triangle, right? The the kind of the northern yeah, right northwestern, right. yeah. Right there. Right. So I can show you the site. Preliminary site here. Yeah. So Spanish Trail Road is out in this direction. Yeah. Right. And then this is their primary residence. Yeah. Existing. And then were there were those residences to the north on the same side of the road as or were those like uh so there's a vacant lot okay um just to the north to the north mm -hmm. and then yeah to the south there is a residence there um there's also a large lot behind the property that has a residence so it's surrounded by some residences for sure and then there's that one vacant lot and across the street that's that's the street is open farm. fields right yeah okay anyone have a comment on this particular one this one i'm kind of on the fence with um it is kind of getting further from the highway commercial but it also is in that note that uh elise was just highlighting um so for me my tendency is to kind of like let them submit an application and kind of like with the feedback that it wasn't the solid green light that the first four got or there wasn't as much excitement but i'm I, my personal thing is i'm hesitant to just start kicking them out early in the process um and so even though i'm on the fence i would say Go ahead and submit an application, but and then let them decide if they want to, you know, invest in the application fees and the engineering costs or, or yeah. design plans or whatever. Yeah. Right. Oh, ownership on this one has uh, stated that they're putting in a road. They're willing to put that road in. Oh, the little the driveway. Yeah, the driveway. Yes, they would be putting that driveway in. Uh huh. Yeah. And I don't. No, if he specified if it's um, in the code, we require it to be gravel or mm -hmm. road base. Road base. But, yep. um, they have the option. And, and to that point, it looked like yeah, every one of the developers yeah were going to put in some sort of yeah road or driveway or yeah. access. Yeah, right, right. yeah. 
Have we heard from neighbors on any we of haven't, these I, specifically? There are, no, not, I mean, not yet because it's been just this intent to apply so far. Um, so we haven't gotten any public comment. Please. I spoke to my sister-in-law next door uh, about this project and just the location it's as far away from her as you could get. Uh, she didn't have a lot to say uh, for or against, uh, but my uh, family is neighbor. I think Trish is right. I think that there will be a lot of uh, comments to come from folks in the valley if if all these go through. Yeah, my sense is that a lot of neighbors probably don't know what's going on in the process right now, but once we put it to a public hearing, they will have more to say. Yeah. Should we move on to the next one then? Anyone, anyone else care to comment on this particular one? It's a tough one for me too, because yeah. the deer hang out there a lot. Uh -huh. That's always where they cross the road. Am I correct, Lonnie? That's always where they cross the road. <laughs> yeah. A little wildlife refuge. Yeah. Okay, Lonnie Campbell, this is a proposal for 16 sites. Yep. I didn't, I'd invite Lonnie to come forward since he's in the room if you care to, Lonnie. Hi. Hi. Um, all right. And I, again, like every, uh, every other one, I rode my bike out in the rain yesterday and checked this one out. <laughs> I, it looked like you had people renting in the house there and there's people renting next door. I actually wanted to, it looked like the, where you were going to develop is down a hill because yeah. I wanted to scope it out, but I didn't want to look like I was trespassing on anyone's property. So I didn't get a chance to really see. The majority of the property surrounding mine is owned by my dad. Okay. Who also has interest in putting in the second round of the APO. So that's the property just the south of yours, Lonnie, or both? Uh, that is all of this land. He's got 12 or 15 acres, right? Okay. Here. Yeah. He wanted me to be the guinea pig, though. Yeah. So I have talked to my neighbors. <laughs> right. So I would, and that brings up a, a different, another conversation that I wanted to bring up, and that is if we approve all of these right now, then there'd only be seven units left to approve. And this is a pilot program. We haven't approved it going forward next year. So this, we could be looking at, at this being basically it for. And with mine, if theoretically mine gets approved, my dad does decide to do it. That's why I was gonna ask the flexibility. Ideally, it made more sense to do a big U driveway through my property, crossed his and up out of one of his exits as well. Mm -hmm. Which would be a lot more cohesive for everyone. Mm -hmm. Not safer than straight. A lot safer, more emergency access. And I'm not dead set on the 60. I can fit 16 easily. Yeah. But because those are the larger spaces, mine are all 30 by 40 spaces, 1200 square feet. Yeah. And you're, and you're thinking again, like RV van type of dwellings? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm going to bring full connections to all of them. I actually have someone that's interested in helping me put. Park homes on them. Put what on? Park homes, 400 square foot mobile tiny homes, essentially. No. Nope. Or employee housing. I think that's a cleaner way to do it to ensure. I don't want a bunch of like random trailers or yeah. campers, vans, whatever. I want a clean total project. Mm -hmm. But I, I will have connection. I, it's a huge investment to do all 16 park homes right off the bat. Right. So my, my idea is to be phases yeah and rent them out to vans while you're yeah. working on getting the park home yeah. so you said you talked did you talk to eddie you said you talked to your neighbors i haven't talked to eddie okay because he's the big neighbor to the to, to the, the west. yeah to, to, to the, the west, west. Okay. Yeah. to the west sorry yeah, to the west. yeah right yeah. yeah which he's actually looking to develop the top layer i think but i believe he got shut down on doing that access you can't actually access the top of his property from murphy no he's from down the road. oh i got you oh from somewhere right okay and then all like i said that outside of that all the other property is yeah. yeah yeah right this one uh i like the the idea i like i hadn't heard that your father was thinking about 
doing a similar thing adjacent, which does kind of lessen some of the uh, impact to neighbor concerns for me. Um, that being said, though, this one is getting further from that those higher density areas. Um, Murphy Lane as a feeder road with like that the curve through there. Um, I think I start to be a little more sensitive towards those traffic impacts and stuff. Um, I mean, I guess it is kind of close to the roundabout in the other direction, but oh, so the roundabout and Murphy Lane's had some of your most recent high density projects put on it. The one down at the start of Murphy, the uh, Murphy Flats, you mean? Murphy Flats, yeah. and then what's the, there's another one right there at the straightaway that's getting started. Mm, yeah, I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah. Did I, did I read in the packet? I, I thought I read that uh, there would have to be a traffic impact study in Murphy for this one. Potentially. Okay. Depending on what, what Bill Jackson decides, but that would be definitely up to him to determine the need for that. But that is uh, one of the, the checkoff boxes, right? It would be in, in, in the yeah, packet. Yeah, but it's one of the... Uh, if, if uh, in order for them to build, there would have to, they would have the engineers and the road department would have to check off that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, but it's kind of our job at this phase to evaluate the, the appropriateness not aesthetically, what's what's the milieu of the neighborhood right. and like preserving those kind of characteristics. And so the other ones that, you know, came up before that abutted highway commercial or were close to a node that we've identified for future commercial development, like those in my mind seem like it's not as, uh, a variance to what's in place mm -hmm. as some of these that are getting further um, down some of the side roads or away from those those high traffic areas. So one other thing I just make a point of considering a lot of the people that will be occupying these spaces will ride their bikes in the town yeah. right there in the valley. Mm -hmm. You're rather riding on the highway or on the Well, that's real. Murphy. I ride a Murphy all the time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's very lightly trafficked to this point in my it's fun one direction. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> to get to work, good time. To get home from work, not a good time. I was yeah. Um yeah. Any other questions for Lonnie or, or comments on this one? Um Right. Yeah. 16 seems like a lot, but from when I looked at it, you know, it, it, it didn't seem that large, but. It's hard to tell from up top how far back yeah, it goes. Go back. It was really, yeah. Find my house and see the actions. It's a big lot. Oh, okay. Yeah. But what you could see from the road. Tim. You can't see the property from the road all the way. Right. It does kind of drop down gradually off the hill. Yeah, definitely. How many, what's, what's the, um, I know it says it doesn't what's your total acreage line? 2.5 okay. is what we get surveyed at. Mm -hmm. It appears, these guys actually found it, that there's a discrepancy yeah. on the county map. That happens. Yeah. So that needs resolved also. We already talked about that, right? Okay. But Lucas came out, found the corners and points, and put it to 2.05. 2.05. Mm -hmm. yeah, right oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. So two acres, basically. I would trust. Yeah. This is surveying north and the county parcel map right now, just because there's there needs to be an updating. Yeah. So yeah, it's a big, it's a big lot. Okay. Okay. Any should we get into discussion on these as a whole, or any further questions for Ilani on this particular one? I'd look for direction on on which way to go with these. Really that kind of yeah. Go ahead, Bill. I would think we're going to have to go through and vote on them one by one. As I mean, there's I definitely some right. negative, some medium, yeah. some in between here. Is that mm -hmm. not the case? Yeah. yeah we it, could vote on the four that we all agree. It seems like everybody 
he likes that's, or why. That's, well, I think we'll we can um, we can address that at the action item is when we'll have to approve him. I think we've agreed that the first four that we discussed that are along the highway more or less, as well as the swamp, are are good to go. I think, and then I think discussing the the next four now and and trying to get clear on each of these would probably be the the, the step to go. So one thing I one thing I consider, like I said earlier, is that the four that we we've kind of greenlighted so far are a total of 110 out of the 150 lots. Um, we have two more intent to apply sessions. So I would ask you all, uh, do we want to? you know, approve everything in, in the first shot. Do you, I, I don't even know if we were expecting other applicants to come forward. Maybe people didn't get their, their, um, there, there are, I know it's not public comment time, but there are definitely things. Mm -hmm. We'll check more of your boxes. Um, but in a fairly short time for the public and business owner, Right. Uh, that was that was a bit of my thinking and that putting all our eggs in, in the basket on the first shot. And especially since we're not sure it, this being a pilot program, we're not sure that we will. You know, this this could be the only chance at, at these. So just to I think no, that's an important point. flip side of that is we could also raise the ceiling. Right. Right. You're right. We absolutely. That, yeah. So yeah. And we could continue it for another year. That's that's also definitely on the table. Just thought of actually is would it be okay for those that maybe weren't given the green light to go forward to, um, reapply? to reapply for the intent to I I absolutely think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so for sure. So and then we can, you know, we can do a round and then compare it at the next when when is the next uh oh, the date is uh May 5th, right? Or the NTA is May 5th. So in, yeah. Right, so we'd be looking at the second meeting in May for doing the same process as this with the next with the next round, right? Yeah. So I just I'm going to just reiterate a couple thoughts. You know, this was a very hard process when it went through the planning and the county commission, and you know, with embedded within it, we really talk about is it compatible with the existing community character, and secondly, you know, is there historic use of that on those lands and. And so I really want people to think deeply. It's, it's you know, it's the character of those communities. Are you going, going to alter the character of those communities? Um, and it does change communities. You know, yeah. when we change right. density, it, it changes communities to the point that it's, it's irreversible. So I want you to think very seriously about that. And the reality is the applicants know that going in, you know. They, they know the ordinance, they know the specifics of it. And so, you know, that's, yeah. Right. My, my tendency, I'm, I'm totally on the fence about this. I haven't, absolutely haven't made my mind up, but my tendency is to look at these four lots kind of as a whole. And, and my thinking is to potentially Prove the lot of them or or not, and uh, and if not, then we we would have approved 110 lots already, which is about two a little more than two thirds of the total properties, and then we'd be potentially able to approve another 40 at one of the following. Okay. Remind me, I remember this discussion came up, but um, in terms of those numbers in that count, mm -hmm. are we counting? the contractor's roost that's already yeah. in existence. It's just- Just the ones that he, that Dan- So just the new ones. And then uh -huh. the just, just, the, just the ones that he's applying for at, at this time. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, if we're gonna do them in a big lot, I would, I would like to see the ones that are, that are adjacent to highway commercial to be uh, invited to apply okay. as well. Yeah, and we don't have to do it in a big lot. That's okay. that's just my yeah. kind of thinking. Um, so it seems like one, four, six, and eight are all pretty much yet. Yeah. Forward. And I do think, speaking to Bill's concern about, I don't know exactly how to say it, but just being kind of hodgepodgey. I think if we stick to 
these were highway commercial or historic use, I think you're going to be less susceptible to criticism. Yeah. And that's to that point is, is, uh, why I kind of suffer with the, the Murphy lane and the red cliffs more seems a little spottier, um, kind of on the fence about the, the Spanish Valley one, because it's like we've identified this node, but it's not in place yet. Um, I really don't think the storage unit's going to care if there's some RVs behind them. How close is the one on Spanish Valley to the, uh, the RV park? That's I think it's called the OK. No, it's, not. Oh, it's, it's not yeah it's that's that's far that's far down far. Oh, basically yeah. behind Ostog, right yeah. mine's fairly close to an rv park though and a campground <clears throat> just just below me there's pat creek campground and rv park just below yeah just down murphy yeah. lane you're talking about right yeah. yeah so that's just i'm still sitting i'm still sitting here yeah <laughs> sure <laughs> There's been a pretty big precedence for high density on Murphy Lane. So a traffic study, I think, would be an interesting outcome because there's new development being built there and there's existing development of high density exact usage, basically. So there's OK RV right down here. Um, and then if you just travel up. Oh, it's so quite it's, a way. Yeah. 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 Okay. I was just trying yeah, to visualize it. Thank you. On the back. So, because that would have made a difference. Go ahead, Mike. In this intent, uh, this is an in, in, intent to apply. Right. Uh, wouldn't we want to hear from neighbors and everything in the application process? You, you'd have to do that during the public hearing. Yeah. But we, we would have to vote yes on these for, yeah, the, to the, hear about them. The, the, the thing meeting. is, to Bill's point, it's, it's a fair amount of investment to put together a permit application so if at this point we know that there's not a lot of support for it it's going to save Same the developer there. a lot of headaches well, so, so we're trying to I, this is I our very much agree and middle. i'm speaking about lonnie's lot specifically yeah. here uh I, of course i want to hear from the, i can't remember the name of the neighbor that you you, you spoke with or you spoke about that he hasn't spoke uh, spoken with yet Lonnie. but we know the other one like we know the answer from the other neighbor there's i mean on some, there's 10 neighbors. I understand that, or more. There's two on his. It's not hard to figure out that process. I mean, yeah. a little more quick clarification from uh, one neighbor on that to be like, that neighbor does care. That neighbor doesn't care. Uh, that would, I mean, quick clarification with no financial, uh, financial need, but just shutting down the intent, intent to apply uh, on on the non-knowledge of one neighbor. It, it looked like you might have some signal. Right. So are we trying to prevent a developer from making that investment? Saving the money. Well, what if we laid that up to them? I mean, I wouldn't have any desire for you to make a decision on whether I lose money or gain money. I mean, that I believe by letting them move forward, if they choose to, if it comes to a public process, I mean, really, what is our intent here? It's if if a developer wants to invest money, it's not our responsibility to no and in watch my, his bank account. In my speaking, that's almost exactly what I mean. Lonnie can go ask that one neighbor. <clears throat> I, we can get a public comment from him specifically if there's yeah, a problem. Comes down to public comment, or the neighbor's <laughs> feeling is I'm going to shut a project down. Before because you have one neighbor signal. Yeah, because okay, this, I... this isn't a use by right thing. And it's not just like who shares the fence line with you. Right. It's kind of like the feeling of the area. Right. And and with Murphy, I, I know the, 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 there's a potential pending traffic study, but it's not just like, oh, am I going to have to look at RVs when I'm drinking coffee in the morning? But it's the impacts to the traffic, the noise, it just losing this yep. rural feel that Trish has been defending uh, so staunch. Yes, right. Uh, yeah, I, to address uh, Bill's uh, concern that 
I think it's more of a concern that we we may to get this passed because we thought it was so important to get it passed because we have such a dire need for housing, you know. But at the same time, there was incredible concern. I mean, two two to you know, I would we got more people writing concerned about what we were not wanting us to even do it. They wanted us not to even do it. And we pretty, you know, one of the things we said was we would be very conscious of rural residential. Also, that was the one thing we were very clear that we would be very careful with rural residential. And, you know, so I think a lot of it is yeah. keeping our word then. Aren't the other lots rural residential as well? Yeah, yeah. well, not not all. Yeah, but there's there's highway so commercial, two highway, two highway yes, 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 commercial yes. and yeah. small lot residential. Yeah, and then the other one was NAVTEC. The so NAVTEC is rural residential, but it's also kind of a unique position because it is by definition, it's rural. by definition, it's rural residential mm -hmm. for sure. It is yes. That's, yeah. uh, all the, uh, the Which other lots three, of different the other three were not were either small lot or commercial. Right. Yeah. And even Navtech abuts a different zone. It's a city zone. I don't know. Forget what they call it, but right. Well, and and to me, Navtech has a historic use, and so it it's just a little different. The 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 thing about the when they abut it is it's it's kind of like. It's ideal when the zoning map kind of looks like a bullseye and it kind of changes from, you know, one zone to another to another. And then when we start like throwing these little islands of different zoning, that's when you get like the spot zoning. And so to me, that's that potential for creating spot zoning is what concerns me more when they don't abut. So I don't know. I don't know if we want to save it for the meeting or yeah we're getting into we yeah want. i'd like to recess for at least five minutes before the regular meeting yeah, comes on we we, <laughs> yeah we, we, we can't take this again we can't take action in the workshop we can't take action in the workshop so we'd have to take the action in the regular meeting so we can we can uh finish our conversation in the meeting and take out and we'll yeah we should take action there as well yeah okay yeah okay. yeah Thanks, Lonnie. It was a useful use of time, though. Yeah, very, very much. Like it really I'm glad helped. we were doing this in the regular meeting. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. That'll be here all night. Okay, then I uh, I will can I'll adjourn the workshop and we'll take a quick recess and we will um, commence with our regular commission meeting at four o'clock.
Uh, Mallory on Zoom, sound check. Can you hear us? Mallory. I, I can hear you. Great. All right. Thank you. How snowy is it there? <laughs> No snow yet, but um, I think they're maybe even getting ready to call some early school closures ahead of tomorrow. So we'll All see. Right. <laughs> okay, are we are we good? Quinn? Okay, okay. I will. Uh, I'll now call to order the regular Thompson Springs Special Service Fire District meeting, January seventeenth, twenty twenty three. Uh, present are commissioners. Uh, Clapper, Winfield, Hedin, McCurdy, McGann, and myself, uh, Hadler. We also have um, County Administrator Mallory Nassau on Zoom. We have uh, Associate Administrator Quinn Hall. It, we have our Strategic Development Director, Chris Baird, um, County Attorney Stephen Stocks, County Clerk Gabe Wojtek. Um, at this point, I will call for citizens to be heard, and this is citizens to be heard for Thompson. So if you have something you'd like to speak to uh, regarding the Thompson Springs Special Service Fire District, please uh, come forward and make yourself heard. Doesn't look like we have anyone in the chambers, anyone online who would care to be heard on Thompson. There is one in the chamber. Right, yeah. Okay. Ah, okay, Sina. No, you got it. The water, the yeah. water district. Um, this is the, so. This is fire district. They they actually are separate. And the the water district one. If you wanted to make a comment, you I mean, obviously, you come to the water district meetings. You can make a comment there, or you could just make a comment before the commission for with the regular citizens to be heard. You might want to comment at, at the next one. Great, thank you, Santa. Um, okay, so we will start the meeting off. We need uh, nominations and appointments of the Thompson Springs Special Service Fire District uh, President and Secretary for the 2023 year. Evan, I'm, I'd be happy to be Secretary. Oh, great. I would love to nominate Jacques to be, uh, are you up for it? I'm up for it. And this Jacques is to be president yeah. and Barry to be secretary. And that's, uh, that tends to be par for the course for Thompson is that the commissioners handle these things. And it's easy if the uh, sitting chair is the president. Um, okay. Uh, nomination on the table. Do I have a second? I'll second that. All right. Um, motion by Commissioner Clapper, second by Commissioner Hedin. Any discussion on these? It's been an honor to serve as secretary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, I will call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. And the motion passes six to nothing. So I will be the uh, Thompson uh, president and Mary will be the Thompson secretary for 2023. Um, sorry, I and actually citizen speakers after that. Uh, approval of meeting minutes. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the meetings from the December 20th meeting. Mary? I move to approve the meet minutes from uh, December 20th, 2022, Thompson Springs Special Fire District. Thank you. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, I have a motion by Commissioner Regan and second by Commissioner Hedin. Uh, any discussion on the minutes from Thompson? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of approval of minutes, raise your hand. And that passes six to nothing. Um, ratification of payment of bills. Um, the I would uh, entertain a motion to approve total bills in the amount of $9,334.38, total payroll in the amount of $823.44 for total bills and payroll in the amount of $10,157.82. So moved. Thank you, Mary. I'll second that. Thanks, Mike. I have a motion by Commissioner McGann, a second by Commissioner McCurdy. Uh, discussion on bills? All in favor of the motion, raise your hand, and that passes unanimously. Uh, next up, we have the fire chief report, and Chief Markham is with us on Zoom, so I'll turn it over to, to Mark. Uh, greetings from snowy Thompson Springs. The roads are getting pretty bad out here, so it could be an interesting night. Um, yeah. As of the uh, as of as of the time I submitted this report, I didn't have any incidents um, to talk about. But since then, on January fifteenth, we had a rollover on I seventy at mile marker one ninety six, and on January sixteenth, there was a medical call out at a Crescent Junction. 
In March, I'm scheduled to take our big engine, engine 41, up to Midvale to the manufacturer up there to get a full major service and pump test. Um, the pump test is required, so he'll be out of service for a couple of days, but I'll, I'll have a backup lined up for that for maybe a week. As far as training goes, on last Friday, January 13th, I uh, did my ha hazardous materials technician recertification with members of the Moab Valley Fire Department, so that's good for another two years. And then uh, January 19th through 22nd, I'll be attending the Winter Fire School down in St. George, which is a big annual gathering of firefighters and some really good training. They get uh, instructors and trainers from all over the all over the West, actually all over America. So it's, it's a really good training opportunity for smaller departments to, to really get some great hands-on training. And then the last thing would be I did uh, submit an application for the 2023 Utah State Fire Marshals license plate grant. Um, for the maximum amount, which is $5,000. And we were able to get that last year. And that really helped as far as uh, getting some, some personal protective equipment, um, extrication equipment, and uh, some lighting, some scene lighting. So that stuff's coming really handy. It's a great grant. And hopefully we can get it again this year. And that's all I have. All right. Thank you, Mark. And good luck with the, um, yeah, good luck with the endeavor. Um, anybody have a question for Mark or comment? Looks like none. Thank you so much, Mark, and keep up the good work up there. Hope you have an uneventful night. Yeah, thank you. You guys be safe. All right, thanks. Um, that looks like it concludes our business for the Thompson Springs Special Service Fire District. So I will adjourn that meeting and I will call to order the regular uh, January 17th Grand County Commission meeting. Um, all present are the same from the Thompson meeting, and uh, I would call you to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. And I would open citizens to be heard. Anyone in the chamber who would like to come forward and be heard may do so at this time. And Sina, I'd invite you to come up. Yep, you can. I have a um, cafe in the Springs, and uh, I bought it from a. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Let me uh, just say that the uh, the comment period would be three minutes. Right. Just wanted to, yeah. Uh, I bought the ca cafe in 2001. And uh, the water was turned off as a courtesy water turn off because the uh, person who owned it died. And it was, he died in November. So to protect the, the lines, they did a courtesy. Uh, in Thompson Springs, you have to, the owner has to sign to turn it off or to turn it on. So that was not done. His brother owned, um, went through the court system. He's from Pennsylvania, so he went through the court system to uh, get access to his estate because he was the only living relative brother on the property. Um, he lived in Pennsylvania, so it took a couple of years to finally got a court order saying that he now would, could you just forgive him on the property. Um, so I talked to Mark Stilson uh, two minutes ago and told him that I'm having some problems trying to get the water turned back on. Uh, one of the requirements is it has to be under the same name and it, it still is Silver Pearl, so it's still under the same name. Um, as, so that qualifies it to be turned back up. He said, yes, there's plenty of water in Thompson Springs. There's about 4,000 gallons that um, leave the springs every day. Thompson Springs only uses 1,000 gallons a day. So there's 3,000 gallons approximately that they don't every day because they have no use for it. So they're, um, to have a moratorium on um, allowing people that <clears throat> have had service and have had businesses uh, is a little bit crazy to stifle that uh, development and or rehabilitate uh, a business, that, business that's already been in uh, service or has been there. So I'm requesting that, you know, you give me support on trying to move forward and getting that water uh, turned back on uh, so I can finish the, um, the, the things that need to be done interior to 
to open up business in Tucson Springs. Basically, what it is. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Santa. Thank you. Um, I got one of the questions, one of the things that uh, he had a concern about was another owner that wanted to put a structure on the building. Well, the property that he was that they were talking about hadn't been had been removed in the, between the sixties and the seventies, so it wouldn't even qualify. Mm -hmm. It was a gas station, and the person requesting it doesn't own that property anyway. Yeah. So there you go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anyone else in the chambers who'd like to come forward and be heard? Yes, sir. Yep, come forward. Please state your name, and then you'll have uh, three minutes. Uh, to speak. I've got Nicole, and I'm just going to advocate. If if you could actually sit down, it's, it's due to there's this. Oh, you can, or you can use the microphone at the podium right there. Yeah. Is it on? Okay. You choose, sit or stand, but pick a mic. Yeah. You're on YouTube. Don't forget. Uh, my name's Doug Nichols. Uh, I am a resident of Grand County. Um, but I'm mostly advocating for some property owners and business owners to keep the ADO, some of those sites, uh, the 150 sites available for future um, people to apply for. <clears throat> um, I'm advocating for six, I know two different um, property owners, business owners that are on the highway uh, corridor, and, you know, it's a highway commercial zoning. We want to apply for sites. They, they ask both basically don't need to uh, put in any extra services. It won't affect the roads or the, the character of the neighborhood. And so um, I would advocate to leave half or at least, you know, 33% of those 150 sites open or to continue, you know, to, to add more. Because I know a lot of, a lot of business owners who just want to do housing for the employees who just haven't had time to kind of catch up and and apply yet. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else in the uh, chambers who'd like to come forward and uh, make yourself heard? Is there anybody on Zoom? If you're on Zoom, you can unmike or raise your hand. It looks like we have Mark. Go ahead, Mark. Mark Horowitz. I can't unmic. I can only unmark. Uh, we are. I know it's not a time for a back and forth, but we kind of have one simple question of the of the nearly 150. Um, you know, seems like mostly RV sites, 80, whatever overlay they are. Um, of the nearly 150, is there is there like a price point planned on that? Because RV sites seem to go for like 800 bucks. Six fifty, eight hundred dollars. We're wondering, is there is there a workforce price point implied by by this bonus opportunity? Um, I, I hope my, one of my representatives would ask that when the time comes when the discussion happens uh, this evening. Um, generally, we think it's a lousy idea, but good luck to us all. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, anybody else on Zoom who is here to be heard, citizens to be heard on Zoom? I'll do a last call in the chambers. Anyone else want to come forward? All right. Um, we will have another citizens to be heard opportunity at six o'clock. Uh, we'll move on to presentations. Our first presentation of the day is on the uh, Upper Colorado River Basin System Conservation Pilot Program. Uh, we have Lily Bosworth of the Colorado River Authority, and I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Let me just take a moment to share my screen on this Zoom. Do you mind if I say something real quick? Yes, please, Trish. So we've just been trying to, in the last year or so, have Mark Stilson come from Department of Natural Resources um, just to talk about our water resources, start to give an overview, just community education. And so he's been excellent about always coming down to speak to us. And, and so it's great to have the Colorado River Authority here. Um, I think any education that we can get about our resources, both groundwater and surface water resources, helps a lot. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And Mark, if you're in, if if you had were part of this presentation or wanted, okay, <laughs> <laughs> got it. Sorry, I'm having a hard time just getting my PowerPoint up there. Thank you. 
going to full screen. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> If you just did the slideshow from the beginning, so see across go through an animation, so go next to it to slideshow. Okay. Yep. And then if you click on that, responding. Oh, it's not responding. Let me try one more time. It's timing mark. Try this. <laughs> we've we've got it in the packet if one of these guys wants to share their oh, yeah. yeah it's a great idea um, it's okay You just have to tell her when to move it. Okay. So yeah, my name is Lily Bosworth. I am a staff engineer with the Colorado River Authority of Utah. And just to give a little brief introduction to the River Authority, we were created in 2021 by the state legislature to manage all things Colorado River. As we know, the river is in crisis kind of across the whole basin, you know, the four upper basin states, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Wyoming, who form the Upper Colorado River Commission, and then the three lower basin states, California, Arizona, and Nevada. And so Utah is part of that upper four states, and we form the Upper Colorado River Commission. And so the system conservation pilot program is one part of a five point plan put forth by the Upper Colorado River Commission. And so all four states are participating to try and, and generate some conservation for the well-being of the river to shore up Lake Powell and to ensure that we meet our compact obligations for the 1922 Colorado River Compact. Um, here I have a QR code and a link to our website about the program so that folks can, can visit that if needed. And we'll go to the next slide. Just briefly an outline of what I'm going to cover today. I want to review the current hydrology. As a reminder, we can see it's snowing outside, uh, but kind of where we stand in context of some of our other hydrologic years, what this program is and is not, our funding and administration structure, our proposal process, and where we stand for the program. Next slide. So a little bit of the hydrologic context. This is a graph where on the bottom X axis is a water year. On the vertical Y axis is a snow water equivalent. And this is snow water equivalent for the upper Colorado River Basin, so all four upper basin states. And so the dotted line that you can see is the median snow water equivalent for the last 30 years. The dark blue that goes up really high is 2011. So that was one of our best water years in the last 30 years. The pink that's down below is 2002. And <laughs> to, um, that was a low water year. And then the purple that's kind of in the middle was last year, the 2022 water year. And this year, I updated that yesterday. The black line shows where we compare to last year. Um, last year we had a good start and then we flattened out in January in the upper basin. So our goal of this program is that on a good year or even a median year, we can save some water for our lower years. Next slide, please. So a little bit about our program. This is an opportunity for temporary, voluntary, and compensated consumptive water use reduction in the Colorado River Basin. So we're really looking at that depleted water in the system that would otherwise evaporate away into the air. And we're hoping to conserve that and keep it either on the surface or in the groundwater table. This is open to industrial, municipal, and agricultural water users. And it's, it's funded by the federal government. Thank you. Now we'll go to what the program is about. <laughs> 
Um, importantly, this is not a buy and dry program. It is temporary and it's totally voluntary and compensated. And so we just want this to be another option for any water users to have in their toolbox, um, especially in agriculture. It's nice to have an option to forgo water use for a year, but still get some compensation. What do you mean by buy and dry? I haven't heard that term. Mm, so, so buy and dry is, is a common term in the ag community for buying up a whole, whole water right or a whole piece of land. <laughs> and just following it permanently. So the water is no longer used, but we also lose that economic. Right. This is not a demand management program. And what we mean by demand management is a program where we can shepherd, conserve water from point to point. And so that would involve a water right change application and a lot of infrastructure and administration to actually shepherd the conserved water. And so for 2023, we're not looking at that long term. The authority is hoping to move towards a demand management program so we can get credit in the upper basin for our conservation. But this year, too many moving parts to do that in time for the growing season effectively. Next slide, please. So a little bit on water rights that's really important to most water users. So I wanted to touch on it. Under Utah Code 73, many subsections down. Forfeiture and abandonment do not apply to a water right if it participates in a federal following program or a state approved following program. And so this program does fit under that. And we'll go to the next slide and I'll talk about where it fits in within our federal administration and funding. So this is a lot to look at right away. We'll start just at the top left and look at the green arrows for where this program is funded. So this came from the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. $4 billion were allocated to Bureau of Reclamation. And then Bureau of Reclamation has allocated $125 million to the Upper Colorado River Commission. So that will be distributed between the four upper basin states. Starting in the bottom left corner then with the, the dark red arrows for the administration piece, as opposed to the funding, we had to get the program reauthorized at the federal level, and that happened in the 2023 Omnibus Appropriations Bill right at the end of December, which is why we're just ta talking about this now in, in mid-January. And then the Upper Colorado River Commission Board had to reauthorize the program. And so now we're at the point where we're, we're looking kind of at the, the bottom right and then the center of this slide where we're starting to engage water users. So water users have the option to use an agent, to support them through the application process if they choose to submit a proposal or they can submit a proposal as an individual. So they'll propose to the Colorado River Authority of Utah as the state entity kind of representing the Upper Colorado River Commission here. And then we'll review proposals. We'll hopefully make selections of, of those proposals and then contract and conserve water through the 2023 growing season. Next slide, please. So I just want to highlight kind of where we are in this process. Those things that are, are highlighted red show what is kind of the, the stages we're in now and who we're engaging with. Next slide. So a little bit about the proposal process. Um, in, in this slide format, it's a lot to look at all at once. But to start, just again, noting that folks can use an agent if they choose to. NGOs have been really great agents in the past for some water users. And so if folks are open to that, we encourage it. The next step is just assessing land and water use. So here for this program, it's really important to note that water rights must have been historically, beneficially, and consumptively used. And so if a water right hasn't been in use, it doesn't apply to this program. We really want to keep water that would have otherwise basically been evaporated on the ground. And then one new thing about this program is we're implementing EE metric, which is a remote sensed data set to measure evaporation and transpiration from typically agricultural fields. And so that's happening at the Upper Colorado River Commission upper basin scale. And so that's a, that's a new piece and we are assisting water users with that measurement technique, but it makes it so that it can be the same across the basin as opposed to whatever metering we use. Do you mind if I ask you a question on this slide really quick? Yeah, I noticed it's 150 per acre foot, um, and that's a floor price. Price. I know we discussed this in the conservation district the other day. Yeah. So can you just elaborate on that just a, a little bit more? Yeah, I was just about to go there. Okay, sorry, okay. sorry. <laughs> You're good. 
So, so we have a floor price of $150 an acre foot. That was based on the last round of this program that finished in 2018. That was our median price. So that's the minimum a water user can receive. If they believe that their acre foot value is higher than that, then they can justify a higher price in their proposal and we'll absolutely consider it. We just want to understand why. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so definitely, definitely have that option. And then one other important component of this is just the verification piece once once people are actually implementing a contract. And so we'll we'll combine on the ground inspection with that EE metric or satellite remote sense data set to verify that the water is being conserved. And so that'll happen both with the Upper Colorado River Commission and the authority. A little bit on the program status, we re we released a request for proposals mid December. The authority has held three information sessions since then. One was virtual on January 6th. We had 41 attendees. We held one in Price in person. We had 13 attendees. We had one in Roosevelt in person on the 12th. Uh, 15 attended. So now we're kind of in that in-between phase where we're still doing some outreach, but really just looking for proposals. And proposals are very importantly due on February 1st. So that is a quick draw at this wow. point. Um, so really, hopefully, people that are intending to apply know and are, are developing their proposal. And then our goal is through February and by early March, we'll have contracts signed and so people can implement their contract once the growing season begins. I do know that, like I said, conservation districts were disseminating the information, at least to my knowledge, so that's, that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. And that's, that's what I have. Uh, no problem. Thank you. Evan? Are gov <coughs> government agencies like special service districts eligible? Yes. Yeah. Once again, I have I have our our website. It's the same as the QR code if anyone wants to see what this is. Okay, great. No further questions for Lily? No, we really appreciate you. Yeah, that. thank you so much for making the time. Thank you for yeah. that. <laughs> and if you're traveling after the meeting, be safe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm staying. Good. Okay. Good. Thanks, good. Mark. Yeah. Thanks. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mark. Mark. Yeah. Always good to see you. Um, all right. Our next uh, presentation is presentation on the integrated public alert system, the IPAWS, uh, and alert sense. And we have Cora Phillips, who is our new emergency manager. Welcome, Cora. Thank you. And I'm just gonna get hooked up here real quick. We are throwing you right to the wolves. She seems okay. <laughs> yeah. As we're waiting for Cora, I could give a little update on our on our precip, and that just correlates to perfect. Yeah, so Josh. this comes from Grand Water and Sewer, but we didn't have a meeting. But I did get the snow and precip report. So year to date, thirteen or sorry, this is two thousand and twenty two. So the inches of rain was a little over 13, 13 and the average is eight point eight. Great. So That's last great. year was a banner year. Um, as far as soil moisture uh, at 9,500 feet in the LaSalle's, 44%, but that's the same as last year. And then the lake is just awesome, and it's yeah. been awesome all year. So right now we have 1,674 acre feet, and at this time last year it was 927. Wow. wow. So and two good years moisture. ago it was almost dry. If I, I know. Right. I know. So. You can axe that off my report. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> A little preview. 
Can you hear me okay with my screen here? Yes, thank you, Cora. So my name is Cora Phillips. Oh, sorry. Wait, 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 this one? Yes. Yeah, All right. Now we're good to go. All right. So my name is Cora Phillips. I'm the emergency management director. I was um, entered the position November 28th of 2022 and have hit the ground running since then. Um, I'm joined by Whitney Coonrod, who's on our call. She's our community support liaison. She's absolutely wonderful, and I'm thrilled to have her supporting us here in Green County. And of course, well, sure, Wiggins was here, but he might join. Okay. Um, so overall, my goals moving forward, obviously, protect lives, protect property and infrastructure, how we're going to do that, increase communication, interoperability, and community preparedness. Um, going to do that through training efforts, uh, national incident management system, uh, training for deputies. Uh, we recently updated our policy to reflect uh, the, those training needs. Those are uh, courses with FEMA 100, 200, 700, 800, and then also for command staff. Uh, we're also uh, training our command staff and those that would be incident command positions, the IS 247, as Jacques referred to, the IPALS, the Integrated Alert mm -hmm. Warning System course, to initiate alerts through our dispatch. Uh, and then uh, with those courses that I mentioned, looking at getting upper level courses here, IS 300, 400, and others, so that we can really create interoperability, not only within the Sheriff's Department, but with um, City PD, the National Park Service, and other organizations. Key stakeholders during emergencies. Uh, we're also updating our plans, as you might have seen our action item. Uh, our hazard mitigation plan, our emergency operation plan, emergency action plans, and working with area stakeholders, uh, such as the airport, to ensure those uh, memorandums of understanding or those MOUs are up to date and we're all in agreement. Um, community outreach and education, this is very important to me, um, looking at different opportunities for that, and I'll go into it a little bit later. Uh, we're also evaluating opportunities to improve overall community preparedness, especially like as we're looking at updating our hazard mitigation. So um, our alert sense public interface um, and how we work with the integrated public alert warning system that is our national system. Um, if you would like to take a moment now, um, January is alert notification month as we look towards preparedness. Um, you can scan the QR code or you can also go to grandcountyalerts.org or um, if you have Apple Android device, you can get onto your phone through Google Play or the Apple Store and download the My Alerts app, put in your zip code and have those alerts on your phone. Um, you can go into the settings at different locations. It's a really great system. Um, and you can also select different alerts that you would like to receive. Our upcoming events moving forward, uh, there's a Utah Traffic and Persons Conference that's free and open to the public. It's occurring January 26th. It's a collaborative human anti-trafficking effort, so I encourage anyone to join in. Uh, we also have a Region 7 Watershed Planning Meeting scheduled for January 30th. It's just among stakeholders. The Pipeline Emergency Response and Training, that's occurring February 1st, John, yeah. as the uh, LAPC uh, chair representing the commission. Right. <laughs> and we have a collaborative event with USGS Supervisory Hydrologist Chris Wachowski. He will be presenting at the Grant County Library on February 15th from 6 to 8 p.m. on the water monitoring data that's available, and then also how to obtain data from the stream gauges kind of like how that's all integrated into our alert system and um, how to add the water alerts at one phone. And it goes into our action items, which are the first thing. Yes, yeah. yeah. Any questions with what I presented or clarification? Any questions for Cora? Have you played with the alert system? 
personally. Could, what do you mean by play? Uh, trained, uh, gotten familiar with. Have you issued any alerts through it yet? I have not uh, issued any alerts through the system yet. However, I do have the login information and I do have the training necessary to initiate an alert, yes. I was curious about the functionality of it and how well it's working in the user interfaces. Um, it's tested on a monthly basis and we're looking at the opportunity the, uh, doing a live test so it would just be a matter of scheduling a date and initiating that test alert. Um, on a national presidential level, they do it but just about every three years. The iPod system, not necessarily. That's the program that we use to integrate the system. I'm wondering with, with the information on the USGS monit um, stream monitors, yes. is that can we make that ready, readily available to citizens? Does that make sense? So, like, can we do a yes. QR so, code um, so that? So I know people have been using it. Like, I know one individual that was on Pack Creek and he got his alert, was able to yes. move his livestock in time. So I think that the more readily available we can make that right, citizens, and that's the better. The effort with Chris at cool. that library Great. event. Okay. Um, how to access the National Water Dashboard right. and also downloading that water alerts app on your phone. Okay. And setting it up. Okay. Which stream gauges you want alerts for? Right. Uh, cubic feet per second. Okay. Um, but can time. we can we integrate it into our website too? Does that make oh, sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, that'd be uh, cool. Jesse just created the flyer for the event, so okay. I can get that out. That'd be awesome. It's it's very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. In the works. Great. Great. All right, if there's no further question or comment for Cora, then we will, uh, you, you are the first two uh, action items on our agenda, Cora. So um, we'll probably be revisiting you in half an hour or so. <laughs> yeah, thanks. All right, our next presentation is a financial update and we have Chris Baird, our strategic development director. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Jacques. Cora, could you um, unshare your screen for me, please? Yeah, yeah. Just to preface, this is going to be an update on all of the various sales tax revenues we've got. <clears throat> we currently got um, revenue through October. So our sales tax, um, as it comes and hits our bank, is about two months behind, generally speaking. So we've got most of the year, but not all of the year yet. Let me pull up our graphs here. These might be easy. Uh, Little small, but hopefully we can uh, interpret them well enough. Might be able to zoom in a little bit and just scroll around. So first off, to explain uh, what we're looking at, the the orange lines are actual collections. Um, the both the blue lines and the blue bars are uh, average growth trend projections, and so. This box up here in the top right corner is total annual collections. And in this particular instance for the transient room tax from 2012 through 2021. And you can see that we had a fairly gradual growth rate um, from 2012 through 2019. Uh, then COVID hit, had a way low year for 2020 and then an unusually high year in 2021. So the blue lines that we're looking at over in these graphs are basically trend projections. So if you were to draw a straight line across the tops of all of these bars and then project it out, keep going, projecting it out, you know, that's essentially what these blue lines on the left are doing. Um, I'm mostly gonna concentrate on covering uh, 2022 here. So for 2022, um, Generally speaking, we're uh, above average uh, in terms of relative to ourselves and our prior growth rate, we're actually about 12.58% above average growth. So that's very strong. And uh, looking to be about two to 3% under 2021 for transient room tax collections. But um, if you compare it with uh, long-term growth projections, you know, as if these bars were to continue to grow as if COVID never happened, you know, this is what we'd be able to expect. So we're 12.58% above that, which is pretty strong. Uh, and this bar chart 
right here shows this 2022 statistic is also showing this is what we would project to receive in transient room tax and here's what we uh, uh, project to collect so uh, doing pretty well there and i'll continue to move down some of these others the transit room tax is a collect a tax on uh, short-term rentals that would be hotel rooms airbnbs uh, any kind of housing rental that's or lodging rental that's uh, 30 less than 30 days so then we've got transportation tax this is a a bit of a strange tax um in that it's uh got a an algorithm that's partly derived from uh, taxes in Grand County, and then there's you know uh, other components um, that go to the city of Moab, and uh, there's some other population-based statistics um, associated with this. So it doesn't track very well with all the other taxes because of that. Um, next year, uh, one caveat about this tax: next year, the city is planning to uh, establish a transit district for their pilot program, which is actually going to dig into this, this tax revenue for us. So we're going to lose some of this and it's going to go to the city. Um, there's not a lot we can do about that. Uh, the city is probably going to come to us um, fairly soon. There's a minimum amount that has to be directed to the municipality with the transit district, um, but they're going to be asking for more than the minimum. Um, we did make a, a commitment to pay them $250,000 um, for their pilot transit project. We've paid about $20,000 so far, but they've indicated they'd be willing to terminate that MOU or resolution that we jointly passed because they're going to be collecting some of this transportation tax. <clears throat> right now, this tax funds um, the roads department and active transportation and trails. So on this one, uh, let me look and see how we're doing relative. This graphs a little bit split. So we're we're down from the trend a bit and about 0.61 percent um, above 2021. So like I say, this is a bit of unusual tax, a little bit hard to track, but we're doing fairly well relative to 2021. Um, yeah, but it's bound to go down next year because of the, the issue with the city. Then we've got our county option sales tax. So all the counties in the, in the state have the ability to opt into a quarter percent sales tax, and they all do. So this is the one for Grand County. Um, and here on the graph, you can see it's sort of undulated a bit. This, is, you know, this, this tax is applicable pretty much to every, every cell in Grand County. And, uh, and it's undulated a little bit. We saw a peak in 2014, came down a little bit and then started growing again. Um, 2019 uh, was pretty strong. 2020 was not down as much as you'd think. This is COVID year, but it did drop a little bit relative to the prior year and then shot up again in 2021. Um, the year to date relative to average growth trends is pretty high, higher even than the transient room tax at 26.67%. And uh, actually, 3.42% projected um, over 2021 year to date. And so the general sales taxes are looking pretty strong and, and in fact, probably the best performing of, of all of our sales taxes. Then uh, next up, we've got the rural health care sales tax. <clears throat> this is a uh, a question was presented to the voters. It was a ballot question about whether or not to implement this tax um, for emergency medical services and the long-term care center. Uh, the voters did approve this tax, and so we implemented it. All of this tax uh, goes to the long-term care center and EMS, and th those splits are established uh, usually around September so that they can do their budgeting and we control how that money is split out. So right now, um, year to date versus trend, thirteen or three point one six percent above the average growth trend, and uh, 0.042 percent above twenty twenty two. So not as strong performing as the other some of these other taxes, but still hanging in there. And then we've got our uh, restaurant tax. This is uh, a tax on all prepared food items. It doesn't apply to any kind of uh, unprepared food. So this one also, we got some erratic, some erratic behavior and some recent uh, spikes in June the last couple of years that we haven't historically seen. I'm not exactly sure why that is. Um, year to date, 
we're 10.34% 10, 10 above the average growth trend and 2.93% above 2021. So that tax is doing pretty well. Then uh, we've got the, uh, the 05 percent sales tax that we uh, split with the city. And uh, this is another generally applicable sales tax and so it's a good indicator of overall economic activity. Uh, we're running 39.31% above our historical growth trend. So that's very strong and uh, currently 1.64% year to date over 2021. So again, that's that's showing pretty strong general economic activity, well above even the uh, high inflation rate that we've that we've got going. Then we've got our 2020 car or our, our car rental taxes. <clears throat> Scroll down. Sorry, this PDF split the graphs. Year-to-date trend: 36.23% um, above the trend, and about 1.42% below 2021 collections. So definitely strong relative to our historical collections for the car rental tax. Um, looking like we may come in slightly below or, or near uh, collections for 2021. Then at the bottom here, we've got all of our sales taxes combined. And so this kind of gives us a general um, average across uh, all these taxes, you can see up here in this far right corner, sort of how things have been. Again, 2014 was a little bit of a peak, and then it started, you know, growing pretty substantially again uh, up to 2019. Saw a fairly substantive drop off in 2020, and that's mostly transient room tax related because the the other taxes seem to hold hold up pretty well even through COVID. Then it shot way up in 2021. Uh, at this point. All, all taxes combined, we're looking at about 13.93% above historical growth trends and 0.027% uh, above 2021. So generally pretty strong statistics um, across all these taxes. And uh, I was also interested in how Grand County's transient room tax was com uh, comparing across Let's see, it looks like this link isn't pointing me to it directly. How Grand County's TRT uh, generation over the last three years compares with the rest of the state. So I, I uh, pulled all the TRT information from the Tax Commission for uh, 2019 through the present. This graph is show, or this chart is showing uh, the three year average of 2020 through 2022 for transient room tax collections of the top 10 TRT uh, generating counties in Utah. King County came in first with an average growth of 26.78%. Then came Washington and Graham County, almost neck and neck for second and third place. Washington County just barely edged us out, 24.78% growth. And then Graham County was 24.36% growth. So Grand County is uh, number three uh, on the list, uh, beating Summit, Wasatch, Salt Lake, Utah Iron, uh, Garfield, and Weber. <clears throat> so, you know, that's showing that um, our transient room tax growth is not only strong compared to our own history, uh, but it's also strong relative to other counties in the state. You know, and I think, you know, I'll probably bring this up again in our legislative discussions. Um, but happy to answer any, any questions that you might have. Any questions for Chris? Um, could you explain why the rural health care tax might be performing differently than something like, say, the county option? No, uh, because they should all be uh, ascribed to the same transactions. You know, that's a question I have for the tax commission. You know, I have seen some. Um, data in the past that indicates that either not all businesses are reporting their taxes accurately or they're not collecting their and remitting their taxes accurately. I don't really know which, which one, um, but that could be part of it. You know, it's likely that businesses are collecting the right total amount of tax, but when they report it to the tax commission, they're not putting it in the right category. And maybe that's part of the issue. I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, that's something I plan to follow up with on the tax commission. 
you know, and we also um, have men having new business licenses sign an affidavit that, you know, they know and understand the sales taxes they're supposed to collect and remit. <clears throat> so maybe that will help. But I don't really know the answer to that, Evan. This is an old, this is a question from an old topic, but maybe I remember a while back you were, you were saying there was this weird thing going on with Airbnbs where the taxes that were collected were going to the, can you just. To, um, I think that issue has resolved. been resolved. Okay, great. Um, there was, I guess, an issue where Airbnb was remitting the transient room tax to the location of the owner That's of the right. property. Right, yeah. right. And a lot of our Airbnbs are not owned locally. Right. And so I think perhaps for a while, some of our TRT was going to other places. Right. Um, but according to, I think, Jeanette, uh, what's her name? Woodhouse. Jeanette Woodhouse is the TRT specialist with the tax commission. Okay. I believe that issue's been okay. corrected. Thank you. Thank you. I'm curious about your three-year average showing 24.36 there. I, I mean, if you break that out yearly, that's really about an 8% by year, is it not? Uh, no, this is average per year. Over so, a three-year period, correct? Yeah, but it's the average of those three years. So like, for instance, in uh, 2021, you know, it was about a, I think it was about an 80% growth rate over, I mean, we almost doubled our TRT collections uh, in, or I think we did more than double them in this period of time. So that's per year, the average per year. Okay. <clears throat> What's the uh, percentage for this year, or uh, 2022? Uh, for 2022 if that, if that end of the scope is 80 percent, what, what, what's this what's 2022 i'd have to look that up it's okay. probably um, like i say 2021 was what bumped everybody up yeah um and then obviously 2021 you know was was below and so uh 2022 is uh you know probably going to be uh not as low as 2020 but not as high as 2021 and you know and you can see from our own statistics that we're likely to come in just slightly under uh, 2021. Okay. So it was really 2021 that bumped these all up, but you can see that it's a trend really across the state. It's not just Grand County. And so, um, you know, that's, these are the three year average at rolling averages. And, you know, if you look back and it's probably the same with all other counties, if you look back and pick any three year period, uh, since we started collecting transient room tax, you know, this is definitely gonna be the highest three year period in our history. Uh, but it's probably the same with a lot of other counties as well. So it's generally, you know, it's definitely a, a regional, if not national trend. And, and of course, those numbers are just straight numbers. They're not inflation adjusted. They're not. No. Right. Yeah. Um, and we'll know that we'll have the 2022 final numbers probably in two or three months, Chris. Yeah, we'll get the. Uh, we should have them in, you know, by March, we'll have, have all the sales taxes in so it looked like if we had a very strong november december we could even be even with 2021 potentially yeah could we'll see i mean right now my projection is like i said two to three percent under right. so um i doubt that we'll hit 2021 it's possible but we'd have to have very strong november december yeah and uh those months are historically pretty small numbers relative to the other you know, the spring and fall numbers. So it's unlikely, in my opinion, that we'll hit uh, this parity with 2021 for transient room tax. So November is definitely growing. <laughs> All right, any other questions or comments on, on that? And for the new commissioners, Chris does, well, once every three months or so you do a presentation such as this, I think. Maybe yeah, four. well, I, I mean, I, send, I try to send this out yes, uh, monthly. Right. Yeah. And then, yeah, we, uh, you know, periodically, uh, at least four times a year, we'll do some yeah. financial updates like this, which are, uh, yeah, which are very helpful. All right. Uh, thanks, Chris. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much for keeping track of the statistics. And that's very, always enlightening. You're welcome. All right. Um,
We are finished with the presentations. Um, we have no department or agency reports. So our next uh, item is approval of minutes. Um, approval of minutes for the January 3rd meeting. And I would entertain a motion. I move that we accept uh, approve the minutes for uh, January 3rd, 2023, regular uh, Grand County Commission meeting, as well as the on the same date, uh, the Community Development Block Grant public hearing minutes. Thanks, Mary. Anyone care to second? Evan, all right. I have a motion to approve the minutes by Commissioner McGann and a second by Commissioner Clapper. Uh, discussion of the minutes. Everyone get a chance to look at those and make any changes if you care to. All right, seeing no discussion, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of approval of minutes. And that passes unanimously, five to nothing, with Commissioner Hadeen absent. Commissioner Kadeen and uh, Commissioner Walker. Um, okay, we will move on to the ratification of payment of bills, total county bills, the amount of $1,133,223.44, total payroll, and the amount of $700. Uh, twenty-two thousand eighty-one dollars and twelve cents. Uh, total bills and payroll in the amount of one million eight hundred fifty-five thousand three hundred four dollars and fifty-six cents. Chuck, yes, sir. Just wanted to note on the bills, six hundred ninety dollars is paid to my law firm on page one twenty-five. Those are for services prior um, for public defender services. I'm no longer providing those services. I just wanted to note that for the record. Uh, thanks for the clarification, Stephen. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve uh, bills. Motion to approve the bills as read. Thank you. Second. All right. I have a motion by Commissioner McGann, a second by Commissioner Winfield. Um, any discussion of bills and payroll? I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of approval of bills, raise your hand. Mary? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wasn't that your motion? Yeah. <laughs> to, for the read, do not have to approve. You don't have to vote for your motion. But uh, anyway, uh, that passes unanimously, five to nothing. Commissioner Sedin and Walker absent. Um, we will move on to commission member disclosures. Does any commissioner have anything that they would need to disclose concerning any action item on today's meeting? I've got a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> I'm member of the Chamber of Commerce with Lonnie. I don't know if that's an issue. I don't think that is, Bill. No, that's, yeah. Years ago, I was a contractor for Matt Neeson. So just okay. couple, nothing currently. Right. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? And I don't have anything either. Um, all right, we'll move on to commission reports and future considerations. Trish, did you have anything to disclose? Okay, thank you. Um, Evan, you ready? Yes. Uh, on January 10th, I met with the EMS Special Service District. It was kind of uh, um, a big housekeeping meeting. Uh, we elected new officials, um, made some board, board member interviews, uh, made appointments around that, got a year in review report from the director. Um, it was a long meeting, but got a lot of housekeeping done. Um, met with, with the Sand Flat Stewardship Committee in what was posted as an emergency meeting. Um, it was not a large emergency. It was more about posting deadlines, etc. cetera. Um, it was just a meeting to submit comments to the BLM regarding um, quiet hours in the sand flats and there was a bit of back and forth there and, and um, came to an agreement for a statement to uh, be submitting submitted to that planning portal. Uh, met with the healthcare, Canyonlands Healthcare Special Service District, uh, similar appointed um, uh, Officers. Officers, thank you for the uh, season. Got the, the reports from uh, um, the care center, et cetera. Paid the bills and uh, 
things were good there. I believe that's all that I had to report on from before today. All right. Thanks, Evan. And I think uh, most of the board's appointed officers at our last meetings. <laughs> uh, Mr. Whitfield, are you ready to uh, give a report? Uh, the only meeting that would have been on the calendar was moved, the airport board meeting. So uh, moving forward, I've got others to attend, but I've sat in on a few that I'm not the liaison to. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and, and also, just to reiterate, uh, this is also where you might bring up future considerations. So if there's something you, you want to address in the future or, or potentially want to bring up, this is a time that you, you can alert folks to that, too, just to, yeah. Okay, uh, Trish. Okay, so the second week of every month is my hell week. So that being said, um, I went to the Planning Commission, and just to point this out, this is for Wednesday, um, the Moab Area Watershed. Shed Partnership is hosting, um, I don't see his name, I'm sorry, I can thank you, um, at the mark from 1 to 3 to talk about Moab and Spanish Valley's groundwater conditions, so I just want to state that. Um, Alicia came and did a presentation for, on the Agenda Center, so hopefully we've cleaned that up a little bit. Um, we did talk about the 2023 planning roadmap. Um, so basically January to March, looking at, you know, how, how does housing projects pencil out specifically when we're talking about workforce housing and impediments to developers regarding that continuing to look at future land use planning, particularly identifying areas of mixed use and multifamily residential and how do we increase the ratio of local housing to overnight accommodations. And then lastly, there is another housing task force task force meeting January 24th, focusing on specifically family housing, and that will be held at HMK from 6 to 8 p.m. So I think it was the uh, middle school, was it? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, thank you. No problem. I totally, yeah, you're right. Um, I went to the conservation district on the 10th. Two upcoming workshops, the small-scale agricultural workshop will be held um, February 23rd. I put January 23rd from 10 to 2 at the Grand Center. They're going to talk about drought management, water optimization, small-scale ag, how-to, and pollinator programs, which, by the way, my bees, I just looked at my beehive, they died. Oh. So that's a real bummer. Um, but we also talked about um, the National Groundwater Monitoring Program, and I'm going to talk about that more here in a moment. I went to the Grand County Local Homeless Council on Wednesday, the 11th, and just to give you the 2022 overall numbers, um, on average per month, there is 158 individuals seeking some type of services. 80, 82% um, of those situationally homeless, these are kind of the same numbers I keep giving you, but overall that was a 3.6% increase from the previous year. So that trend is not great. It's going in the wrong direction. I did go to a meeting for the National Groundwater Day, Water Monitoring Program. So I don't know if you remember, but Sarah, we wrote a grant to become a part of that program. And so now we're moving into phase two. And right now we actually, we need more monitoring wells in Spanish Valley, but Mark Stilson specifically needs to delineate where we want those monitoring wells. We do know that the south end of the valley is lacking monitoring wells, which is concerning because that's also San Juan County, and they have different priorities as far as development than us. But that being said, we're not quite ready to put into place applications um, for this round, but Castle Valley is. So Castle Valley, we're going to look at cleaning out a well and then putting in systems into three others to get data in that valley. And it's and so Chris and Chris and Arnie are working on that grant at this time. Um, I already gave you the snow and lake report. I squeezed that in. And here's my future future consideration. Um, the reality is that we're all concerned about water. We're doing a lot about that. We're part of now this national groundwater monitoring program, but nobody's really in charge of water in the county. We're kind of throwing a lot at Arnie. It's not really his place. So it's just something for future, future considerations. Is it a portion of a staff member's job to 
be applying for grants, to be monitoring those grants, et cetera, and so on. So we can throw that down. That'd be cool. And maybe just discuss it a little farther as we move along. All right, That's great. It. Yeah. Sorry, that was a lot. I tried to talk really fast. No worries, Trish. Good, good point on the water. Um, Mike. Uh, went to a couple meetings over the last weeks. Uh, went to an OSTA board meeting. Uh, talk, uh, talked about updates going to the arena. Talked about uh, continued roof fixing. Uh, getting, getting the roof to stop leaking. Yeah. Uh, it's being followed through, uh, which is good news, uh, and has currently stopped leaking. Uh, in these current rainstorms, so we're happy to hear that. Um, went to special events advisory committee uh, meeting, and uh, that goes along with my future considerations on giving the special events advisory committee a little more uh, bite or a little ability to do work. Um, an entire meeting uh, was could have been summed up in about 10 minutes of an Excel doc. Um, there are certain stipulations to events, as we all know. Uh, every event that comes uh, has to meet those stipulations where it gets uh, voted high or low. Um, there was really no reason for 10 people to be in a room. Uh, voting on that when it could have been, I mean, with those stipulations, there was, there's, there's no availability for deliberation uh, within that committee. Uh, I'd like to see in the future uh, a little bit of giving them the ability uh, to talk about events, to see the ins and outs. Uh, Every everything minus one 15 vehicle event was uh, was picked up to the entire council itself. Uh, there was really uh, no reason for that uh, for that meeting to happen. But those were my two I attended this week. Uh, I've also uh, volunteered to be on the uh, fair committee. Uh, OSTA is looking to hold a fair uh, July first uh, through fourth uh, county fair. Uh, and so we created a committee and uh, set up assignments for that. But Angie uh, ducked out for just a second, or she could speak more on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Mary. Yes, uh, pre COVID, uh, we used to go to the leadership meetings that the uh, county holds, where the department heads come together and talk about what's happening, what the needs are, and such. And it's held the uh, first Thursday after the first uh, commission meeting of the month. And uh, it's great. I, I encourage people to come. It's at nine o'clock on that Thursday. It's a good way to meet the uh, head departments, put a face to a name, uh, hear what, what, what the uh, people on the ground doing the work are doing. And, uh, you know, we just, I'm not going to go through it. We discuss because, I've done a lot this and anyway, it was, it was a good meeting. I, uh, one of the more interesting things, the search and rescue reported that uh, it was as busy this year for search and rescue as it was last year. So they're, they're very busy, busiest in the state. I uh, travel council, we interviewed candidates. Uh, we talked about the fly program, the drive program. Uh, the dry program, Salt Lake, Denver, Boise, Las Vegas. They're looking to increase uh, longer stay, and they're really analyzing the different uh, media channels and which ones seem to be doing the most. How, you know, who's getting the most hits? What's what's happening? We had a uh, UMTRA lobbying effort meeting. Uh, uh, Jacques, myself, uh, Ronnie, and uh, Joette were planning to go to DC. December 6th through the uh, 10th, March, excuse me, I saw the D, March uh, uh, 6th through the 10th, because uh, both the House and Senate's in session, and uh, we're, you know, working really hard to get ready for that. It's a lot of work. Uh, housing Task Force, uh, they're looking for an admin assistant. They need a new in their office. So if you hear of anybody, let people know that there is an opening. Arroyo has 10 self-help homes starting in March. And see uh, uh, community rebuild, construct and cottage planning. And the ADO submission, eight submissions. 143 site planning commission setting priorities. And 
uh, the city has an RFP out for Walnut Lane. Uh, <clears throat> Steak Haven reported that uh, they had 76 people in December were homeless because of domestic violence. Yeah, I was going to say that. Which that's just what, gives me shivers. Right, I mean, that, that they that pointed is, out that that was one of the largest factors of homelessness or situational homelessness. Situational right. homelessness, especially what happened in Utah this week. I mean, uh, domestic violence is, yeah, affects absolutely. us on so many levels and it can often end in a tragedy. Uh, I'm not going to go through the rest of them. We met with uh, our representative, Phil Lyman, to talk about our concerns of, of his, that his bill to change how the TRT tax is used and how negatively that is going to affect us, how it's going to hurt us a lot. I thought it was a productive meeting. Uh, that's it. All right, busy as usual, Mary. Thank you. Um, and I, uh, let's see, on the 10th, I attended a trail mix meeting and like most of the other boards, we elected officers who largely remain the same, although we did, uh, trail mix did vote to add a representative and that we, we have representatives such as from the various user groups, such as uh, cycling, trail running, climbing, et cetera. So we voted to add an active transportation rep. Um, so we'll put that out. And uh, so if you know anyone who is a uh, commuter in town, like a bike commuter or um, walks around town a lot and they're interested in participating in trail mix, then uh, show up to the meeting next time. Um, on, let's see, what else do we do at that one? Oh, we also scheduled a Moab, Moab facelift, which is going to be an event in early May uh, where we're going to team with... Um, uh, an association from Yosemite who's put on a few of these. They're going to help plan it and facilitate it, but it's going to be a three-day weekend in May where um, we're going to work on trail cleanup and trail projects uh, in a variety of mediums, hiking trails, climbing trails, biking trails, equestrian trails uh, in the area, and that's going to be a large and exciting project that Trail Mix is going to take on. Um, so that'll be, that'll be great. Look for information on that, and I think that as of right now, it's scheduled for the second weekend of May. Um, on the 11th, I attended a Thompson Special Service District um, meeting uh, where actually the topic that Sana brought up earlier was discussed. Um, that's been under discussion at that board. Um, the board also set a public hearing uh, for the budget, for, for the board budget, which is two months behind. Um, so at the next, at the February meeting of TSSD will be there, their public hearing and budget will be presented. Um, also, um, a new, uh, board member was recommended and we'll vote that that's actually on the consent agenda. There's only one applicant. Um, and we realized that another board applic uh, members term expired at the end of that, uh, 2022, and he will also be up for recommendation, uh, at the next meeting. Um, also, a public hearing is was discussed to be potentially set for March regarding sale of more ERUs at Thompson. So they're looking at um, discussing with the public whether or not they might uh, sell more water because they've been under a moratorium for the better part of, what, a year and a half, Trish, probably two years. Yeah. Um, and that would be a process, including a a public hearing and a discussion here at the commission. We talked about that too, and the board uh, would like to present to the commission at our February 7th uh, meeting. Um, and let's see, and that's it. That's all I had from Thompson. Um, on the 12th, uh, I attended a motorized trails committee meeting where Again, officers were chosen, largely the same. Uh, Jess Stevens was elected the vice chair. Last year, we didn't have a vice chair, um, so that's great. Uh, as usual, trail projects were discussed. Uh, there's a master list of trail projects, and uh, various other trail projects were, were taken into consideration and, and will be um, undertaken. Um, and that is about it on the uh, Motorized Trail Commission. Oh, actually, the... Uh, um, uh, uh, Anna Sprout from our Responsible Recreation Program presented 
there as we are looking to move into motorized for the for the trail ambassador program and she was um eliciting uh recommendations and support from the moab trails committee um i also attended uh with mary the um discussion about the trip to dc with a couple of folks from the city including joette and ronnie and uh along with mary and bill uh the meeting with with um representative lyman and we'll talk more about that on one of our action items um so that's it for me yes sir bill yeah i also attended yes. that meeting i knew we were going to talk about it in an action meeting but yeah i did have in my notes something and when you mentioned future considerations that came to mind is where are we at or what do we have to do in looking towards the contract that the film commission and bega have i believe that's something that we're looking at in the future future here is what do we need to do to get that move forward chris so i've asked uh august granith to come up with a scope of work for that contract which uh he's on august are you available to answer bill's question about the state of the scope of work for the contract for film commissioner he's up at uh he's up yeah with the capital right now so he's um, probably oh there's ben, ben can you hear me? okay go ahead august i was just gonna say you might be driving folks we could hear you can folks hear me yes yes we can hear you august uh yep yeah, we're 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 working towards putting that scope of work together um, and uh, it's just kind of in process at this point, working with the Utah Film Commission to and, and BIGA um, to ensure that that's ready for Chris to take on and put into contract form. I'll have to work with Steve on that. Okay, <laughs> that's so it sounds like it's moving along. <laughs> Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Um, I agree, I forgot something. I complained a lot about our internet connection and I want to thank Matt because he heard yeah. what I said and has fixed it and I have not gotten kicked off once tonight. Well, it was every three minutes before it seemed like. So thank you very much, Matt, if you're listening. Great. Um, okay, uh, that's it for us commissioners. Unless I, I believe Kevin was um, gonna try to join by five-ish. I don't know if he's on yet. Sounds like not. Okay. Um, let's see. We are on to elected official reports. And I will start with our uh, sheriff. And we haven't had a sheriff report in some time. So, Jameson, welcome. We have several different things that I want to talk about today. Uh, the, first, the first one is... Uh, major crimes task force i've got an mou in place with homeland security already um, they're going to be providing equipment and money to fund extra shifts in the county those shifts they can work human trafficking they can work dope cases and it's funded by the the federal government the only thing that i need for that to happen for the task force to take off is a uh, task force commander position and renee and i are in the works right now of coming up with the job description so we can get that going and, and have that take off. Um, I've been working closely with Chief Garcia with the hopes of doing joint projects moving forward. Chief Garcia and I have a relationship. Uh, we are fully uh, staffed and dispatched for the first time in a long time. Uh, we are one, we're one physician short in the jail and we have a couple of road deputy positions open right now. And I could fill those, but we're struggling with equipment and finding vehicles for those deputies to drive. Um, I've applied for multiple grants. We've been awarded one grant so far with uh, the state of Utah for the DUI section. They're gonna give us $10,000 towards body cameras and they've awarded about uh, 16 new portable breath tests for our deputies so they can help with uh, DUIs. A report to you guys on the stats for the month of December. And I'm planning on attending these commissioner meetings. And if it's not me, I'll have somebody from my office if I can't make it, just to give you guys an update on what the sheriff's office has been up to. Uh, total calls for service 
for the month of December was 549 calls that deputies responded to. Um, 221 of those were traffic stops by the deputies. Uh, three of those were search and rescue calls. So as we get moving into our busy season, we're gonna, these numbers will obviously go up. We're working on a way where we can track like uh, UTV traffic stops and report on those as well. Um, any questions about those so far? Stats or anything? So the, the next thing that I want to do is talk about a couple different awards. There was a tremendous amount of hours, sleepless nights, time away from their families, poured into the case. Uh, I'm talking about the double homicide case. I want to acknowledge a couple of deputies and their dedication and hard work during one of the more tragic events in Grant County. Uh, I've got a couple different awards for the deputies and we have them here. Uh, the, the award is a meritorious conduct. So the, the first award is gonna to go to our lead investigator, Nathan Whitney. And then our second award is gonna to go to Sergeant Josh Honor. He was an investigator at the time during the incident. And they're here, so. Yeah, come on, come on up guys. <laughs> Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. And and thanks, Jameson, for, for doing that here. That's all I have for today, but like I said, I'm gonna attend the meeting in February and I'll report to the commissioners our stats for the January. All right. Thank you very much. It's it's nice to have you uh giving reports. I very much appreciate it. Um all right. Uh we also have uh Clerk Wojtek. Anything to report? Nothing at this time, thank you. Thanks, Gabe. And we also have um, attorney stocks. Um, just wanted to give you folks an update. Um, first, noting on what Sheriff Wiggins said, uh, the things that the sheriff needs, they're really important to be able to prosecute the cases that we have. So the support that we can give him, that's that's very important. He and I have had the opportunity to meet a few times about the drug task force, and that's going to be an important process that we need to go to to address some of the problems that we're having in the community. Um, since our last meeting, I've undergone many meetings with many people, and I foolishly stated that I wanted to go to many, many boards. Um, I was able to attend the Moab Area Travel Council, PNZ, the ITA with Mike, uh, MDT, DRT, LC, or LHC with Trish, and then I got a 515 phone call from Chair Hadler inviting me to go to the Thompson Special Service District. Um, that was interesting as well. So I went to that meeting as well. Um, it's awesome to be able to get to know all the different people in all the different parts of the, of the county because the county attorney's office deals with many questions. Um, I've also had the wonderful opportunity to meet with a lot of the commission administration office and commissioners individually. Um, it's been quite a process. The one thing that I'm most excited about after meeting with everybody, I think it would be great to have a more clean civil intake process for the county attorney's office. So what we're going to do is we're going to design an intake process kind of like in a standard law firm. So if the commissioners have questions for things, the commission question would come in, you would identify how much time or how urgent a particular issue is, and then we'll legal, do the legal research necessary and get an answer back. Um, currently, we just utilize emails which is great in some ways, but also really difficult to continue to track. Um, and so it'd be really nice to have just a clean part where if Commissioner McGann had a question, she'd give it to me and then she could work with my staff. If for, for example, I'm away or wanted an update, she can contact them and ask uh, Ms. Hoffein about where a particular issue is at. And that way we can kind of address questions that folks have. So that's going to be coming forward and um, that's really everything that I have. And then I was just gonna note uh, one more thing on the agenda, the red tail aviation. Um, I have a conflict yeah. on that. I just right. wanted to list it for the community. They donated to my campaign. Uh, my understanding is there are a few things outstanding with it. And I don't know if it's going to be postponed, but someone else in my office will help uh, take care it of that. It looked like it would 
be postponed. Right. So I just want to disclose that as well. Right. And that's Thank everything I have. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, all right. Moving on to uh, commission administrator report. Mallory is on still. Did you have anything to report, Mallory? I don't have much to report. I have Are you laughing at me, sir? Mallory, we can't hear you very clearly. At all. Or at all. <laughs> it's a sign. That means I have nothing to report. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Quinn. No, I'm good. You guys covered all. Okay. Great. And that is it on general reports. So we will move on to our general business action items. Uh, discussion and consideration of approval. And our first item is approving the Grand County Emergency Operations Plan. And uh, as promised, uh, Cora, our Grand County Emergency Manager, um, is back, uh, along with Whitney uh, Coonrod, who I believe is still on, yes, on Zoom, and potentially Sheriff Wiggins as well. And I'll, I'll just state that the uh, the county emergency operations plan was included in the in the packet. I think it everybody is. got a chance to look that over. It was long. Yeah. So thank you all for taking the time to read the through the emergency operations plan. Um, it is a requirement to be in compliance with in alignment with House Bill 96. I listed that on the screen as you can see here. Um, for, um, each county shall create and maintain an emergency operations plan. Uh, moving forward, this will be updated annually by me. And then there are some other events that would trigger a revision, such as a flood event or a training exercise or we identified it a gap or an opportunity. Um, it's continually being improved and updated as knowledge is gained through guidance, training exercises, and coordinated emergency response activities. And this is coming straight from the community preparedness. All right. Questions? Uh, no, I was able to, to look over the plan and yeah. Any Want to have a question for Cora? Mary? I only have one comment. Yeah. It's just one of my. On your statement of approval, I would take the man off a chair. Uh, yeah. Okay. We're trying to do that throughout the county because in my tenure, there's been more females as chair than uh, men. And it's just one of those subconscious I'm things. I'm happy to make that change. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Other, otherwise, it, it's nice to see. Thank you so much for doing this. It's been something it's, I've wanted it is, to see for yeah. a long time. Yes, so thank it, you. It's great to see Cora, and especially after all the yeah last year, all, everything that we had going on. Hopefully, this will be a quiet year. But it's nice to have. It. And since I did send you that, uh, I did update the name from Division Best Star to Division Energy. I've been using, that was brought to my attention, uh, and then I have it. To our oh yeah! Great, okay. great. Good. I did. I wanted to mention that too. Yeah, I was, I was yeah. That's great. I, I know a lot of people in the county rely on KCMU. <laughs> yes, Bill. And, and so this is new, correct? We don't currently, or we, we haven't had in the past an EOP. Uh, there was a plan the last time, to my knowledge, that it was revised was 2012, which is okay. Cool. Good time wow. update. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Uh, yes, Stephen. Yeah. Um, under the statute, it, it has a requirement to let um, to list out which individuals have the authority and the ability to send emergency alerts. Is that contained in the plan? Um, so, I, I just noted it as one thing potentially that we could add. Um, so, we do have a policy within the sheriff's department for the 
uh, utilizing the integrated public alert warning system or I pause um, I have that training. Our dispatch supervisor has that training. All of our dispatchers have that training in order to initiate. Um, and I, as I said in my presentation earlier, working towards having anyone that would be in an incident have that training to initiate. Great. Does that answer your question fully? Just in, in the statute, it, it asks that it lists out those individuals that have the authority to send the alerts. I don't know yes, if there's- Yes, and uh, sorry, uh, Jenny Spencer, our dispatch supervisor, has that list of individuals. Okay, perfect. If it's okay. just contained in the plan, that's all. That's all. I was just making sure we double check. Yes, we got it covered. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Cora. I would entertain a motion, Mary. Yes. I move to approve the Grand County Emergency Operation Plan. Thank you. I'll look to second that. All right. I have a motion by Commissioner McGann and a second by Commissioner McCurdy. Um, any further discussion on the plan? I, uh, um, hey, I um, this is not really discussion, but I just, Jacques, I just want to let you know that I have funded a meeting. This is Kevin Walker. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, go ahead, Kevin. Um, I realize it's a living document and it's kind of uh, moving and evolving constantly. So I can appreciate a lot of that. Um, I had reached out earlier today. Sorry, I didn't do it sooner. I was kind of digging in further um, today. I noticed some things kind of like right off the bat. I mean, the photos, we got Mesa Arch um, in Canyonlands. There's a photo of Rainbow Bridge in Glen Canyon National Rec Area. There's a yes. photo of Goose Neck State Park. Would you like to update the photos? <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I was a little miffed when all the photos were from San Juan County. <laughs> As I started to read the hazard analysis, uh, the first thing is transportation. It mentions that the closest commercial airport is in Cortez, Colorado. It was Farmington, New Mexico. Uh, later on, it highlights the EOC being on Main Street in Monticello. Same with the uh, health department offices being in Monticello and Blanding and, and San Juan has their yeah, own health department. I'm happy to make any updates that you find if you would like to take the time and workshop those with me, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I could contribute mine, yeah. Um, there are some other positions that we don't have in this county that are listed with a lot of responsibilities. Um, so I don't know the timeline for uh, the, the meeting the bill, but I'm happy to uh, come through this a lot more. But um, it seemed like there was more than just uh, editorial issues as much as it, it, a large chunk of it seemed like um, some field acquisitions, which I'm all for, but uh, you know, I think especially after the flooding, um, things that have happened recently that we really owe it to our bosses, the citizens, you know, some grade A work on this, because this is a pretty basic function of government is, is to, you know, protect that health and welfare. Right. And as I meet with stakeholders, that is my intention. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, I would make a substantive motion to postpone approving the plan until we've made more revisions. But that's just my two cents. Um, anyone want to second uh, Evan's substitute motion? Yeah, I'll second that. Okay, Trish, um, discussion. Will this um, hurt a deadline? Uh, yeah, so we are currently not in compliance with House Bill 96, uh, which was um, some uh, problematic things that are problematic. Um, and this is also necessary for grant funding, uh, which reporting deadline is January 20th. So if you would like to workshop those changes and get those to me, I'm happy to do that with you and so we can get this done. Um, or if we want to approve the change or uh, approve it with the uh, changes that you mentioned. I can work on that. Could we approve it and have it revised and brought back in February, second meeting in February? 
So to recap what you said, approved with the revisions. Or uh, approved with the intention of doing some revisions. Absolutely. And bringing it back in February. Yeah. And we can meet before then. Uh, I could draft what uh what I was reading. I don't know about um. In per, the first meeting in February, or the second meeting. I said second meeting. Yeah, we could get together before then. Which would be the twenty first. Yeah. But if we need it for grants that are coming up in January, we haven't had this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The end of this week. The yeah. So uh, I hate to <clears throat> not allow her to do that when it hasn't been looked at in since two thousand twelve. 10 years so but I do think we do need to look at it closer and uh, revise it and bring it back but approve it tonight with that I, I could uh, amend my motion to approve uh, the plan would Evan have to withdraw his substitute motion no, he'd vote for it and then we'd vote for my amended motion right we have this motion pending. excuse right. me uh, that sounds like Whitney. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, Whitney. Hi, I would just like to give some clarification on this plan. Um, I'm Whitney Kudrad. I am with the Division of Emergency Management. I am your local liaison for the division. Um, so I just want to clarify, this plan is old. Um, it is a little bit outdated. Um, historically, the, the contract that you gave this plan to, to develop, um, it was with the AOG's office. So the AOG uh, developed it and it gave out a carbon copy to Carbon, Emory, Grand, and San Juan. So that's why you're seeing the, um, the references to the ELC on San Juan, <clears throat> San Juan Main Street. Um, it wasn't a great plan. Uh, it has been, the other four, three of the four counties have revised that plan over the years. Grand is the last one to do that. Um, it's going to probably take a, a new, like to, to redo the whole plan um, would be my advice. Uh, however, it is incumbent on us to approve it in, in the meantime um, to meet those House Bill 96. It's better to have something rather than nothing, right? Um, so just from my own advice, from my own experience, I would uh, make the... Um, make the recommendation that it's, it be approved and promulgated tonight um, and then work towards that. There are grants out available for that to, to revise that whole plan, um, to develop a new plan. Corey and I have talked about uh, pretty much scrapping this whole plan and coming up with an ISM model um, to meet the better needs of the rural areas in Utah. So if, if that's any advice, I, I would hope that Maybe that that would be looked at. Right. Okay. Thanks, so, Whitney, for giving that context. Yeah. So approve it uh, with the intention of having a whole new plan in place this year. <laughs> Sooner than later. <laughs> Is there any problem with that for you, Stephen? No. Okay. Yeah. I my hesitancy to to start listing my edits was that I agree we need a whole new plan. Yeah. So. So okay, so we have a so we have a substitute motion with a second on the table right now. Um, so if I call for yeah, go ahead. Evan. Do I have the ability to withdraw it? No. Okay, since there's been a second, got it. All right, I'll call for a vote on the substitute motion, and uh, recommend we don't vote for it. I guess <laughs> uh, all those in favor of the substitute motion, raise your hand. All those opposed. Motion fails, uh, and I no. Yeah, I can. Kevin. I, I don't know. Okay, so motion fails unanimously. Um, okay, so we're back to the original motion. Okay, so I want I would like to amend my motion to state that we approve this plan with uh, the intention of creating an entirely new plan uh, this year. Okay, do I have a second on the amendment? I'll second that. Okay, uh, 
discussion on the amendments. What we're voting on now is voting to amend the original motion, and we'll have to vote on the original motion. Um, any just, discussion? Just, just one thought. They could just make a motion to approve it, period, and then they can just come back and amend it, adding the asterisk with the intention to change later. They always have the ability to come back and change it later. Well, the intent is a declaratory statement, as I guess I have to Right. Okay. Thank you. So we do one more substitute. Well, I think no, we can vote with my original. Right. Yeah. Yes, I don't. So let's just. I withdraw my amendment. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Any discussion on in the original <laughs> motion? Let's see. It was uh, Mary made the motion and Mike uh, seconded it. I believe, right? Okay. So motion on the table to approve the plan by Commissioner McGann and second by Commissioner McCurdy. Any, any further discussion on this? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion to approve the plan, raise your hand. Or in the case of Kevin, say aye. Um, I, I vote yes. Okay. All opposed. Okay, the motion passes six to one with Commissioner Clapper in opposition. Uh, okay, so we got that taken care of. Um, <laughs> so we're on to the next uh, agenda item, approving succession plan for the emergency manager, chief executive officer, and back to Cora Phillips. Yes, so uh, this is in alignment with the Utah Emergency and Term Succession Act, in which uh, for myself and the chief executive officer, needs uh, three individuals identified. Um, for myself, it would be uh, Jennifer Swenson, who is our current dispatch supervisor. She is the only one that has the necessary qualifications to fill that role at this time. Uh, the next would be Sheriff Wiggins, and he has the authority to delegate um, that role um, as during an emergency incident um, disaster. He would be serving as an incident commander. Um, the next in line would be the chief, chief deputy. Right, Mike Palmer. Okay, great. And then, did we? Did you need to speak to the chief executive officer? Or is that uh, that was uh, Mallory's. Right. Yeah. Okay. If she wants to speak to that, she. Would did you have anything you wanted to say to that, Mallory? Um, I do not. Okay, great. And that's that's all in our in our packet. Yes, right there. All right. So I would enter. And just for the sake of the public, that that would be uh, next in line after. Mallory be the strategic development coordinator and then the associate administrator and then the commission chair for the chief executive. So that starts though with the commission chair, right? It starts with the, uh, it starts with actually with Mallory. Well, that, I don't think that's compliant with statute. Chief executive executive emergency chair. management act specifies that the commission chair is the executive officer. It would it, default to that if we okay. did not select. Okay, all right, great. <clears throat> Okay, and then does the clerk auditor need to be? Uh, uh, I guess you're the finance officer. The, the statute just lists an, an order that goes CE or the chief executive officer of the political subdivision, chief deputy executive officer, and then the chair of the legislative body, and then the chair of or the chief law enforcement officer. We're commissioned, so we're both combined but the normal day-to-day -day executive functions handled by the administrative office. And so that would be Mallory and then Chris and then Quinn, Quinn and then, Quinn. then we shift to the, the legislative chair. body. Yeah. There's no, there's no requirement to have it that way, but that's, if we don't designate it, that's what they do. And it would be confusing if we didn't designate. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, I would entertain a motion. I'll do it. Great. I move to approve the succession plan for the emergency manager and chief executive officer. Thank you, Trish. Second. And all right, so I have a motion to approve by Commissioner Hadeen and a second by Commissioner McGann. Any further question on this? Any uh, further discussion on this item? Uh, yes. yes one, more, one more addition. If on the, on the succession plan, if we could just insert uh, Miss Jenny Swinson's title in front. Everyone else has their title with the exception of right. That's the only uh, other thing I'd know. Uh, the only reason I didn't identify that is because she is by name, um, because um, if she was no longer in that role and somebody were to assume her position, they might not necessarily have those necessarily necessary qualifications right. 
to um, fulfill that emergency manager role. The only reason why it might be helpful to add is we're just for consistency so that they know who she who she is and how she's connected to the county. And I mean, I mean you, get, you folks could change and update as you went the title, theoretically. Is it, would it be more useful then to name her under her formal, former title? Because she did she get those certifications and trainings when she was the emergency manager? I do not know the timeline of when oh, she okay. received that training. Um, but she is the only one that has necessary qualifications. Yeah, no, I understand. I'm just trying to see how we can check both boxes. Yeah, it's it's just so that I mean, in the event of emergency, they might be looking. For, they might not know people, and they might be looking for the Grand County Sheriff. And that the idea is it flows with the uh, yeah. role type deal. I'm happy to include her title with your comments. Just again, belt and suspenders type deal combos. Okay. <laughs> um. um so I know that we're making a bigger deal out of this, is, but if she's no longer in that role and this plan is still standing, then, then that role would then go to the next okay. in line. Yeah. Sheriff Wiggins, who can designate that individual the emergency manager. Great. Okay. Uh, so I am still looking for a, or actually I have, I'm sorry, I have a motion on the table. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, I will call for a vote. All those in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Kevin? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Uh, motion passes unanimously. And uh, thank you, Cora and uh, Sheriff Wiggins. We are on to uh, the next agenda item, um, number five on the uh, agenda, approving Utah Association of Counties voting member. Um, a little bit of background on this. At our previous meeting, we assigned board members for all the various boards, including UAC. And on the UAC uh, one, we had a co uh, commissioner situation with Commissioner Winfield and Commissioners McGann together, but um, I will say I didn't realize that there was a voting issue here uh, that came up afterwards and in the best interest of um, Grant County and just and just um, keeping it above board. I think that it is important for the entire commission to vote on which uh, representative will be the actual voting member at UAC. Um, uh, and I think that is it as far as uh, as that goes. So our two, uh, again, our two UAC commission representatives are Commissioner Winfield and Commissioner McGann. So um, I would entertain a motion and we would be uh, choosing one to be the actual vote at UAC. Can I ask a clarifying question just real quick? Sure, Stephen. Is it possible that one have the ability to vote and if they're not able to be present? I don't I don't know if UAC permits proxy voting is my is why I'm asking the question. I, I, I don't have an answer for that. Maybe I you, know. believe you can, but you have to verify it prior to the meeting. Because I, I stood in for Jay Lance a couple of times. And how did how did that work, Mary? Well, no, I went up, they knew it. So it oh, was, right. Okay. So it was, it was on the, uh, you know, so I was listed for that meeting as the voting member. Yeah. I saw Mike was about to raise your, you, yeah. Well, I was going to make it. Uh, we decided this last week in going down the list assignments. Who who was listed? We, we did. It, we it, there were two. We we did like a, yeah. Yeah, we did like a, a co situation where both Bill and Mary yeah. were were listed on okay. the thing yeah. together, yeah. and we didn't we didn't clarify. Okay. One okay. or the okay. other, which is why it's it, it's dropping down to this. Okay. Yeah. Oops. Yes. I'll make a motion. I move to appoint Commissioner McGann as the voting member for the Utah Association of Counties. Thank you. Uh, Evan, seconds, um, discussion. Yes, Mike. Uh, been to, uh, I know I'm a junior, I've uh, been to many uh, of the UAC events uh, currently. Um, and I do not want to propose myself, uh, but uh, I'm just looking at, do you go to the UAC stuff? Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, 
like I called and visited with Brandy today, the head of you at okay. about stuff and uh, visit with Zeke and I've, I've gone to a lot of the conventions. But okay. I like to go to the conventions that are more specific to something rather than that big convention where the breakout sessions oftentimes don't apply to Grand County. Well, uh, other, 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 other ones are their things. And when they have a regional, national, and associated counties, I've gone to those. Okay. No, uh, well, I know Bill's perfected. Uh, we went together. Yeah. So, know. Yeah. So, did you have something you wanted to add, Bill? I um, I'm totally fine with the nomination the way it stands. Um, clearly, it feels a little bit like a political issue here. The I almost feel like the bears that you guys are trying to protect from the dogs with as many emails as we got on this. Somebody certainly rallied yeah, the troops. That was that there was, was 15 person. minimum of them. And I'm fine with it. it the nomination is, is fine going to Mary in my mind. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I thought that was weird. Any other I was just <laughs> any any other discussion on the uh motion? All right, uh, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Kevin? Didn't hear um, anything. I vote yes. Okay, and I all those yes. opposed. Okay, and all opposed. Okay, so the motion passes five to two with commissioners uh, Winfield and McCurdy uh, in opposition. Uh, we will move on to agenda item number six, and that is approving volunteer appointments to the Emergency Medical Services Special Service District. Uh, Commissioner Clapper. Yeah, we uh, we met in an open meeting, reviewed the applications, submitted, interviewed all the applicants. Um, there was two vacancies up, and we had three applicants that interviewed on that day. Um, it, there were, was uh, great participation, strong members, and so it was uh, it did actually have probably the most back and forth um, that I've ever been involved with on a board appointment. But uh, the EMS would like to forward um, the recommendation for Ronnie Darasari and Tarn K. So uh, with that, I would move to approve those two to serve on the EMS Special Service District with terms expiring December 31st. 2026. Thank you. I'll second that. Okay. Those are strong applications. Wow. All right. We have a, a motion um, to appoint uh, by Commissioner Clapper and a second by uh, Commissioner Hedin. Um, any discussion on these appointments? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of the appointments, raise your hand. Say aye. aye. Kevin, all the uh, all those opposed, and the motion passes six to nothing with uh, Commissioner Walker absent. Um, all right, we're on to item number seven: approving voluntary appointments to the Moab Area Travel Council Advisory Board. Um, we have a uh, yeah co-presenters uh, August Granith, if August is here, as well as Commissioner McGann. We interviewed. Yep, I'm here. Great. We did an interview twice, once in December, uh, the last meeting in December. We interviewed some of the applicants, and then we finished the interviews at this meeting and the meeting I reported on in January. Uh, I, uh, Jeremy Day did not interview. He didn't show up. So uh, we tried uh, repeatedly to get a hold of him by the phone. Uh, I'm, I would I would make a motion that uh, we appoint uh, Jenny uh, Gleason to fill the par, uh, place of the non TRCCA TRCT tax position and Lori McFarland to uh, fulfill the uh, a place for the people representing a TRCC TRT recommendation and then I. Uh, I, that's my motion. I'll second that motion. All right. I have a, a motion by Commissioner McGann and a second by Commissioner Hedin. Uh, discussion. 
we're just making the motion on two of these. Yes, okay. that sounds like Mary's motion. Yeah. Yeah. And why are we not including? I thought there were three or four seats that we need. Well, the, the other person that was recommended when they were uh, on the board in the past uh, caused a huge amount of issues for the county. And uh, I would rather have someone on the board that would uh, work in tandem and with the rest of the board. Well, I know in the past that the gentleman that you're talking about has certainly had his moments, but I would think that every think, one of us uh, here. I would have... think to go if we want to discuss an individual, I would be happy to move, make a, you know, we should make a motion to go into closed session. I'm not comfortable discussing a character and competency or, or things like that in an open and public meeting. But we could go into closed session. So we have hey, we, we could do it at the end of the meeting. We could do that. I do want to note that we need to fill there. There was one more applicant, and I can't say her last name. Rebecca, number seven, Mon Kru. Oh, yeah. She was the, I'm sorry, Monso. Uh, she was the only other applicant that was TRT or TRCC. Um, Melissa Jeffers was not. Um, and we need to have two applicants from TRT or TRCC, and Mr. Howard Trentholm and Rebecca Mons, one more time, August, if you know. Monso. 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 Those were the only two. So out of the three people that we, we need to put on the board to stay compliant with statute, two of them have to be there to make the majority um, being entities in the county that are subject to the taxes referred in the sections per state code. Because if we appoint just the two, yeah, we'll but have we it. Can, we need to, we'll need to reopen that the, application theoretically yeah, that would be the, that, wait, 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 the application to... is still open the the positions are open as filled i think the point steven's trying to make is that state code requires the board to have a majority of trcca trt could be all trt could be all trcca it doesn't necessarily matter per code um but i think steven's concern is that if we did this we'd be 50 50. um so and, and, the and august she applied she applied and interviewed correct rebecca yep Okay. Totally. She, she's a completely eligible candidate. If we didn't, what? So we'd be out of compliance if only two people were appointed. Is that? I mean, what, what state code literally says is it says a tourism advisory board shall be composed of the following members that are residents of the county. Number one, a majority of the members shall be current employees of entities in the county that are subject to the taxes referred in sections 59-12-303 or 59-12-603. And the balance of the board's members shall be employees of recreational facilities, convention facilities, museums, cultural attractions, or other tourism-related industries located within the county. Again, the goal is to always have that majority for right. the TRT we or do have, We do have the majority even now because we have Alex, Bra uh, Brandon, um, we, we're replacing Jason Taylor, and um, I'd have to look at it again. Daniel. Uh, Daniel. Daniel Loveridge. And yes. both of them. And then Jenny was your one non. And so right now the mix is four and three, but we have to replace two of the TRT and one of the other remaining. Hey, um, I'd like to make a, a question. Um, many boards that I've served on have a provision that members serve until replaced rather than until December 31st. Is that the case for the TCAB? My uh, the bylaws, the bylaws right. of the Travel Council Board um, have four years term limits attached to them. And the commission can revise those bylaws if they'd like. I don't think that there's term limits required in state code, but I'm not sure about that one. I, I think that Kevin means would they, if nobody is appointed tonight, would those who are on whose terms expire would they carry over until that happened? Is that right, Kevin? Um, it, um, yeah, yes, that, that was my point. Even yeah, It's a four-year term, but it might be a four years plus two weeks if a, yes. that replacement is in. Some boards have that structure. I haven't looked at the TCIB bylaw, so I don't know what's the case here. So, so I just asked him this question. That we, should we be. Just reviewed we just reviewed the bylaws and I didn't read anything that explicitly said that, but I could be wrong. Um, that is our general, I, I think um, I can't think of the ordinance or resolution 
off the top of my head, but there are one of each that I think would have that as the default. So if it's not explicit, I imagine that is the case. Is there uh, upcoming timelines or action things for the, the board that uh, would be sensitive to being out of compliance? Uh, the board doesn't meet until uh, January, or excuse me, February 14th for their next regularly scheduled meeting. And the application is currently open now? Uh, all, all of the positions are open until filled, so we could continue to receive applications. Um, and we have two applicants that qualify, is my understanding, and so... Well, I, the reason I didn't, and I'm happy to go back... Uh, well, they, I, if, Mary, I mean, excuse me until I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm finished up here, but we have a public group that are made up of citizens of this county that have recommended three people for this board. And if we're not going to follow that, we need to have a good excuse not to do so. And so then I really feel that that's going to push us into closed session to discuss that if we need to. We, if you would like to. And just an update I found in the bylaws, it does specifically state um, memberships, membership of the board shall consist of seven individuals appointed by the Grand County Council for a term of four years. Right. So as far as compliance goes, it, just to do a crazy situation, what if one of the board members was to, to become incapacitated or whatever? Sure. And, and the point well taken. The other thing that you could theoretically do is appoint one person. You could appoint, you know, and have an uneven, uneven amount. So I mean, uh, okay. but technically we're out of compliance now because it's the 17th. So we've already been uh, right. operating that way. And so... <laughs> It's, uh, I, I think it's important to get um, uh, quality candidates that are in place. And if there's reservations, then. Um, uh, ben and August, you're still on. Remember yep. that uh, when we uh, didn't think we got enough uh, varied people, uh, enough diverse people applying for the Economic Development Board. We didn't approve anyone and then just kept, uh, just worked harder. We made more of an effort to let people know about it and get more qualified people on it. What, so, what, yeah, what Mary's referring to is when we were recruiting for open um, vacant economic development advisory board positions um, that had been created after we had streamlined the Economic Diversification Advisory Council and combined it with the Economic Development Advisory Board, uh, there was a moment um, where within the board, before we brought it to the commission, uh, the board decided to kind of double down on recruitment efforts to really try to get as many potential applications as possible to that board. Um, it took basically an extra month to get a couple more applications and interviews done. Um, and then brought kind of a final slate of nominations to the uh, county commission at that, in that instance. So just one more last thought. We could go into closed session if that's what people want to do. Option number two, you could appoint, I know your motion included one position that was the non-TRCCA and one TRCCA. You could theoretically substitute the motion to um, nominate the person that would be TRCCA T. RT, and then you would have one of each position available and you could put out for more applications and redo that process. That Those are two options. I do not have any preference. I'm just letting you know. And the, the appointing of one would keep you in compliance. So at the end of the day, you, you folks pick your destiny. And who is, the, is that? That uh, would be, uh, the, we would appoint uh, Lori. Okay. And, well, uh, Stephen, Wayne. can I ask a quick question? Yes. Is the timeline on that compliance clear? Like, you know what I mean? As in, if it, it we have would, a bunch of vacancies, like, can we not meet as a board, basically, unless that majority is there? No, you, you can you can meet as a board. But again, the goal behind it is the tour. It says the tourism tax advisory board is required by the statute to always have a majority with those that are paying TRT or TRT 
their TRCC uh, employees. That's that's the goal. So they always want that majority on that advisory board. Could we be out of compliance compliance for a period of time? And would the skyfall? No, probably not. But if again we're trying to stay within the nature of the the ordinance, then or I'm sorry, the statute, then it would be a point one, and then you still have two individuals. And if we're going to cast out the net again to find more qualified individuals seeking two positions, uh, there is that option. It's it's whatever you guys want to do. So very very clear cut. If we if we go forward with two that have been selected without a third, which there is a third individual, you're going to create a stalemate on the board, or maybe not. I mean, they might might all come together. So anyways. could we uh, table this until uh, the end of uh, our action items and then go into closed session. We could, uh, if you wanted to make a motion to Yeah, make table. a motion to table so we don't have to kick people out and then come back right. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then have a closed session at the end of where it's on the agenda and then we can come out and make a vote. That sounds good. Okay. Are you, so you're making a motion to, you're no, making, no, no, no. oh, okay. You're making a motion. a motion to table. I'll this, second that. Okay. Uh, discussion on tabling this item until the end of the uh, agenda. All right. Uh, all in favor of table? Yes, Stephen. Chair Heather, while yes. while they're considering that, would it be possible for August and Ben to get more information of the other applicants so that everybody can have a really informed discussion later on? Let's see. What, is that is that a possibility, August? Well, well, I don't quite understand what you mean. Oh, uh, what Stephen was proposing is that you uh, provide, if you could gather the information on the uh, the Rebecca. fourth applicant, Rebecca, Rebecca. Mon right on Re Rebecca Monceau, um, and we that would maybe help us consider a different path. It, it's in here, but if if maybe at that time they could refresh their recollection regarding the interview and things like that. If, right. If she's going to be a substitute candidate, theoretically. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I can speak to uh, I can speak to to her interview and qualifications if required. OK, great. Thank you. Um, OK. All those in favor of the motion to table, raise your hand. Say aye. Aye. And Kevin, are you still with us, Kevin? Um, I vote yes to table. OK, great. Motion passes uh, six to nothing with Commissioner Hadeen absent. So we will uh, table that until later in the meeting. Um, all right. Next up, uh, agenda, uh, agenda item number eight, uh, general discussion, possible action on state legislative topics. Uh, Chris Baird and, and myself, um, and we are uh, bringing this up to, in general, talk about um, uh, the legislative session and kind of just ways ways we do things or, or ways to do things as well as uh, um, uh, one particular piece of legislation that we'll talk about. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Chris right now. Okay. So uh, first thing it says that you know there's one particular particular subject I'd like to speak to, but in the you know in the past um, any of the county commission who has an interest or a concern or would like to support or oppose or whatever any bill you know, through the legislative sessions, we'll keep bringing these things back up. Um, the, the point is to, on the big important issues, to try to get a majority opinion of the commission. And the reason for that is that uh, then, you know, you can go to the state legislature and say, Grand County Commission supports whatever. Um, it doesn't stop you personally from supporting whatever you want, you know, um, but you just have to, you know, or we encourage you to, if your opinion differs from the majority or the county commission has taken no position on it. just you know clarify that this is just your opinion you're representing your constituents you know as you see fit etc so just wanted to, to to cover that and i don't want to necessarily you know uh take over this whole conversation if anybody else has any other legislative concerns to bring up feel free you know Anything right. so far, or should I launch into the? Uh, uh, I, I think go ahead and launch into your uh, topic, okay. Chris, unless anyone else wants to. So yeah, um, we did meet with Representative Lyman, and he indicated that he was interested in repealing uh, HB two forty seven from twenty twenty one, and that's the uh, bill that we worked with Representative Albrecht on <clears throat> pertaining to TRT. At that point, he did. Uh, 
indicate that he was looking to repeal all the provisions of HB 247 and uh, did send a uh, sort of a uh, highlighted version of HB 247 showing the targeted provisions uh, that he was thinking of repealing. He hasn't got a draft bill yet, so we don't actually have any language. Uh, he, he did indicate that he's working with others on language, so um, but I haven't seen it yet. <clears throat> so I'm just going to proceed according to the information that we have, which is that he's interested in repealing the provisions of House Bill 247 from 2021. So I'll just go over those things now. Um, one of the big changes was that there was a, a shift in the percentage uh, between uh, tourism uh, promotion, recreation promotion, film and conventions, which is sort of one side of the transient room tax and then impact mitigation, which is the other side uh, by, of 10% shift. So it went from being a 47-53 split to a 37-63 split. The 63% right now is the impact mitigation side. So on that side of things would, would be what would uh, be affected with the repeal. And so that 10% um, is of the total TRT budget. And that represents, uh, at this point, as we have it budgeted about 830,000. And that's, you know, projecting 0% growth in TRT this year. So if there is growth, then it could be, you know, represent even more than that. <clears throat> and so with 6% growth, which is, you know, somewhat nominal, you know, pre-COVID, we, you know, we were around 6 to 8 9% growth. And so with 6%, it would be about 872,000 for 2023. And then, you know, if the same were to apply to 2024, we'd be up over 900. Um, so as it stands right now, uh, that particular pot of money goes to predominantly to law enforcement, <clears throat> secondarily to search and rescue. Uh, there is a contribution to the museum across the street here and also to solid waste. So those are the four things that that money goes to right now. Um, Is it to EMS or anything? No. <clears throat> EMS right now is funded by the healthcare sales tax and uh, That's right. maybe mineral lease too. Can't remember, PILT, I think. We'd have to look that up. But no TRT to EMS. Uh, the airport's also eligible to receive that money. Um, I bring that up because uh, future expansion of the airport is somewhat dependent on you know us coming up with significant match money we have to pay 10 percent of these projects and so we've got a few really big price tag projects on the horizon and we'd have to come up with a 10 percent match for those it's going to end up being in the hundreds of thousands of dollars so you know this this is certainly a, a pot of money that we could use for air, airport expansion um, the other issue with airport expansion is that we're very close to having to uh, staff that 24 seven with the law enforcement officer, according to the sheriff's department. Or, or two, wasn't it, Chris? Well, it has to be staffed 24 seven with a law enforcement okay. officer. So, Great, right, around the clock. Um, I think the, the sheriff determines that would require about two additional deputies. Of course, they wouldn't be working together, but it would be, it would be working Great. into the schedule. Got it. Yep. And so, um, you know, the, if this were repealed, um, you know, we'd be looking at a reduction in our general fund budget specific to law enforcement, search and rescue, museum, and or solid waste at this point of about eight, at least 830000 you know, possibly more, depending on how much t transient room tax grows. That's really huge. I mean, it's it would be catastrophic, really, to the sheriff's department if, if we had to make all those cuts from from. Uh, the sheriff's department and search and rescue you know if it did happen we wouldn't be able to do anything about it this year except for uh make cuts and pull money from savings to make up the shortfall um that much money you know that would probably be like six deputies we'd have to cut out of the budget <clears throat> which i don't think is really feasible um so really a major implication there with that particular um component being repealed um it could, you know, also, like I say, cause us to have to put on hold airport expansion projects um, because that's a pre predominant funding mechanism for them, not to mention just the general cuts in budget. Um, you know, from my perspective, losing, you know, $900,000 from our general fund budget, I don't really see how we could proceed, you know, without initial, you know, immediately launching into a property tax increase, which is, you know, tragic in my mind. 
And uh, over the years, you know, I've employed the strategy of using tourism taxes, you know, as much as possible to pay for these services. And we've been very effective at it. So this would be a big step backwards that way, you know, and so the it would be a, a shift where the tourists are paying, you know, a sizable chunk of law enforcement and search and rescue. Uh, and if this is repealed, the only avenue to reclaim that money is a property tax increase, you know, which is going to hit the locals, you know, harder. Uh, certainly, you know, very few people in town pay transient room tax, you know, unless they rent a hotel room here for some reason. So that tax is almost entirely tourism funded. And it certainly makes a lot of sense to, you know, use that money that way. And that's, you know, the, the point and purpose of it, you know, when we ran the legislation uh, in 2021 and it passed the House and Senate unanimously. Uh, so that's that's one major component there. Did anybody have any questions on that before I move on? Uh, so the next one is uh, the diversification program. So uh, HB 247 allows us to uh, use up to one third of the 37% that goes to, to tourism promotion, rec, film and conventions uh, for economic diversification activities which are defined in statute as uh, activities that are re reasonably similar to Go Utah uh, economic development activities. And so, you know, this whole program is designed to provide locals with a wide variety of small business assistance uh, needs. Uh, additionally, we've entered into an agreement with USU and small or SBDC Utah uh, to establish in Grand County a small business resource development center. We don't have one right now. And so it was pretty exciting to be able to engage with USU and SBDC Utah to get a small business resource development center in Grant County. Uh, the funding for that, however, is coming through this diversification program. So, you know, if this were repealed, that would be a casualty that SBDC center would be a casualty of the, the repeal. Um, you know, and also uh, thus far, we've had the Star Grant program and some other programs. We, you, we were talking about launching a revolving loan fund, you know, free business classes uh, associated with uh, some of these applications, et cetera. August and Ben are here. They can discuss this a little bit more. Um, Representative Lyman brought up that he's received complaints um, that the process for selecting, you know, at, uh, awards for the Star Grant uh, was was essentially corrupt, you know, that they, um, that it was the result of favoritism and bias and, but you know, potential conflicts of interest. And so, um, to my knowledge, that's not true at all. You know, we have a, we have a board, you know, that's diverse, the economic, uh, I can't remember the acronym these days, but uh, August can go into that in a little bit more detail and I'll have him speak here uh, in a minute. <clears throat> So, you know, if this were repealed, it'd be most likely that this might be you have to be used for tourism promotion, you know, which means that we'd be going from a situation where we're using our resources to help locals directly, you know, this money, which is about a million dollars a year, uh, would be going directly towards small business owners who live in Grand County. Um, it's, it's likely that if this were repealed, that we would be required to spend that money out of the state and, and out of the country, you know, for tourism promotion. So, you know, there's that issue. Um, part of the reason, you know, for coming up with this diversification program is to establish, better establish a year-round economy in Grand County um, by trying to foster industry that's not seasonal by nature and is year-round intrinsically. Um, I think that I've seen a lot of diminishing returns over the years and trying and trying and trying, you know, to uh, establish a year around economy using tourism only. Uh, it's worth noting that even with HB 247 passed, our, the tourism promotion component of our economic development budget is still the biggest single component of our economic development budget. <clears throat> and so we continue to do tourism promotion, but, you know, it's debatable, you know, how much we can gain, especially in the wintertime and when it's 100 degrees outside every day, you know, without a, uh, a ski resort here. 
you know, and a big resort that can process thousands of people a day. Um, you know, there's some gains that can be made, but, uh, you know, how sizable are they in, in, re in reality? And so this was an attempt to begin to foster year round, uh, you know, alternatives to tourism. Um, the other, you know, reason I uh, suggested this program, worked with Representative Albrecht on it, is uh, to provide kids and locals with, you know, a wider variety of career opportunities. Uh, you know, there's quite a few kids that grow up in, in Moab and then leave. Um, a lot of that has to do with lack of career options. So, you know, I was very interested in trying to build, you know, other industries, other types of jobs, so that if a kid want to stay uh, where he's born and raised, uh, that he'd have some, you know, alternative or option that way. Um, I also feel like a lack of diversification is contributing, you know, to a lot of our quality of life issues. Affordable housing is greatly exacerbated, exacerbated by it. Um, you know, all the the issues that we're going to be dealing with constantly, you know, noise, impacts to the backcountry, uh, vandalism, trash, poop everywhere, et cetera. You know, all these things are also related to a lack of diversification. Um, and so, you know, I think that ultimately uh, a, a robust, diversified economy would solve some of these problems or help to solve them. Um, so, you know, that's sort of my my vision of why I worked with Representative Albrecht on establishing uh, this diversification program. And uh, I would just like August or Ben to kind of give a, a quick overview of how, how the Star Grant program works, who's on the, the committee, the selection committee, how that process works. Uh, like I say, I mean, the, the accusations that it's a, a corrupt program, you know, I think there's no merit to that. And so I'd certainly, you know, like August to kind of cover that, but also just suggest, you know, that anybody that has concerns that we set up a meeting, we'll go through the program with a fine tooth comb and a microscope and we'll evaluate, you know, is there any uh, impropriety occurring in this program? You know, I'm not afraid of that. And so I think that we could do that. We could certainly go through that process. August, you want to take it? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> I think a lot of the commissioners will be very familiar with what I'm presenting um, uh, as we kind of had a lot of meetings on this subject as we were developing this program, but just want to provide kind of a high level overview of how it went um, and how the process worked um, this past year. So um, I think a little bit of background, obviously, Ben and I were hired in March of 2021 um, to, to pick up on the new funding that was created by HB 247. Um, we spent much of that year working with the Economic Diversification Advisory Council to identify strategic priorities and, and where to spend that money. Um, at the end of 2021, it became clear that, that um, some kind of business expansion program um, that would move quickly um, given the sunset period with that, um, which with HB 247, would be the way to go, at least for 2022. Um, and then second would be developing a strategic planning process. Um, and so, you know, we had considered various formats for that grant program, but ultimately creating a, a well-defined program that would be run as a grant rather than a loan fund um, for getting something off the ground, figuring out what needs are, what opportunities are in the community, um, and trying to get these resources moving as, as quickly as possible with good oversight. Um, so all this contextually is that moving forward, we have lots of really great um, ideas and, and looking forward to fine tuning, you know, all of the above um, with regards to the economic diversification strategy. So the STAR grant at a big picture aims to support projects to sustainably raise wages or lower the cost of living for Grand County workers. Provided with free capital, businesses should be able to invest in improvements that boost productivity. The resulting increased profits can then be invested in workforce opportunities and retention. Um, these are the, this, this program was based off of um, the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunities, present and past Center for Rural Development Programs, specifically the Rural County Grant Program, um, which gives uh, county economic developers a fair amount of latitude to spend state dollars on economic development projects for workforce development, um, business expansion, retention, and infra infrastructure development. 
um, the Rural Employment Development Incentive and the Rural Fast Track Program, with, which both provided um, uh, incentives to businesses in rural areas to do job creation via um, uh, increasing productive capacity or um, a post-performance incentive for creating new jobs. So slightly different flavors and mechanisms, but uh, very similar programs. Um, the main um, kind of priority as prioritized by the, the Economic Diversification Advisory Council that is now um, the Economic Development Advisory Board combined um, encouraged um, applications that included types of activities um, such as acquiring a larger or new production or commercial space, offsetting housing costs such as renting a room for an employee, training workers in new skills and raising their wages as a result, creating new streams of revenue such as establishing e-commerce for a local artisan. Um, just put, put in here a, a timeline of how the kind of development and public um, processes took place. Um, in November of 21, the, the EDAC, um, Economic Diversification Advisory Council, did a, a business expansion grant design workshop. Um, we worked with planning and zoning to hold a public engagement workshop and information center at the Grand Center in, in, in uh, November of that year. We did a community feedback session at the Canyonlands Business Summit um, to try to, to kind of float the idea to the public and get feedback on how it could be improved. One of the biggest takeaways from this was concerns of how to kind of create checks and balances around um, uh, who is choosing to the, which programs to give um, money to, which led to the creation of the scoring committee that we'll speak about in a minute. We met with the Grand County Commission in March um, to go over the priorities for our department um, and the design of the grant. We opened a Google survey for comments on the grant design and opened that to the public, um, received 15 responses. We engaged um, with the land use planning workshop um, at Sun Court in March and handed out a one, one pager that had information on the grant programs. Um, spoke on KZMU to discuss the grant programs, how people could engage, go to grant workshops. We had two workshops, one at the Grand Center, one at the MARC, um, to try to uh, make sure that folks would be able to ask questions. We could refine the program at that point, maybe to make sure that people A, knew about it, could apply, and could get feedback. Um, we, uh, at the Grand County Commission in um, April of last year, there was discussion and approval of the program where the county officially um, uh, ratified the program summary and proposal and, and contents. Uh, and then starting in June throughout the summer, we moved into a phase of publicization and um, you know, information and, and grant kind of application assistance. Uh, ben recorded a how to apply webinar um, and that was on our website. We had several open hours sessions at USU Moab with our SBDC representative down in Blanding, Megan McFall, who helped us, you know, walk folks through the grant application in case they've never done a grant application before. Um, and then we changed into the next phase, which was scoring. So the, the scoring committee met twice in September, 2022. Um, I shall scroll down to just who the folks were on. So the scoring committee as defined by the program proposal, um, had one Grand County Commissioner, it was Jacques Hadler, one Moab City Representative, Ben Billingsley, um, one Grand County Community Nonprofit Representative, so Jen Sadoff from the hospital participated, one Grand County Community Business Representative, so Shaley Bryant from Edward Jones um, in the chamber participated, and then one State of Utah Representative, so we had Elvon Farrell um, from the Economic Development Corporation of Utah. Really wanted to make sure it was rounded out, had various perspectives, um, mostly community, but then had some economic development expertise in there too. Um, so what happened is we re received 48 total um, applications to the, to the STAR grant. Um, we have a full complete list here. I'm not gonna go through them in, in its entirety. Um, and we, we created a handbook for scoring. So let's pull that up. But basically, this is what the scoring committee received, a 10-page handbook that described the program, had the program proposal, um, uh, clarified um, what we were focusing on, you know, at a big picture, which was economic diversification, 
as defined as follows. Um, economic development that supports a sustainable, livable, and resilient Grand County, sustainable in that we actively protect our public lands and preserve our community's natural resources, livable in that we support the creation of year-round high-paying jobs in a community that offers a high quality of life and economic mobility, and resilient in that we foster a diverse mix of industries that can withstand an array of economic shock, shocks. Um, you had to have local hey, ownership. Yes. Hey, sorry, I just want to I just want to add something to make sure it's not lost on folks, especially if Jacques is kind of um, scratching his head at this. But in addition to this handbook, um, the evaluators were handed 48 folders um, of applicant materials, which was no small feat to pour through. That contained um, up to three or four years worth of profit and loss statements, a budget, an application, and supplemental materials that organizations were welcome to submit um, at Infinum. Anyways, keep going. Yeah, no, good point. All, all grantees had to be locally owned, um, which we defined as either the owner or primary operator residing in Grant County or Spanish Valley region of San Juan County, or a majority of the organization's employees worked in Grant County. Um, yeah, so this is what Ben's speaking about. They had to complete the, the grant application, a full budget, three years of PLs. If they were doing construction quotes, if they were doing construction, they would need quotes. Um, they would have to have a one-on-one -on -one with our SBDC representative in Blanding, um, who's currently covering for our area because we don't have a Grand County representative, um, and actually have an active uh, business listing with the state. Um, let's let's come back here. So so what took place during those two meetings here in, in September is that those those five folks met. Um, they scored those materials. Uh, based off of the rubric in the program proposal, which is down here. Um, so to score them on the following. So uh, first, basic business health. This is a yes, no. Is the applicant a viable and established business or organization? Um, basically, applications could not move forward without a yes. Um, impact. What is the likelihood that this project will boost any of the following metrics for Grand County residents in the short term? Um, one out of 10 and defined impact as the following um, and any of the following metrics. So would this improve pay or pay rates for existing employees, benefits provided to employees, revenue or services provided, investment in workforce training, investment to offset employee living costs or creation of new high paying jobs at or above 110% of the county median wage or at or above 110% of the industry median wage. Um, diversification, does the project or business meet the county's diversification goals of sustainability, livability, and resilience? One of the 10 points. Feasibility and duration, how achievable is this? Does the reviewing committee member foresee the potential impacts of this project extending into the future? You know, we didn't want to see um, a one-off grant of $30,000 simply covering the wages of a new employee um, because that's not going to have a lasting impact, right? And then uh, one to five, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Does the organization engage underserved or minority populations? Does the organization encourage a diverse and accepting environment within the organization and or within the region? Is the organization owned or operated by, or does the organization employ or significantly serve the following communities? Women are non-binary, LGBTQ+, minority races and ethnicities, individuals with disabilities and veterans. So basically every... Um, of every one of those five um, members subjectively reviewed each application, so 48 applications, and assigned a score to each of those categories, which was then summed up for each applicant or for each reviewer, and then averaged across all five reviewers. So that on average, there was a total score that was you know, a quantitative um, summary of, of qualitative subjective interpretation. And then from there, um, went to look at the, the requested amount, how much money we had to give, um, and provided an award proposal to the county commission for their review. Um, it should be noted that originally the program budget was about a half million dollars, but um, in the fall, uh, the county uh, voted to pull another half million from reserves to add to the program so that there's about a million dollars. And then additionally, the Economic Development Advisory Board um, had some funding left from the Royal County Grant Program um, that they contributed about forty thousand um, dollars to ensure that of these existing applications, um, workforce housing. There was an additional forty thousand for some workforce housing that came out of the application pool. 
um, what came out of that and what was considered and after discussion um, approved by the county commission uh, was 35 awardees uh, receiving a total of a million, one million eleven thousand one hundred and sixty. Um, this is the full full list here of applicants um, and their awards. This is publicly available during those county commission meetings, but I wanted to bring it up for full reference. If there's any concerns or questions, on um, and I, I can't remember August what the second commission meeting was in October. But if folks want to go back and look at the documents from when these uh, grants were approved, because they are done in two cohorts, it was the second regular commission meeting in October and the first in November, which I think was November 1st. Thanks, Ben. At a high level, um, no awardee received less than 20% of their request. So if it was uh, basically saying that no, no awardee came away with pennies. If, if, if you were awarded, you were considered to have a quality application and you should get some significant funding. Um, 14 awarded projects proposed significant infrastructure, construction, or modifications, totaling $576,000. Six awarded projects proposed support for workforce housing, totaling $258,000. 12 awarded projects proposed hiring at least one new employee, totaling $240,000. And 28 projects awarded proposed local collaboration, totaling $826,000. Um, these don't add up because there's some crossover. Uh, we tried to go the extra mile in this program uh, to provide feedback to all applicants, regardless if they are awarded or not, um, with a uh, feedback document. I don't want to, um, this is an actual awardee here, but just for a high level, we provided this score where they ranked within all of the applications in a high level of what um, evaluators uh, recommended. So we had we had some great uh, feedback and transparency with all of the um, applicants um, so that they could improve in the future if they were not awarded. Um, and kind of moving forward, um, the grant has a reporting requirement. So we distribute this on a 90-10 basis as approved by the kind of commission and the program summary. So 90% of the award was distributed upon award. And then upon completion of reporting requirements, they're eligible to receive the last 10%. Um, right now, um, we are having folks fill out an initial survey. Um, they'll have to, they'll be required to complete that, that survey um, two years worth of SBD surveys. Um, and um, when they complete the, the, the final report of their project, they'll get that 10%. Um, going forward, I think we've learned a lot from this program, um, what the needs are in the community amongst the businesses, um, you know, where we can, where we maybe should be more narrow and focused in terms of what is economic diversification, what are our strategies and priorities. Um, and and maybe moving beyond the grant structure to more of a rotating loan fund to ensure that this funding stays in the community in the long run. Um, and you know, there's all reasons why um, we started here and moving forward, really excited to see what the future of this program looks like um, if, if it's continued to be funded. Um, that's my, my spiel. Great. Thank, thank you, August. And I, and I was on that board, like August said, I, I think all five members of that board um, were, were super professional, went out of their way to avoid any conflicts or, or quote, corruption or anything of the sort. Um, it was a ton of homework to do. Uh, it was at least a solid full-time week's worth of work to, to get through that. And um, I, I think it was well put together and I'd stand by any of that work that was done by any of the five of us. Can we ask questions now or make comments or, uh, or uh, no? Yeah, well, or you uh, just wanted to do? I mean, just to wrap up okay. with something that's fairly important, although a bit touchy. Um, Representative Lyman, you know, he did kind of indicate that this is a punitive action. Um, and that he felt that, you know, um, Grant County has been unduly involved in San Juan County politics. Um, you know, that this organization has been infiltrated by SUA and the Rural Utah Project, you know. Um, I've been involved with almost every aspect of county government and going back 16 years, and I've seen no evidence of that at all. Uh, and so you're all aware that we're under legislative audit right now. 
uh, as ordered by the state legislature to look into these things. Um, so I today I called Jesse Martinson, who's the audit manager uh, <clears throat> for the state legislature. And I just asked him that question straight up. I said, all right, you're doing this audit. Uh, have you found any evidence at all that there are, that sewer or the rural Utah projects has infiltrated Grand County government or that Grand County government has been involved at all in San Juan County politics or operations? And he said, no, just flat out. We have not found any evidence of that. And I've never seen any evidence of that either. So, you know, this is a pretty serious misinformation campaign, you know, that's that's potentially going to cause a lot of harm to Grand County, you know, um, if if the component uh, that 10% mitigation split goes back to the way it was before, you know, and we had forced into a property tax increase, you know, that's going to harm everybody in the county, liberal and conservative alike, you know, and it's the furthest thing that I want to have to do. Um, but I don't know how, you know, we could continue on and keep the uh, sheriff's department and search and rescue running with a $900,000 deficit. I mean, that's just too much. Um, and, you know, the, you know, Representative Lyman said he didn't hear any concerns about the Grand County economy, but I do think that there are some, you know, and that may be the motivation for, for who's ever, you know, pushing this legislation. But like I, like I showed, you know, there aren't really any statistics that show that Grand County's overall economy is doing poorly. In fact, we're, you know, we're in the biggest growth spurt we've ever had since we uh, started collecting TRT. Um, it, you know, and it's fairly obvious looking around town how much the town has grown. So, you know, to me, it, this would be a huge loss and it feels like it's punitive, you know, like uh, it's being acted upon, you know, because somebody thinks that the economic diversification program is corrupt, you know, and you heard just how, uh, you know, robust we made that program to avoid exactly that kind of thing. And that, you know, we're the the government itself is corrupt and infiltrated by outside interests, which likewise is not true. So, you know, to me, you know, it would be a real tragedy right. if that mis misinformation harmed the county and harmed the diversification program as, as it would if this legislation were repealed. You know, so that's why I'm proposing that we make a motion, you know, to oppose uh, the amendment or repeal of, of the provisions of HB 247 and stake that position. You know, I've reached out to a lot of different people. USU is going to contact me with their legislative advisory uh, council because they have an interest in continuing on with this small business resource development center. You know, Jameson's uh, also, you know, working hard. He's going to go to the Sheriff's Association, you know, which will then bounce back to UAC. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty heavy duty. I, you know, I can't hardly think of another a uh, bit of state legislation that could be more harmful. Well said, Chris. Um, and, and for the new commissioners, we have in the past a uh, couple of years um, at various meetings during the legislative session um, supported or opposed bills. So we we bills were brought up, and we would um, we'd vote to to oppose or approve the bills as a county, basically to comment as a county that we approve or oppose. So this isn't anything new. Um, and we'll be doing that throughout the course of this session, too, I imagine, uh, as things come up. You know, obviously, bills drop at different times, um, and, uh, and that'll, that'll be something to discuss at each meeting after this until the end of the session, what, what we will support and what we won't. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, if the bill gets enrolled, you know, I expect it won't be... A, uh, a repeal as, a, as originally communicated. It'll probably be, you know, some type of amendment. We'll have to, you know, address that when it happens. Uh, at this point, we don't have any language though. And so we're, you know, operating on the information that I've given you and that Representative Lyman's given me. Um, but at this point, you know, given that information, I think we just have to, you know, oppose that, um, that proposal. And that's my opinion. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Go ahead. Do you, you know how much traction the bill has or is, is this something that's serious or idle or? Well, Representative Lyman indicated it's not one of his priority bills, but he also indicated that it has widespread support. Um, and so, 
you know, I don't know what that means. Um, but uh, it's serious for us any which way. Yeah, yeah and I mean, like I said, I think yeah. that it's largely pre punitive and predicated on, you know, the concept that, that we're corrupt somehow. Right. Mike, go ahead. Uh, in his speaking, uh, I wasn't privy to the meeting, uh, but in his speaking was, is the bill looking towards, uh, like you said, there's a certain uh, percentage split. Uh, is the bill looking to redefine redefine uh, part of that percentage to each point or pick and choose, like uh, cherry pick what, what, what is in, that's what certainly in wanted out? Yeah, I think that that's probably what will happen. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, we don't know what that cherry picking is going to look like. Yeah, yet. that's what we don't know. Mary? When I originally talked, heard about this and talked to Lyman, he, he, his saying was he was going to just take it back to where it used to be, which would be very damaging. Okay. Now, I think after our meeting, maybe that won't happen, but it has a sunset of five years. We've only had it for two years, and so you haven't even had an opportunity to prove that it works or it doesn't work. Right. And, yeah, that, that's a great point, Mary. Yeah. And so yeah. let's, you know, give us the five, you know, I told, asked him, I said, give us the five years to find out if it works or if it doesn't work. I did ask him, I respectfully asked him to just drop the bill. But he wouldn't. And, you know, and, and it's a shame because a lot of this has come about because of some fairly heavy duty efforts to undermine uh, the commission and the people that work here. Very cert asserted effort was put forth. And has come to bite us in But yeah, I, I did fail to mention that the diversification component only has a five-year sunset. So if it, uh, you know, I think at the end of 2026, it would expire if not reauthorized by the state legislature. Yes, we can prove. Okay, so the sunset is just on the diversity. It's not on the actual not, uh, percentage split. It's, it's it, I mean, it's, it's all transient room tasks. <laughs> yeah. How we can spend it, and so the, split, the allow yeah. the allowance to spend up, you know, the allowance to spend the diversification money would go away after five years if the state legislature doesn't reauthorize it. Okay. And so Thank normally you. there's a committee that's formed, and that committee would evaluate it, you know, and certainly would go and uh, testify at that committee. Then that committee would make a recommendation to the state legislature about, you know, reauthorization of, the, of that particular provision of statute. And if it, you know, if it doesn't get reauthorized, um, then we would no longer have the ability to use transient room tax money for economic diversification activities. Thank you. The small business resource center would go would go away. Yeah. Yeah, Bill. I think it's clear that the impacts of repealing this bill would cause hardships in this county. Um, from what I understood from Mr. Lyman was that he's not in a hurry to do it, and he would like to leave control in the hands of the county but his biggest complaint was the perception. And Mary, I'm not sure what undermining you're referring to or what's going on there. And I would hope that's not pointed around this table, but there was a huge amount of misconception going on through the whole campaign process. And there's many people that in the business community, as well as citizens that didn't like the way this looked. And when you go then to talk to the involvement that he mentioned in the politics in San Juan County, there's enough proof out there that they called an audit, that there was an involvement in the San Juan County politics by SUA or RUP or whoever it is that you refer to there. So, that's ongoing and it was coming out of Grand County with some of the influence to the South. So I, I'm not here to argue any of that. I, what I would suggest is what we already did was start with Mr. Lyman, but rather than send a signal as 
Grand County has in the past occasionally sent a signal to the state that they don't like what they're doing up there. I would far rather suggest that we sit down with the state oh, and yeah, some yeah. one-on-ones rather than, I, I mean, we can even go back to the cartoon caricatures that were made about some of our leaders by the previous county attorney. And that doesn't sit well. That's not the kind of communication that we want to send up to the state at this point, I would think. I really think continuing to work with Phil and with Mr. Albrecht on a one-on-one -on -one basis would have far more value. Oh, well, I agree. But, you know, that's in addition to establishing a position. Um, you know, and I think that they would expect us to establish a position. I don't think that, you know, that would... No. And, and I'm not saying we yeah. shouldn't establish yeah. a decision. I think that we just need to be very careful with the language that we use regarding I, our state leaders. I 100% agree with you. Yeah. It, it takes a it takes effort, you know, to get a really good relationship going. You know, I, 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 I thought agree. we made good ground with Phil. Was my impression. I mean. No, yeah, I mean, I you, and I think it, you know it's certainly a, a cordial and respectful conversation, um, but he certainly didn't, didn't acquiesce either. And you know, uh, I'm just trying to, you know, we we have to make the arguments that we can make, and he, I think he'll be fine with that. You know, as he suggested, he, you know, he said it'd be fine. You know, I said that you know we'd have to go to the mat over this, and he said, yeah, that's fine. And I said, yeah, it's fine. You know, we'll we'll go that route. And I, it's not you know a matter of like uh, you know um embittered relations it's just a matter of how these how these things work you know they're sometimes adversarial by nature but you know we'll act professionally and i believe so will they so yeah you know and i i certainly think that um we will want to go up and, and uh, continue to work with our state legislatures and once it hits committee we we'll want to go up and talk to the committee members that are going to be voting to pass it forward or not and uh and all that kind of stuff you know and so but th you know yeah these actions of taking positions you know enable us to go and, and say that the commission the grand county commission supports this uh as opposed to it being just you know one of our personal opinions <laughs> agreed i just think addressing it with poor diplomacy isn't isn't the way to go about it at this point i think we need to be as respectful as possible and try and yeah, work something out with them rather than throwing up our arms and starting another argument somewhere. No, yeah, I agree. You have to have foresight, but that's what my uh, cherry picking. Uh, I would hope we would have the ability to, do if the general want is is to revert back to what it was. Uh, with that, I mean, open dialogue. We would have the the ability to influence the the cherry picking uh, I mean, yeah. of course yeah, yeah. i i wanted sexual services but i mean i uh, i would i would hope that in speaking openly or in the in that meeting it was spoken about be like oh, we're willing to work or yeah. give and take yeah and i think you know um we we may end up yeah negotiating yeah. the uh the least harmful right. outcome mm -hmm. Well, and I wonder, um, I know Stevens had as much exposure as anybody in this room in front of certainly more in the line of judges, but with the state. And I just wonder if there's any value or connections that Stephen has that would be of use up at the state level as well. I mean, I, I haven't gone up to the state in many capacities. Um, I mean, I've, I've had... I have a relationship with some individuals through through UAC with the attorneys there, um, but I, you know, I don't have a big political following in the state. I'm just a county attorney. But if there's something that I can do to to help out, um, I do have an interest of going to the state because I've never been to the state capitol during the legislative session. Um, I find that to be interesting. Um, I'm happy to help in any way that I can. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, to keep the, I, I think, I think it's been a great discussion. We, I, uh, I applaud Representative Lyman's um, coming up here and meeting with us. He didn't have to do that. And that was, that was great. And I, I feel like we made progress at the meeting and, and we, uh, he listened to us, which is, um, 
which is great too. And I respect Mr. Lyman. And but I'd also think uh, that I'd entertain a motion on uh, an opinion on this particular uh, legislation. I move to approve Grand County's opposition for repealing or amending House Bill 247. I'll second that. All right, I have a, a motion to um, oppose repealing or amending HB 247 by Commissioner McGann and a second by Commissioner Hedin. Um, and, I, and this is, I think this is common conversation that we'll be having during the course of the legislative session, just to make the uh, commission's, yeah, to make the uh, commission's position clear. There's, no, I don't think there's it's anything out of the ordinary or you know, it's disrespectful. I just want to reiterate Chris's point that you know, legislation such as this will hurt every single one of us, every single one of us. Yeah. So, you know, we, we need to look deep inside the impacts of this and it's going to affect you. It's going to affect me. I'm going to pay more taxes. I'm not going to have um, the security that I currently have with the sheriff's department. It's going to affect you know, people like Mark Antonuccio, who, who got one of those grants to expand his business. You know, some of that really hit home with me. I'm in the jails a couple times a week. I'm working with those jailers. I know how hard they work. I know what a hard job they have. And I I do not want to see the sheriff's department take a hit like that. I'm having a really hard time not getting really emotional about this. Yeah. And to speak to Bill's point, I think um, continuing conversations are going to be entirely necessary. And I think we're, we're uh, ready for, for that That's discussion what, going in the future. In, in, it's hard. I don't want to oppose because uh, it is going to affect every one of us. Uh, but I, I would. It's going to show direct opposition. And I, I want to show that openness to, I mean, to work together. Yeah. If it's coming down the pipeline, let's work together on it. Yeah. And I want to show that. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mary? And when you take a position on, for or against a bill, and you often, we all, you have to, then you get, you know, we've many times gone up and talked to, at the committees mm -hmm. and spoken in favor or in opposition. That's how we worked really hard to get the state park. We worked really hard to get certain things done, and we worked very hard on getting this. And uh, we have, I think, I know Chris and I, myself, and I have a really good relationship with a lot of people up at the Capitol and the governor's office. Yeah, I mean, taking an initial position doesn't preempt negotiation. Um, and it's pretty common. I mean, it's like one of the, this time of year, whoever the <clears throat> UAC representative is, you know, UAC's going to have a bunch of bills that hit their slate and they do the same thing. They, they have votes, you know, you know yes. do support, oppose, or run neutral. And That's so, you know, it's just how it happens, you know, but it doesn't preempt, you know, or preclude ultimately any, um, the, you know, negotiation down the line. But it is fairly typical practice, you know, okay. from any, everybody that's, you know, involved in, in legislation. Yeah. And so, like I said, I don't think that it's going to be seen as unduly adversarial. That's what, that's my, uh, was an early perception. I didn't want to draw that hard line. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but you have to roll Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. You have to just kind of roll with it as it comes. You know, we haven't seen any, any language yet. So we, you know, once we see the language, then, you know, we'll have comments and we'll uh, yeah, continue we'll on, you know, and, and we'll, talk about that at the next commission meeting or whenever it gets enrolled, you know, or we see language. I asked Representative Lyman to keep us in the loop. And so hopefully we'll, you know. So we've done this a lot. We did it with uh, vouchers through the, you know, we did it with, uh, you know, in opposition to that. We did, uh, we worked really hard. They were trying to make it so that our size of county had to have a three person commission and we could have any other thing. We worked really hard and defeated that. So we've, you know, I, I think we have a good relationship with many people up there. At least I do. Yeah, but I'm, I'm in favor of the motion and I, I'm ready to vote on it. But I just think this speaks to the fact that we're given a duty and a responsibility up here as professionals and the perception 
even if it's incorrect, is something that we need to be aware of and watch for that we've got a responsibility for our district and for our citizens. So yeah, absolutely. Any other discussion? I'd call for a vote on the motion. Um, all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand, say aye. Aye. Uh, is Kevin still on? Um, yeah, I vote yes. Okay, and all opposed. Okay, the motion passes six to one with uh, Commissioner McCurdy in opposition. Um, uh, it, it doesn't look like it. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Oh, the capital for group. Oh, yeah. Maybe I'll explain uh, that. Is it yeah. coming up soon? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, great. Thanks, everybody. That was, yeah, that was a positive discussion. I appreciate it. Um, we're on to agenda item nine, approving agreements between Redtail Jet Center uh, LLC and the airport. Uh, I would entertain a motion to postpone. So moved. Thank you. Second, uh, oh, I have a motion by Commissioner uh, Clapper to postpone and a second by Commissioner McGann. Um, we've been given a heads up that this wasn't ready, so this is just procedural. Uh, all those in favor of postponing, raise your hand. Kevin? Um, I vote yes. Uh, motion passes uh, seven to nothing to postpone. Uh, we're up to agenda item 10, approving 2023 capital you know what, actually, I'm gonna walk back. I didn't give a citizens to be heard at six o'clock. And I very much apologize if there's anyone who's been waiting for an hour, um, I would call you forward right now. Uh, Sana? Hi, One is a safety issue. Um, a property in Thompson is across the street from the Grand County Park. Uh, and it's dirt, and I've noticed that there's some benches and uh, there's a, a rock benches, mm -hmm. and there's a couple of them that are tilted, and the ground is really, really wet up there. There's some garbage areas, places to put in the garbage, and I'm noticing some dogs underneath there catching some of the food garbage or whatever that's blown out of the garbage cans. Hate to see the dog get squashed. Um, so I don't know who is in charge of parks in Grand County or, you know, in Hazen or whatever, but I think they take those big slab rocks that are probably 10 feet by three feet and they're probably this thick. Um, if they just push the ground, they have to go over. Thanks, I've yeah. taken a couple of pictures and I have them. I can maybe share with you of how it's gradually mm -hmm. tipping over and the dogs are kind of going right. eventually going to crash. Second one is um, the Thompson Visitor Center has just been closed down. And so in Thompson, there's very few opportunities to work. In Thompson, most of the people that are the workforce either work in Moab or Green River. And so with my business opening, hoping to open up, that would give more variety and opportunity for the people living in that area not to have to pay gas to travel to to, to work. Uh, and the last one is there was a conversation about, you know, if, if I get water, everybody else is going to want it. If they don't get it, then there's going to be lawsuits. I'm the only um, request for water to be turned back on at this existing building as having to pass an existing meter and has an, um, an existing bills. And it's, you don't need everywhere, every other property that is requesting water, uh, as far as I understand, there's no existing building, there's no existing meter, there's no existing water bills. Uh, the, other, the other thing too is one of the larger things that we want uh, the water access is across the railroad tracks. There's four ways to enter that property. I think they want, anywhere from 20 to 40 or lots that it's a large property and you divide it into homes or whatever. Um, and it's not all in Thompson Springs, which means it has to be annexed into a lot of paperwork before it ever gets approved for water. Um, there's four entrances to that property. 
One is across the railroad tracks, which means it's got to be a wider if they're going to have that many homes there. Um, and to try to deal with contracts with the railroad um, going across their property might be very difficult. The other one is BRM. If you've ever tried to get um, a permit or a road to get to the BLM property, it's the same thing a lot of <laughs> The other, the third entrance is through Rocky Mountain Powers property. And to get through a utility, that would be pretty difficult too. The fourth one is through private property that crosses the wash. I was going to be selling that, prop, that property to an interested party. I do have a real estate license. Um, they declined to buy it. It was sold eventually, but they declined to purchase that property because the guy was a construction worker and he said, or had his contractor says he said it's going to cost him a million dollars to put a bridge across that creek so all four entrances to that property that wants to develop that area i think it's going to be down the road a ways and i really hate to have my business have to wait because of you know somebody else's paperwork to so jump through so that's it thank you sir anyone else uh would like to be heard as a citizen to be heard. Anyone on Zoom here to be heard? Okay, we'll proceed to the uh, agenda item number 10, approving 2023 capital procurement pre-authorization list. Uh, Mallory? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, um, I don't have much to say for this one because I think we'll just go through uh, the list quickly, um, or at least questions. But what this is, is per our purchasing policy, um, something that we can have the commission approved so that items already in the approved budget don't have to go back in front of all of you um, when they're ready. It just um, is a, a process that allows for streamlining so the chair upon confirmation that it is in the approved budget at the time, can go ahead and sign um, a, a grant agreement, a purchase order, um, any of the various things you see in the list in front of you. So with that, I'd say uh, maybe it's best job just to, to dive in. Um, I don't know if you wanna go through item by item or if it's easier to say, um, are there any discussion items on the list or? Yeah. Please let's not do that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> I agree with Trish. I think if anyone has something they they like to bring up on that list, then that's the way to go about. Otherwise, we'll just uh, go with go with the items. And all these items were discussed in our budgeting. Uh, yes. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, to even to even get on the list, it has to be budgeted for already, right? <clears throat> and so. Um, so, so everything uh, on this list is already in the yeah budget. our procurement yeah. policy though requires that all purchases five thousand or over um need to be approved by the commission so this is one way of approving the you know the things that are already budgeted uh without bringing them to the commission one by one and having a, a specific agenda item um for each one um but if there's some components on here that you want to come uh, to the commission and have further discussion on, then you can pull them off. And the only thing that happens is they have to just, you know, the department head would have to create an agenda item and, and come here. I mean, part of it, the rationale too in the past is that um, when a department head has one of these agenda items, you know, they'll sit in a meeting for like three or four hours waiting for their agenda item to come up, you know, and oftentimes there are department heads uh, so they're sitting here after hours, not getting paid because they're exempt employee. You know, there's our, oh, there's our there's emergency alert. I know, I just hit too. <laughs> there's our emergency system. Thanks, Corp. So, you know, it's just a way to streamline some of the ones that are not contentious purchases or, um, you know, purchases that you don't envision needing to discuss <laughs> prior to authorizing them. But it's no big deal to take some off either if you're not comfortable with them. Anyone, uh, yeah, well, let's, everyone has the list. Uh, it's in the agenda. You have it, I have mine in front of me. Um, anyone like to bring something up? Yes, Bill. 
I've got some questions, I guess, and maybe we can just answer them here, but I don't have a total number of them, but it seems like an awful lot of them are money that's being sent out of town for contracts for the EDD department. Um, I guess my question is, we've got um, Chris, a strategic development director, August, the director of economic development and tourism, and Ben Alter, economic de development specialist. And it sure seems like we're looking for a lot of advice that we should just be able to do in house. And it's a pretty big chunk of change when you start adding them all up. I didn't put any exact numbers to, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of a half a million bucks. So I don't know, maybe. Well, I, I agree with you, actually, but, uh, you know, it's it wasn't my decision to to do that. So, well, it seems like every one of those dollars are leaving this community. That's my concern um, when we do have staff that seem competent from what I know of all of them. I have a high opinion of everybody that I've discussed and dealt with here. So that, that's just one of my concerns is that it seems like we're sending a lot of money to somebody else. Well, I'd also say, you know, that since some of the funding is, you know, possibly going to go away for some of these that, you know, it might not be a good idea to pre-authorize them. <laughs> so, uh, and I, bought, you know, I wouldn't let it go forward anyway. Uh, I've already told, you know, informed August that we probably need to freeze, you know, some of these things. But, you know, if this goes into effect in, in early May, as most legislation does, we won't have collected very much TRT by that point. And so... <clears throat> You know, we don't want to overcommit. You know, if the diversification program becomes uh, deauthorized, then you know the amount of money collected up to that point is not going to be much, and so we can't make a bunch of big commitments and sign a bunch of contracts predicated on it until we know the outcome of the of the bill. Um, so those things do make me squeamish. I mean, even if you approve them in this, I'd put a hold on them. Um, yeah. Well, and, and that just was my only point that it seems like it's money that's going away. The only other thing I had was it seems like we do an awful lot of business with enterprise. Is that something that we um, look for competitive bids on and they just happen to be the best fit for the community? Yeah. So, well, in this case, it's a, uh, a state contract. And so the, the way that that whole program is supposed to work, and we're not far enough along to, to say that it really works this way yet, but we're hoping it does, is that we get a big discount because we're a government entity on purchasing these vehicles. And so for a lot of these vehicles, not all of them, some of them you know, are specialized enough that we wouldn't turn them over. But the idea is to drive them until their, uh, their value is on parity with the market value and sell them and then get another one at a discount. And, and if it works out that way, you end up spending, you're driving basically brand new cars and spending almost no money because you're selling them. You're basically driving the discount. And then once the discount is, you know, or once their market value hits parity, then we, then we sell them uh, and, and get another one. <clears throat> and, you know, and so that's, that's the concept, you know, I, uh, it's going to take a few years. This is pretty new. It's, last year was the only, was the first year that we did this. So it's going to take a while before we really know if what enterprise was selling us is true. And, you know, and I'm always skeptical of these things. And so I'll be watching, <laughs> but uh, that's the point of them. And so um, the other difficulty, and you heard uh, Sheriff Wiggins mention it, is that uh, it's really difficult to get vehicles right now. They're not available. And oftentimes, you know, you have to, place an order months in advance and sometimes even more than a year in advance and so it makes it really difficult for cody mckinney our fleet manager to administer this program if something comes available and then you have to wait two weeks to get it on a commission agenda it's gone right you know yeah. so we can't do that <clears throat> we have to pre-authorize those uh, or we'll get nothing in this environment point taken right. so are there items on the uh that were earmarked EDD that in particular that you wanted to flag that you wanted to take off, Bill, or we could, we could no, I, I don't want to take any of them. He okay. answered it. I mean, some right. of them might be taken off automatically and some yeah. of them he's going to watch. So oh, yeah, we've got, like I said, I think we're going to have to freeze um, 
any EDD spending that's associated with the diversification program. Right. Um, and so that's just the, the nature of the position we're in right now. Well, my point was, is it just seems like we've got an awful lot of qualifications within staff. Yeah, and that's a separate subject. You know, I've talked about this quite a bit with August and Ben and others, you know. Um, I do think that it'd be valuable to have some planning done, but I also think that the budget that we've established for it is way too much. And I know that um, when you put something out to bid, they're going to ask you what your budget is, and then they're going to bid whatever your budget is. And you don't necessarily get more because your budget's bigger. So, you know, like, for instance, you know, our master planning for economic development, which includes both diversification and tourism is 150000 And, you know, that's about how much we paid for our entire general plan update. <clears throat> which is, you know, I would assume is much more comprehensive and involved. So, you know, I might almost recommend taking some of that stuff off just so we can discuss it a little more. But, you know, With, I don't uh, want to get too detailed about it. But Yeah, I, and rather than going through item by item, just with, you know, possible future legislation and that we have the joy of August joining us at most of our meetings, I would be okay with removing the EDD departments from the list. So that as, instead of going through them one by one, just kind of pull that whole departments off. I think that's probably a good idea. You so, know. so pulling everything marked department EDD on this, just, just taking it off wholesale? It's a, it is quite a few items. I mean, I'm some not, of them, I'm not well, it. some of them, it kind of depends. Like, we know tourism promotion is not going to go away. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's certain elements of these that are, you know, I don't, I don't think typical has tourism many, promotion. Like, uh, strike when the anvil's hot sort of things. Yeah. And, um, and I can appreciate taking some off, but rather than going through, item by item and saying do we just, want this one now just being able to bring it back up there yeah and some of them you know are their enterprise lease too so a wholesale do, thing would be probably do not great. ED, uh, related to uh economic diversification list with you know specifying that we'd probably have to but we name yeah. them probably, yeah. right? well you could just have uh just direct staff to pull pull them you know i'll evaluate it after the fact and pull them off. Do we need to pull them off? I mean, my point was just to ask. About yeah. Well, I think the reason to pull them off for one would be if you want to discuss them more. The further discussion, like for instance, mm -hmm. that you mentioned, you know, some of this stuff that may be able to be accomplished in house. Um, and, you know, also it's just sort of the total budget some of these things might warrant further conversation, you know, in which case um, it'd be good to bring them to the commission and not have them, you know, go forward without. Um, and so, I mean, maybe it would just, you know, you could say remove uh, EDD items that are associated with economic diversification or I guess we can, you know, maybe that's not necessary, but or just uh, strategic planning. So uh, there's I, yeah, Kevin. I, I guess I'm a, it, it sounds like this is morphing into some discussion about amending the budget or I, I mean, these are things that we've looked at and discussed um, previously when going over the budget. So I, I guess I, I know it just seems a little strange to be having that discussion about in, in the context of re revising a procurement list, or maybe I'm misunderstanding something. Yeah, but we have two new commissioners also that weren't a part of that process. Is this okay, but there's there, the budget's pretty large. So, um, Is this timely? It's um, right. postponed it sounds. Do you want to approve everything but what's on EDD 
and then we can go through the EDD items at the next meeting. I think that there's going to be certain campaigns they're probably going to have to start right away. What, what do you think of that, Chris? Yeah, that's a good idea, I think. Okay. I don't think that it's too, uh, I mean, if there's something that comes up, you know, we'll put it on the next agenda. Because like if the it's printing. not pre authorized. Right. And just for clarity, my, my, to Kevin's point, my motion or suggest, I don't know if I made a motion, a suggestion was uh, more in the case of being prepared if there was legislation that changed yeah. our budget. It wasn't directly uh you know rethinking the approved budget it's if our budget changes yeah well if yeah i mean if the legislation passes and and both major components are approved you know to be changed substantially then uh we're gonna go back to the drawing board on the budget <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's would, gonna, would that could do effect for 2023 right? Well, I don't know. It I depends mean, on when the legislation. I mean, way, normally we, the legislation would go into effect yeah. early May, but they could say it goes into effect at the end of the year or we'd January one twenty twenty four. We don't yeah. know yet. It's, go ahead, Kevin. I, I say, I, I'm not in favor of changing our spending patterns because of legislation that hasn't even been written yet. I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. You know, it, and it, all our funding sources could change, and I, I think typically there's enough transition time that. And to make so, I, I I just don't think that what we know so far means we should change how we're addressing the economic development fund. Well, we're not. We're just talking about whether or not we have these items on the pre-authorization list. Do we have we're a not, motion on the table? We don't. There's no motion. We're not taking them out of the budget. We're just taking them off the pre-authorization. They'd still come up for discussion each time the money is due to be spent. Can I ask you a quick question on this? Yes, August, please. Um, if, well, I guess this will be discussed with motions on the table. I guess my two cents on this, um, first procedurally, is that pretty much it. I think that Chris's point, um, as much as Evan points out that I am here often, uh, and Ben is too, Pretty much every single one of these, regardless of the dollar amount, takes um, several hours of prep time during the week for both of us and then several hours of our commission time. So pretty much every one of these takes at least, you know, 10 or more hours to prepare to bring to commission. So if you take that across all these programs, that's a pretty significant amount of, of time and effort. So I think that if there's questions over specific items that we don't want to pre-authorize, um, I would love to take be a little bit more scalpel oriented with that um, rather than wholesale take off <clears throat> the entirety of our budget because that would be relatively devastating to our productive time and energy as a department. Um, uh, August, I think the suggestion was just to take it off for this meeting and then bring it bring your stuff back for the okay. next meeting. So bring like a pre-authorization list just for our department at the next meeting. Yeah, and so we're not just you know ignoring you. I mean, I will say that no, I recognize the pre-authorization list started last year, and before that, we didn't have one, yeah. and we yeah. still survive. And our spending limit was like five hundred. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of time spent, I, and that's part of the reason why. Can I buy copy paper? <laughs> so anyway, I mean, I'm just you know, I think August. The idea, yeah, is to do. Take a closer look at your pre-authorization list, and then bring it back at the next meeting, and we'll and we can approve everything else besides. That's yeah, great. And, and I certainly, I certainly appreciate the time that you guys, August and Ben, spend on these items. And if, in, and as much as we can cut that down for unnecessary oversight, I think that's good. Yeah, I think just last year, my understanding is we had one shot to get pre-authorized. And there was things that I wish was on there that ended up taking hours of our time that was perhaps unnecessary. So yeah. if there's another opportunity to, to kind of get pre-authorized um, and spend more time on our department, I'd welcome that. Yeah, and I would, I would, if someone wants to make a motion, I would support that being in the motion. We make a motion to uh, approve the pre-authorized uh, pre uh, uh, list with the exception of the uh, economic development department. 
bring back the and bring back the economic development department's uh, pre-authorization list at the first meeting or the second meeting. First meeting in February. First meeting in February. So, yeah. Would that be time? Thanks. Yeah, we can look through it. I think yeah. so. Yes, I'll second that. All right. Uh, I like that. Further discussion, and that implies that it's contingent upon all purchases being within the budget at the time. Yes. Yeah, and sometimes they end up being over budget. We have to take them to you anyway. Mm -hmm. How things go nowadays. Right. Yeah, stuff goes up fast. Um, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I have a motion on the table by Commissioner McGann and a second by uh, Commissioner McCurdy. Um, all those in favor of the motion to approve uh, the entirety of the pre-authorization list with the exception of the EDD portion and to bring back the EDD portion at our next meeting. Uh, all those in favor, raise your hand, say aye. aye. Kevin? I vote yes. Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, all, all right, right. Chris. Am I, am I, am I, uh, excuse Yes. All right. I, may I? Um, yeah, go. You, we I might just, be wanting to say oh, uh, I wanted to make a motion because uh, I think uh, item number 12 is yes. going to be a lot faster than item number 11. I was going to say the same thing. Really bad for these young ladies. Yeah. I've been um, sick on them. So I, I think that's going to be pretty straightforward. Number 12. Yeah, I think that's going to be a lot of right discussion. Through. Uh, on that agenda item seven, do you need me to stick around for uh, the board nomination agenda item? Are we going to get to that today? Uh, I yes. believe we are. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, August. That's all right. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, item number 12, approving special event, tend to apply submissions for quarter three, uh, Mackenzie Daniels and Angela Book. Good evening. We are to move to approve the following events. Um, the ITAs for these events in quarter three of 2023 or to approve them with conditions. Um, these event sponsors um, were interested in holding the events in Grand County had to submit these ITAs. The special event advisory committee reviews all the ITAs and determines if the proposed event is high or low impact as per the special event ordinance. High impact ITAs are reviewed by the county commission at a quarterly meeting. The reviews are scheduled based on the quarter that the proposed event will be held. So event number one coming up in quarter number three is Pioneer Day on July 24th. It's a movie showing. Yeah, I think we, so. Oh, good. Yeah, we've already did it. Yeah. We, we did, yeah. we workshopped this for an hour and I think we came to a good uh, consensus. The only, um, Commissioner uh, Kevin Walker wasn't here before he is now. I would summarize by saying uh, we discussed some of the items. The I think the the blazer bash was the only one that we had any reticence about at all, and we decided to uh, approve everything on this Q3 list. Perfect. Is that a good uh, synopsis? Um, I, Trish, go ahead. I'm a little reticent at, uh, about the mother of all boogies, and so I'm That's not right. sure how to speak to state this and maybe you guys could reiterate it for me but if those two once the application is complete if if they can they just come go. back to commission for final approval okay that's what i would like okay okay are you want to make so that saying motion? That the conditions want to make that motion okay you got me i like it i move to approve the following special events intent to apply for the uh the third quarter of 2023 with the following conditions for the proposed events. Do I need to state the conditions? No, no, no. I, I think it'd be easier to say I, I move to approve all of the pre the events with uh, the exception of uh, Mother of All Boogies and Blazer Bash have, uh, must be brought back to the commission. Thank you. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. And thank you. Uh, thank you. A motion on the table by Commissioner McCurdy and a second by Commissioner Hedeen. It was by me. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, by Commissioner McGann. It was made the original motion and uh, Commissioner Hedeen seconded. Can you restate the motion? I move to accept all, to approve all events for this quarter 
it, with the exception with the condition that uh, the mother of mother of all boogies and the laser, right, bash. laser bash be brought back to the commission for a final approval. Can I ask a point of clarification? All of these come back before, aren't don't they all come back anyhow before prior? No, okay, it's perfect. Okay. Oh, thank God. <laughs> I thought they did also. Great. Okay. Uh, discussion. We had a uh, discussion earlier. Kevin, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, one thing I was um, curious just for the two that are coming back to be scrutinized for the, what were the issues that people were concerned about? Um, I was concerned about the mother of all boogies, like kind of the outside events that are surrounding that, if that makes sense. So like, it's not like a, just jumping out of planes. There might be disco parties in the desert, whatever it might be. I'd just like to see a more holistic view of that event. And then the blazer bash, I was just a little concerned about, we have a very short history with that event. And, and my memory was that it was, came to us like right at the last minute and that there was some issues with a business in town and them being not paying not paid um so i'd just like to see their whole their whole application yeah, yeah. And, and kevin and, yeah and what the referral agencies yeah stipulation yes thank you thank uh -huh. you and just to be clear these aren't denials no Absolutely not, Stephen. Would it would it be possible to to direct staff to follow up specifically and ask the event provider to give information about these things or to commit to giving additional information to addressing these items? Most likely, yeah. they'll be in the referral agency's recommendations. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank Great. you. Thanks. All right. Any other discussion? Seeing none, I'll um, call for uh, yeah, Kevin. You almost made it. Okay, I'm, am I un, unmuted now? Uh, you, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think as I, I wrote earlier, I, I do have concerns that, um, you know, we have a goal of diversifying the types of events we have, and if we keep approving new events that are very similar to existing events, we're never going to reach that goal. Um, so I. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I was unable to make the conversation this afternoon, but that 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 definitely does concern me. Thank you, Kevin. And I did I did read your your concerns uh, before we started the uh, workshop today too. So, yeah. What was that? The, the other thing that I was going to maybe suggest mentioning was that there were, there were events. That the commissioners went through and noted items of diversity, for example, an all women's event, an all women's right. event, focusing on different cultural activities. I can't remember the other ones right. offhand. Yes, films, music, right? Okay, um, I'll call for a vote. Uh, let's see. I have a motion by Commissioner McGann and a second by Commissioner Hedin. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. And Kevin, um, I'll I'll abstain. Okay, uh, the motion passes six to nothing with Commissioner Walker abstaining. Thank you, Angie and Mackenzie. <laughs> uh, we will come back to so Elisa and uh, let's see, approving alternative dwelling overlay intent to apply submissions, Elisa Martin planning and zoning. Short summary. Yeah, we're going to keep this short summary of our workshop earlier. We did review all eight of the ITA submissions for the alternative dwelling overlay proposals um, at our workshop at three o'clock um, today. And so the general consensus from that was that applications one, four, six, and eight identified in the staff report clearly meet the intent of the ADO ordinance and are compatible with the applicability criteria in the land use code section 4.9.2, while applications two, three, five, and seven in the staff report were less compatible with surrounding neighborhood character and existing densities, but commission members were somewhat split on whether or not to give the green light for these proposals to move forward with a full rezone application. It was noted, however, that it seemed questionable whether a vote to not approve an ITA could actually prevent someone from applying for a rezone, or if it is more like um, 
and I'm, a, I'm open to your clarification on this or interpretation that what we're kind of doing today is providing a recommendation to the developer and cautioning them based on this initial review that a rezone request may not be uh, favorably or would may not get final approval. Um, and so just to caution them if they wanted to take that risk, they ultimately could uh, pay for the application and go through that process. But I don't think we can prevent them from actually no it, right? Okay, just so I wanted to make that, that clear. Um, I also wanted to address the citizens to be heard comment earlier regarding the topic of um, capping rents um, for, for this type of housing. And Thank you. That topic yes, does get brought up often when we talk about workforce housing. And basically the answer is that because state statute prohibits a local right. jurisdiction from enacting an ordinance or resolution that would control rent, there is no legal path for the county to require caps on rental rates. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. And, and that legislation has been attempted to be to repealed, be repealed yeah. but it has died. That's right. the legislative like level. Right, yeah, so I wanted to make that. But we, but we do have occupancy restrictions. We do have right. We do, and that is yes. And so the hope would be that just by restricting the occupancy to local residents, or to make sure that they're uh, these units are occupied for at least sixty days consecutively, that that they would be kind of respecting some sort of a, a local market so, rate for rent. Yeah. Um. Also, staff made a mention of the applicability criteria, which includes considering land uses in, identified in the future land use map, both existing 2012 and the proposed future land use map update um, in terms of designating higher density residential and mixed use adjacent to existing commercial zoning. And then also within the existing um, 2012 future land use map and proposed drafts that the Spanish Trail Road commercial node is identified as a, a rural center where higher density residential and mixed use commercial would be appropriate. And lastly, just want to emphasize the applicability criteria that really comes down to weighing the need for workforce housing against the political, sorry, the potential impacts. <laughs> sorry, um, the potential impacts to neighborhood character and levels of service, such as roads and water. And that's all I have for that summary. Um, so, I don't, if you want to take it from here, Jacques, in terms of, do we want to, we probably don't want to go through every single one. Okay, no, no. Okay, no, no. And I think, I think prior we had talked about, um, kind of rubber stamping the four, uh, like approving the four, and I'm trying to pull it up right now, which, four. yeah. Uh, yeah. six and eight right yeah yeah okay i got it now yeah and then um and i think yeah and then and then uh and then discussing the other uh two three five and seven um there i i brought up maybe looking at those as, as a whole but other people i don't think were as interested in doing that um i actually think it might go faster to go through them one by one and just do a quick vote okay and um, or, or let's I make I could make a motion to approve those four, great. and then we uh, could go through the yeah. ones one by one. Great. I move to approve the following ADO intent to apply submission, sending a uh, warning to ap any applicant that didn't get. I was trying to. I, I'm sorry. I'm like, where are you going, man? <laughs> <laughs> what, what? Because we can't stop this. This this motion doesn't make sense. I move to approve the following alternative dwelling overlay intent to apply submission and allow such applicants to move forward. Maybe. We're not allowing them. Not we're giving them uh, assurance that we're pro we're going to uh, we support them. You know that they can move forward. With, help me here. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know. Because we can't stop them from doing it. That's their right. But I think we're giving them assurance, more assurance that they're 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 not going to be wasting their time. See what uh, I'm okay, to but say? you have to name the. I think you have to yeah. name them within the motion. 
Yeah, okay, but so, I'm trying to think of the word to say. Okay. I move to approve Invite the following the alternative dwelling overlay intent to apply submission. And support uh, such applicants? Uh, I think that's reasonable. Invite the applicants to move forward with the reason. Uh, 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 encourage. Okay, and encourage such applicants to move forward with the rezone full application uh, viva ADO district application. That being uh, the uh, item one, application one, four, six, and eight. You want to, you want to name them specifically? Are you okay with that? Okay, you, yeah. You want to just say in the staff report? Okay. In the staff report. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, uh, well, well, okay. We can have well, we have, we can have a discussion now. So. Oh yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I'm looking at yeah. this attachment number. And it's, okay. Yes. Well, sorry. Is that what you were looking at too? Yeah. I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. But that's, yeah. that's the, okay. You're uh, good. In the staff report. Okay. But okay. a double number. They've got numbers in front. Okay. Uh, I move uh, the uh, 1574 Murphy Lane. Uh, uh, it's 2850 South Highway 191, uh, 400 West, uh, 1069 North, 1089 North, and uh, 2380 South Highway 191. Great. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Ooh, All right. Oh, so I have a, <laughs> and, and, and Bill seconded. Okay. Yes, sir. Ooh, that's uh, so I'm glad I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I have a motion on the table to approve these four uh, intent to apply submissions by Commissioner McGann and second by Commissioner Winfield. Uh, further discussion? Mike, it looked like you had something. Uh, okay. Excellent. Um, we have workshop this. Any other discussion on this? Okay. Seeing none. I, I could be wrong, but I, I thought I heard five addresses in Mary's motion. Were there only four? Uh, no, it, it was four, Kevin. No, yeah. It was four. It okay. was. The Tyson Carroll. Yeah. None of these are rural residential. Uh, except for the uh, except 400 for, North. Uh, except right. for yeah. the 400 North. It's true. All right. I'll call for a vote on the motion. All those in favor, raise your hand. And Kevin, Commissioner Walker? I vote yes. Okay. So yes. Uh, those four pass unanimously. Um, now we will get on to the remaining four, and I'll and I'll start by saying that uh, we have used up 110 of the 150 slots. And per you know a citizen to be heard, it's feasible that we have more commercial zoning slots that could come, you know would be on the docket. And to me, that would be much more palatable to rural residential. And and yeah, we might have general. Some, you know, and it doesn't prohibit the applicants, the other applicants, from applying again. And but that might might end up being the one we think is the best. But where we have a limited number to to I, accept, I think we have to be real careful. I think that uh, the that limit that cap. Uh, really came into play to to reassure folks living in the rural residential area. And so if it were to be applied to what's currently commercial um, in the future, I would feel okay raising that cap if we had uh, quality projects come in the next round. Uh, so, so I don't see that cap as an insurmountable uh, wall myself um, to at least point of like weighing this against the need for um, workforce housing. I commend these folks who are able to jump on the ball and get on it quick and, and kind of address the, the crisis in a timely manner. With that being said, I would make a motion to include the number three Roberts Road project in the list of uh, yeah. encouraged what, what, uh, list of projects. Is there a second for approving? Uh, uh, Evan, Commissioner Clapper made a motion. If someone would like to make a second to approve. I second. Number, okay. I have a motion and a second. Um, I guess discussion? 
Who um, seconded? Um, uh, Commissioner McCurdy seconded it. Kevin. Uh, just for the sake of uh, folks who weren't in attendance at the workshop, this property abuts up to commercial property. I kind of see it as existing in that buffer zone that we are hoping to create create in a future land use map. Um, it's not far <clears throat> down a feeder road and uh, there's already a residence there that I think will uh, mitigate some of those impacts of noise and such. Uh, we could put a footnote in there to maybe lessen the number of units on there. I think that uh, the developer may have heard some of that or read that in between the lines they asked a specific question today of what's the magic number to get approval uh, we didn't have an answer for them but maybe instead of 10 units maybe it was something more like six or i don't know i don't want to throw a number out there and hold ourselves to it but um because of it abutting the storage units and um its proximity to 191 i feel like it's appropriate I'm not categorically opposed to any of these four. Um, I kind of look at them. They do. They are more in uh, residential areas. Uh, I did a site visit at the one in question, and yeah, it does. The back of it does abut the storage units, but they do have residential neighbors on both sides as well as across the street. There's there's a few neighbors, so it's it's certainly the character of it is a neighborhood. Um, when I was out and, there. And and could I make, I, if I'm yeah, go ahead, correctly, go ahead, there, there's the big transmission lines, which are at the back of that lot. So even though, you know, technically there are property abuts commercial lights, isn't it true that the buildable area where these would be located would be far from that boundary and closer to Roberts Road because of the transmission line? You can see That's, the shadow of the transmission line. Hmm. Yeah, the, the units were proposed kind of more in the center right. of the parcel. Here. So they're not backed up against, right? Interesting. Okay. And this yeah, is, so to me, this, I mean, this is not at all a transition zone. There's really no connection between the, you know, you've got commercial and then the transition zone is the transmission lines, and then you've got the residential area along Roberts Drive. Yeah, I guess my point is that we don't, that there's not transition zones that exist in the county, and that if there were to be one, this would be the location. I think it's it's very odd that it goes straight from our highest level of use to our lowest level of use with nothing in between. But I, I guess I'm saying that there is a buffer zone in between, which is the transmission line, which is sort of unbuildable. So, and I I think we might get just some applications in the future that are going to fit better. It's a pretty rural area. I have a friend that lives right across the street, and uh, it's pretty rural. They're they're not, they're, yeah. They're both Roberts and Red Cliffs are, are mm -hmm. pretty rural. Mm -hmm. Especially, yeah, Red Cliffs. It's mm -hmm. like yeah. it's. Yeah. So anyway, Should we just vote on it. Did we get a second? <laughs> I think yeah, so, yeah. Uh, is there? Are we discussing any of the other ones? We're, just uh, one I was just going one at a time so we didn't just get bogged down. And yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess I, I I apologize if this is repeating things that are already said at the workshop. Um, I, I used to live in that neighborhood, and I I do think even though it's sort of close to the highway, it, it, it's a residential area and actually surprisingly quiet. Um, and, you know, many, many runs down Roberts Drive. So. I don't live there anymore, but I know people who do. And yeah, you know, to me, this you know does fit this description of the projects that we said we didn't want to approve, which are sort of plopping down additional density in the middle of existing neighborhoods. Um, I you know I think if we're going to increase the density in areas, we should do it in the context of our general planning, not you know piecemeal. So I'm not in favor of it. And there, there. Yeah, go ahead. Raise my hand every time. If I raise my hand, I wouldn't have interrupted you. <laughs> I I uh, know that we will get a huge amount of complaints because this was an area that got large complaints when we were thinking about 
doing HDHOs over there to the point that we finally pulled it because, I mean, they were packing the room. <laughs> I, I very much understand that. Uh, but in previous comments, I, I mean, we're up and homeless yeah. and we have a chance to put more homes down on the map and well, it's we've, being we've discussed to not put homes or at least at least availability of van sites or I mean RVs. I guess it's cut and dry. Yeah. Me, but I, I appreciate I it. Yeah. And we are putting 110. All we are. Yeah. 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 A lot of that, that and we'll be fit. looking that at that just be the homeless amount we have. Just then we'll be looking at more. Yeah. yeah, Bill. My only point is just to reiterate I'm wish the rural residential would have been left out of this. Mm -hmm. It would have solved a lot of time on this board and effort yeah. moving forward. But yeah. the fact that it is in there, we have to honor the fact that people have jumped to try and help the situation of many people that need a place to stay. But, yeah, no, I think it's a point well taken. I, and I, I think really the reason for that rural residential, as we discussed earlier, a lot of it has to do with the uh, the the the, mark, the property, the Navtech property being rural residential. And that's actually the conversation that kicked this whole thing into 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 yeah, gear to begin was. with. <laughs> um, my, my, I, I'm very torn on this. I very much appreciate that the folks that have come forward to up, to apply to all of these. And I think any every every bit certainly helps. I also think that uh, we're going to see quite a few applicants on the next round. And if not a third round, which I'd be very surprised if we even reached. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I think my thoughts right now are to not approve the remaining four myself, uh, but invite them back in the next round and look at look at the next round of, of folks in three months and uh, um, consider that. But that that's that's just my thinking. Again, I, I'm not categorically opposed to this, and I uh, I, I commend the effort for sure. Can I ask a point of verification? Uh, yeah, please do. How, how long does it take? Uh, I'm not an RV expert. Um, how long does it take to set up the, the amount of time that it takes to set up the hookups and everything necessary? So imagine we approve this today, hypothetically. I know they're not that at that point in the application process. But from the date of approval, how long does it take roughly to get a unit on the ground? I, I, I actually, I know, I actually, yeah. I actually just went through this, Perfect. but you did too. So right. go ahead. Yeah, it's just a matter of putting in the infrastructure. They could be ready in a month. Right. I mean, if they stretch it out, month and a half, but getting all the permitting the one, he would be ready to. It moves right along. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. It's, yeah. There's not much here. It's a gravel road. It's. And I believe this one was a, this one, he, the paradigm was a bathhouse. It wasn't even uh, individual hookups, right? But permitting, love, waiting for materials, and then the actual labor, right? Yeah, so, quite yeah. So, I mean, relatively speaking, this is something that could, you know, either either way, you, if it's if it's approved, housing can come in, in, a, in a pretty quick fashion, or if we come back to it at a later date, it's still pretty quick fashion. We do have one of the other applicants. All the yeah, let's, we got to listen to anybody else. Yeah, we're, we're actually, we'll just uh, go on this one. Um, yeah, all right. All those, uh, let's on see. Number three. On number three, uh, Commissioner Clapper has a motion to approve uh, the 3211 Roberts Road address. Uh, Commissioner McCurdy second it. Um, all those in favor of approving this, raise your hand or say aye. All those opposed. Kevin? I, I vote no. Okay. Uh, motion fails uh, three to four with commissioners uh, Hedin, McGann, Hadler, and Walker opposed. Um, okay. Then we should go on to number two. Well, 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 somebody, I, oh, that, if somebody makes a motion, we're in them. That, that was the next uh, most eligible one in my mind. Was Redcliffe? Was the Redcliffe? Yeah. Or, no, no, sorry, the Roberts that I just put up. And if it failed, I kind of imagine there will be similar votes on the others. But if somebody else wants to put one up. Um, so we're looking at two now? No, we're just, we, we're waiting for We're seeing if there's any interest or support for it at this round. 
I agree with the fact that the other one there on Red Cliff is highly unlikely, but let's go ahead and move forward on the Murphy Lane one. I make the motion that we approve that one to move forward. And that's the uh, that's the 2012 Murphy 2012 Lane. Murphy Lane, yeah. yes. I'll say. Okay, uh, I have a motion to approve by Commissioner Winfield and a second by Commissioner McCurdy. Uh, discussion on the Murphy Lane property. Right. The, yeah. This one to me feels a more spot zoning than the previous. Um, it's it would be a disconnected higher density than, than uh, abutting a, a commercial zone or node. So um, I probably would wait to see the other applications in this case. At the and I again I. Personally, I was kind of looking at these similarly and would lump them. Um, and I'm, again, I'm not categorically opposed. I'd like to see some other proposals and maybe if they come back uh, in, oh, at the, in the next round or, or even beyond that, then I would absolutely be willing to consider them again, personally. Um, anyone else? Kevin, anything to add to the discussion? Or Trish, do you have your hand up? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, just the, um, I mean, another version of what Jacques just said, and I think responding to what Mike said earlier, you know, we do definitely have a urgent need for more housing, and this is the kind of stuff we can get online quickly, but we've, we've just approved a pretty large number of units, and we might get additional new applications late, later this year, and so I don't think, I, I think for things that, you know, might not be near the top of the list once we have the full list and, and later rounds, it makes sense to, to wait. So um, I, I agree with what you said, Jacques, about that. Okay. Uh, Mary? I just wanted to add, this is, it's, this is really hard. We're living in a small town and knowing people that are asking and applying, and it's so difficult to separate yourself from, and, and you know, sometimes I wish the names weren't on things, so, yeah, so I right. wouldn't be influenced. Yeah. And but I I do think it's it, I would like to see what else we have come up. And if we do decide to do more, we always have an opportunity to consider, you know, increasing the number. But boy, this was a hard thing to get past, and lots of opposition. Yeah, I would like to speak to it. This was me, not more than a year ago. I I called Dan Stock to get to get. Hey, put me on a list. I need a I need a place to put my camper to live. Right. Yeah. Sorry, Mike. I like you. You're a friend. You're thirty down the list. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yay! We added hundred and thirty of them. They're gonna fill up. Built. Fill up in that month timeline i do actually question with the pricing of it from before but this uh, we literally have a chance to it's not even approve uh we, we we have the literal chance to say hey let's see what you got in your application but we're not we're taking away the even the the hope for an application in this no they can, uh, they can apply they, they can re, apply. there are applying now yeah and, I, and is in in as much as we approved 150 I, I think there's absolutely no question that we'll get 150 of these this year yeah that's 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 a that's a gimme um and i think i think picking and choosing is 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 really important for for the people all the people that commented against this this was very controversial i i was in favor of this and i agree with mary it's super hard when when people we know are here uh with good Good projects. I actually personally talked about this and, and solicited advice from two of the applicants um, here and got and got good advice on it. And uh, yeah, and one of the one of the applicants gave me this advice. He said he said as a business person in this town, I I think this is a great idea. As a neighbor, it really scares me. And 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 that person applied for for one of these and and i take his advice to heart i think it was great advice and, and i commend him for applying um but i think um i think discretion is very much called for 
and uh, it is a super difficult situation. And I also um, very, very much expect that all 150 of these will be will be filled by the next deadline. Uh, anyway, we were back to um, a motion by Commissioner uh, Winfield and a second by Commissioner McCurdy concerning uh, item number seven, 2012, Murphy Lane. Um, all those in favor of the motion, uh, raise your hand or say aye. And all those opposed. Motion fails uh, uh, two to five with okay. the commissioners. I, I, I'm sorry, Kevin. Uh, yeah, you, I, I vote no. Okay. Um, motion like fails. It, you knew it before I even said. With Commissioner, well, I, I saw the four in the room too. So it was uh, uh, Commissioner Walker, Commissioner Clapper, Commissioner Hedin, McGann, and Hadler in opposition. Uh, I uh, We can keep going down the line. There's two other properties we haven't addressed. Uh, 3380 Red Cliff Road and um, we don't get a motion. 2890. Is there any reason to not make a motion to, I mean, to, or to include the two of them together? Sure, Bill. Yeah, that's, there's, you can, I yeah. Mean, unless somebody's feeling strongly that one of them is going to pass, why? Mm -hmm. It's pretty clear where the vote's gone. Right. I agree. Would you like to make a motion? So then I make the motion and to include both of the last two. What are the numbers? Two and seven. 3380 Red Cliff. 2890 Spanish Valley Drive. Okay. To be approved to. Right. Okay. I have a motion on the table by Commissioner Winfield and a second by Commissioner McCurdy. Um, discussion on these last two. Um, could I, I? I don't know if this is necessary. I haven't read our conflict of interest policy, but I, I just want to disclose that I used to live near the Red Cliff Road one, and I still own some property that is not immediately adjacent, but it's very close. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll note something that I noted in the in the meeting with. Uh, planning and zoning. One of the other interesting things is we have a lot of these, um, a lot of individuals that are out of compliance. And at a future date, I'll bring forward to the commission kind of what the goal is, because if we're pushing a lot of people to come apply to gain compliance, we have a lot that are out of compliance. Mm -hmm. And the county sits in an awkward position in which we have individuals and the question of residency is going to be the, the harder question, but we'll have uh, we have people that are not necessarily compliant, and then people that are going through the process. On a future date, I will bring that back to the commission and kind of seek guidance from you folks on how, as my clients, or as the, the representatives or the translator for the client, um, how you'd like to move forward with that, because that's going to be a question that's coming. Because from the attorney standpoint, if we're making a process to engage in compliance, um, that would be important to go through that process and to kind of see what we want to do with those that are outside of compliance. So I just want to note that for the future as yeah, okay. something to talk about in a later date. Thank you, Stephen. Um, any further discussion? We have a motion on the table by uh, Bill and a second by Mike to approve the final two properties at uh, 3380 Red Cliff and um, uh, Spanish Valley Drive, uh, 2890 Spanish Valley Drive. Just once again, in the, in the uh, Workshop today, I was more on the fence about the Spanish Valley Drive uh, property just because it's proximity to a node that has been identified through various um, master pl uh, plans. <laughs> and uh, so I, I recognize that that has a little more value than some of the others in my mind, but. Um, once again, I'd like to see the future applications that are coming in for applying more. Okay. So maybe we see that one again. Okay. All right. I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Oh. And all. Okay. <laughs> Muscle them. Okay. Let me let so... That was Pavlo's bell. <laughs> and we're <laughs> going. Okay. All, all opposed to the motion. And I'll wait for Kevin this time. I, 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 I vote no. Okay, so the motion fails two to five with Commissioners Clapper, Hedin, and Walker, and Hadler in opposition. Um, okay, I think that concludes this. We have some consent. 
Right. right. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, this 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 agenda item. And again, I would um, uh, invite those applicants. There's going to be another deadline on May 5th uh, with an intent to apply and looking forward to seeing what 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 people have um, as a student. Personally, if these all came back and nothing else did, I'd I'd, 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 I'd go for for yes, all of them. But I, I think it's important to see what else might be on the table. Yes, sir. Yeah, mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and still go through the process. Right? Yes, yeah, right, they and, and yes, yeah, Stephen has a great point. All these these four applicants can still apply, and they they can bring their applications back. Thank you. That was a long one. Thanks, Elisa. Thank okay, uh, we'll move on to our consent agenda. Approval of consent items. Uh, item A, Noxious Weed Board Member Recommendation for Sina Hauer. And that is on the consent agenda because there was only one applicant and it was a um, it was recommended by the board. Um, item number B, ratifying purchase order for search and rescue radios. Item C, proposed agreement between the Utah Department of Agriculture and Grant County under the Invasive Species Mitigation Grant, Grand County Puncture Vine. That's a nice way of saying goat head, I believe. Um, uh, item D, right of way grant amendment for County Road 138, that's Blue Hills Road. Uh, item E, approval of local consent for a single event liquor permit for the 2023 Canyonlands PRCA Rodeo. And finally, item F, board member recommendation for the Thompson Springs Special Service District. Again, one uh, applicant and a unanimous recommendation by the board there. I would entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to pass the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Trish. And second by Mary. Uh, discussion of any consent agenda items? Uh, okay, all those in favor of approval of the consent agenda, uh, raise your hand. And Kevin, know. great. Uh, the consent agenda passes unanimously. So we uh, tabled a earlier. I, I make a motion and we go into closed session to discuss character and competency of an individual. Thank you, Mary. Second that. Okay. I have a motion to go into closed session by Commissioner McGann, second by Commissioner Hadeen. All those in favor of the motion to go into closed session, raise your hand. Kevin? Hi, Sophia. Uh, Mo yeah. Motion passes unanimously. We'll go uh, into closed session. I'm going to use the restroom real quick while you guys are not going to go back. Okay. Thank no. you. Yes. Okay. Okay. So so probably yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. No, thank you. I just had another. It's dark. It's dark. It's not mailed. Uh, 